This is audiobook. Our Violent Ends by Chloe Gong. These Violent Delights Number 2. Narrated by Aria. This recording is a production of the Booktube Copyright 2021 Booktube. Introduction. The year is 1927, and Shanghai teeters on the edge of revolution. After sacrificing her relationship with Roma to protect him from the blood feud, Juliet has been a girl on the warpath. One wrong move and her cousin will step in to usurp her place as the Scarlet Gang's heir. The only way to save the boy she loves from the wrath of the Scarlets is to have him want her dead for murdering his best friend in cold blood. If Juliet were guilty of the crime Roma believes she committed, his rejection might stingless. Roma is still reeling from Marshall's death, and his cousin Benedict will barely speak to him. Roma knows it's his fault for letting the ruthless Juliet back into his life, and he's determined to set things right, even if that means killing the girl he hates and loves with equal measure. Then a new monstrous danger emerges in the city, and those secrets keep them apart, Juliet must secure Roma's cooperation if they are to end this threat once and for all. Shanghai is already at a boiling point, the nationalists are marching in, whispers of civil war brew louder every day, and gangster rule faces complete annihilation. Roma and Juliet must put aside their differences to combat monsters in politics, but they aren't prepared for the biggest threat of all, protecting their hearts from each other. One, January 1927. The new year in Shanghai passed with such fanfare that a sense of party still permeated the city a week later. It was the way the people moved about, the extra bounce in their toes and the twinkle in their eye as they leaned over the seats of the Grand Theater to whisper to their companion. It was loud jazz music audible from the cabaret across the street, the cool air of handheld bamboo fans waving about in rapid color, the smell of something fried smuggled into the viewing room, despite screen one's strict rules. Marking the first day of the Gregorian calendar as a time for celebration was a Western matter, but the West had long stuck its roots into this city. The madness in Shanghai was gone. The streets had been lulled back into uproarious decadence and nights that went on and on, like this one, where theatergoers could watch a picture and then saunter along the Huangpu River until sunrise. After all, there was no monster lurking in the waters anymore. It had been four months since the monster of Shanghai died, shot to death and left to rot on a wharf by the Bund. Now the only thing civilians needed to worry about were gangsters, and the increasing number of bullet-hole-ridden corpses showing up on the streets. Juliet Kai peered over the railing, squinting down at the ground level of screen one. From her vantage point, she could see almost everything below, could pick out every minuscule detail among the chaos broiling under the golden light fixtures. Unfortunately, it would have been more useful if she were actually down there herself, mingling with the merchant she had been sent here for, rather than staring at him from high above. Their seats tonight were the best that she could do, the assignment had been given far too last minute for Juliet to finagle something good in the thick of the socializing sphere. Are you going to be pulling that face all night? Juliet swiveled around, narrowing her eyes at her cousin. Kathleen Lang was trailing close, her mouth set in a grimace while the people around them searched for their seats before the picture started. Yes, Juliet grumbled. I have so many better things to be doing right now. Kathleen rolled her eyes, then wordlessly pointed ahead, having spotted the seats marked on their tickets. The stubs in her hands were ripped poorly after the uniformed ticket boy at the door got his top hat knocked into his eyes by the crowd surging into the portico. He had hardly a moment to recover before more tickets were waved in his face, foreigners and rich Chinese alike sniffing their noses at the slow speed. In places like these, better service was expected. Ticket prices were sky-high to make the Grand Theatre an experience, what with its arched ceiling beams and wrought-iron railings, its Italian marble and delicate doorway lettering, only in English, no Chinese to be found. What could possibly be more important than this? Kathleen asked. They took their seats, the frontmost row by the second-level railing, a perfect view of both the screen and all the people beneath. Staring angrily at your bedroom wall, as you have been doing these few months? 
Juliet frowned. I have not been doing merely that. Oh, pardon me. How could I forget screaming at politicians? Huffing, Juliet leaned back into her seat. She crossed her arms tightly over her chest, the beads along her sleeves clinking loudly against the beads dangling from her front. Grating as the sound was, it contributed only a small fraction to the general bedlam of the theater. Baba is already giving me enough grief for upsetting that nationalist, Juliet grumbled. She started to take inventory of the crowd below, mentally assigning names to faces and keeping track of who might notice that she was here. Don't you get on my case too? Kathleen tooted, setting her elbow onto the armrest between them. I'm only concerned, Yame. Concerned about what? I'm always screaming at people. Lord Kai doesn't reprimand you often. I think that might be an indicator of. Juliet lurched forward. Out of sheer instinct, a gasp rose in her throat, but she refused to let it out, and instead the sound lodged itself tightly in place, an ice-cold sensation pressed up against the back of her tongue. Kathleen immediately jerked to attention too, searching the floor below for whatever it was that had drained Juliet's face utterly of blood. What? Kathleen demanded. What is it? Do I call for backup? No, Juliet whispered, swallowing hard. The theater dimmed. Taking their cue, the ticket boys started to walk the aisles, forcing the crowd to settle for the picture. It is only a small hiccup. Her cousin's brows were furrowed, still searching. What is it? Kathleen repeated. Juliet simply pointed. She watched as Kathleen followed the direction in which she was indicating watched as the realization set in when they were both looking at one figure pushing his way through the crowd. It would appear we were not the only one sent here for a task. Because down on the ground level, looking like he had not a care in the world, Roma Montagov smiled and stopped in front of the merchant they were after, extending his hand for the merchant to shake. Juliet curled her fists tightly into her lap. She had not seen Roma since October, since the first protests in Nanchur shook the city and set the precedent for those that were to follow when winter swept into Shanghai. She had not seen his physical person, but she had felt his presence everywhere, in the corpses littered across the city with lily-white flowers clutched in their stiff hands, in the business partners disappearing out of the blue with nary a message or explanation, in the blood feud making its mark. Ever since the city caught wind of a confrontation between Roma Montagov and Tyler Kai, the blood feud had shot back into its most terrible heights. Neither gang needed to worry about their numbers being picked off by the madness anymore. Instead their thoughts circled retribution and honor, and as different mouths ran different accounts of what had happened between the inner circles of the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers that day, the only definitive truths that came out were this, in a tiny hospital along the edges of Shanghai, Roma Montagov had shot at Tyler Kai, and to protect her cousin, Juliet Kai had killed Marshal Seo in cold blood. Now both sides were vengeful. Now the White Flowers were pressing down on the Scarlet Gang with a renewed urgency, and the Scarlet Gang were fighting back just as hard. They had to. No matter how carefully the Scarlets cooperated with the Nationalists, every single person in the city could feel something shifting, could see the gatherings grow larger and larger each time the Communists attempted a strike. The political landscape was soon to change, soon to swallow up this way of lawlessness, and for both gangs currently ruling the city with an iron fist, it was either to be violent now and secure their holdings, or regret it later should a greater power swoop in when there was no way to win territory back. Juliet, Kathleen said softly. Her cousin's eyes shifted back and forth between her and Roma, what happened between you two? Juliet didn't have an answer to give just as she hadn't had an answer all the other times she was asked this question. Kathleen deserved a better explanation, deserved to know why the city was saying Juliet had shot Marshal C.O. point-blank when she had once been so friendly with him, why Roma Montagov was dropping flowers everywhere he went in mockery of the feud's victims when he had once been so gentle with Juliet. But one more person in on the secret was one more person dragged down into the mess. One more target for Tyler's scrutiny, one more target for Tyler's gun. 
Better to speak none of it. Better to pretend and pretend until maybe, just maybe, there came some chance to salvage the fractured state the city had fallen into. The picture is starting, Juliet said in lieu of a reply. Juliet, Kathleen insisted. Juliet gritted her teeth hard. She wondered if her tone still fooled anyone. In New York, she had been so good at lying, so good at playing pretend as an utterly different person. These last months had been wearing her down until there was nothing left of her but her. He's not doing anything. Look, he's taking his seat. Indeed, Roma appeared to be walking away from the merchant after a mere greeting, settling into an end seat two rows behind. This did not have to be a big deal. They did not need to engage in a confrontation. Juliet could quietly keep an eye on him from where she sat and make sure she approached the merchant first when intermission came. It was a surprise that she had even been sent after a merchant. The Scarlet Gang rarely chased after new clientele, they waited for clientele to come to them. But this merchant did not dabble in drugs like the rest of them. He had sailed into Shanghai last week carrying British technology, heavens knew what kind. Her parents had not been specific in their briefing, save that it was some sort of weaponry and the Scarlet Gang wanted to acquire his inventory. If the White Flowers were trying to get in on it too, then it had to be something big. Juliet made a note to ask for details as soon as she got home. The lights went dark. Kathleen glanced over her shoulder, fingers twisting into the loose sleeves of her coat. Relax, Juliet whispered. What you're about to watch came directly from its premiere in Manhattan. Quality Entertainment The picture started. Screen One was the largest viewing room in the whole Grand Theater, its orchestral sound booming from all sides. Each seat was equipped with its own translation system, reading out the text that appeared alongside the silent film. The couple to Juliet's left were wearing their earpieces, murmuring excitedly to each other as the lines filtered through in Chinese. Juliet didn't need her earpiece, not just because she could read English, but because she wasn't really watching the film. Her eyes, no matter how much she tried, kept wandering down. Don't be a fool, Juliet scolded herself. She had tipped herself into this situation at full speed. She would not regret it. It was what had needed to be done. But still, she couldn't stop looking. It had been only three months, but Roma had changed. She already knew that, of course, from the reports that came back to her about dead gangsters with Korean characters slashed in blood beside them. From the bodies piling up farther and farther inward into scarlet territory lines, as if the white flowers were testing the limits they could encroach upon. It was unlikely that Roma had sought out scarlets specifically for vengeance killings, he didn't have it in him to go that far, but each time a conflict erupted, the message left behind was clear, this is your doing, Juliet. It was Juliet who had escalated the feud, who had pulled the trigger on Marshal Seo and told Roma to his face that whatever happened between them had been nothing but a lie. So now all the blood left in his wake was his revenge. He looked the part too. At some point, he had traded his dark suits for lighter colors for a cream jacket and a golden tie, for cufflinks that caught the light each time the screen flashed white. His posture was sharp, no more slouching to feign casual, no more stretching his legs long so he could slump into the chair and avoid being seen by anyone giving the room a cursory glance. Roma Montagov wasn't the air scheming in the shadows anymore. It seemed that he was sick of the city seeing him as the one slitting throats in the dark, the one with a heart of coal and the clothing to match. He looked like a white flower. He looked like his father. A flash of movement blurred in Juliet's peripheral vision. She blinked, pulling her gaze away from Roma and searching the seats across his aisle. For a moment, she was certain she had merely been mistaken, that perhaps a lock of hair had come undone from her front curl and fallen into her eyes. Then the screen flashed white again as a shrieking train derailed in the Wild West, and Juliet saw the figure in the audience rise. The man's face was cast in shadow, but the gun in his hand was very, very illuminated. And it was pointed right at the merchant in the front row, who Juliet still needed to speak to. Absolutely not, 
she muttered angrily, reaching for the pistol strapped to her thigh. The screen dropped into shadows, but Juliet took aim anyway. In the second before the man could act, she pulled the trigger first with a loud bang. Her pistol kicked. Juliet pressed back into her seat, her jaw hard as the man below dropped his weapon, his shoulder wounded. Her gunshot had hardly drawn any notice, not when there was a shootout going on in the picture, too, drowning out the scream coming from the man's mouth and covering up the smoke wafting from the barrel of her pistol. Though the picture had no dialogue sound, the orchestral backing track had an uproarious cymbal banging in the background, and the theatergoers all assumed the gunshot a product of the film. All except for Roma, who immediately swiveled around and looked up, eyes searching for the source of the gunshot. And he found it. Their gazes locked, the click of mutual recognition so forceful that Juliet felt a physical shift in her spine, like her body was finally writing itself into alignment after months out of configuration. She was frozen, breath caught in her throat, eyes pulled wide. Until Roma reached into his jacket pocket and drew his gun, and Juliet had no choice but to jolt herself out of her daze. Instead of combating the would-be assassin, he had decided to shoot at her. Three bullets whizzed by her ear. Gasping, Juliet struck the floor, her knees grazing the carpet hard as she threw herself down. The couple to her left started screaming. The theatergoers had realized the gunshots were not a part of the soundtrack. Okay, Juliet said under her breath. He's still mad at me. What was that? Kathleen demanded. Her cousin dropped quickly too, using the railing of the second level for cover. Did you shoot into the seats? Was that Roma Montagoff shooting back? Juliet grimaced. Yes. It sounded like a stampede was starting on the floor below. The people on the upper level were certainly starting to panic too, hurtling out of their seats and rushing for the exit, but the two doors on either side of the theater, marked even an ODD for the seat arrangements, were rather thin, and all they managed to achieve was a bottleneck situation. Kathleen made an indecipherable noise. He's not doing anything, he's taking his seat. Oh, don't mock me. Juliet hissed. This situation was not ideal. But she would salvage it. She scrambled to her feet. Someone was trying to shoot the merchant. Juliet made a quick glance over the railing. She didn't see Roma anymore. She did see the merchant pulling his suit jacket tightly around his middle and securing his straw hat, trying to follow the crowds out of the theater. Go find who it was, Kathleen huffed. Your father will have your head if the merchant is killed. I know you're joking, Juliet muttered, but you might be right. She pressed her pistol into her cousin's hand and took off, calling over her shoulder, talk to the merchant for me. Merci. By now the bottleneck at the door had thinned enough that Juliet could push through, merging into the main anteroom outside the second floor of screen one. Ladies dressed in silk cheapow were screaming inconsolably at one another, and British officers were clumped together in the corner to hiss hysterics about what was going on. Juliet ignored it all, pushing and pushing to get to the stairs, to get down to the ground floor, where the merchant would be emerging. She skidded to a stop. The main staircase was far too crowded. Her eyes darted to the side, to the maintenance stairs, and she tore the door open without a second thought, barreling right through. Juliet was familiar with this theater, it was Scarlet Territory, and she had spent parts of her early childhood wandering around this building, peering into the different screening rooms when Nurse was distracted. Where the main staircase was a grandiose structure of polished flooring and arched, wooden banisters, the maintenance stairs were made of cement and void of natural light, relying on naught but a small bulb dangling at the middle landing. Her heels clacked loudly, turning the corner of the landing. She stopped short. Waiting there, by the door into the main lobby, was Roma, his gun raised. Juliet supposed she had grown predictable. You were three paces away from the merchant, she said. She was surprised her voice remained level. Ta Madi. There was one knife strapped to her leg, but in the time it would take to reach for it, she would be giving Roma plenty of time to shoot. You left him just to find me? I'm flattered. 
Juliet swerved with a hiss. Her cheek radiated heat, swelling from the harrowingly close contact of the bullets that flew by her head. Before Roma could think to aim again, Juliet ran the quickest survey of her options, then dove through the door behind her, surging into the storage unit. She wasn't trying to escape. This was a dead end, a thin room crowded with stacked chairs and cobwebs. She only needed. Another bullet whizzed by her arm. You're going to blow this place up, Juliet snapped, spinning around. She had come to the very end of the storage space, her back pressed to the thick pipes that ran along the walls. Some of these pipes carry gas, put a hole in one and the whole theater bursts into flames. Roma was hardly threatened. It was as if he could not hear her. His eyes were narrowed, his expression scrunched. He looked unfamiliar, properly foreign, like a boy who had pulled on a costume and hadn't expected how well it would fit. Even under the dim lights, the gold of his clothes glimmered, as bright as the twinkling billboards outside the theater. Juliet wanted to scream, seeing what he had been made into. She could hardly catch her breath, and she would be lying if she said it was only because of her current physical exertion. Did you hear what I said? Juliet eyed the distance between them. Put that gun away. Do you hear yourself? Roma interrupted. In three strides, he was close enough to point his gun right in Juliet's face. She could feel the heat of the barrel, hot steel an inch away from her skin. You killed Marshall. You killed him, and it's been months, and I haven't heard a word of explanation from you. There is no explanation. He thought her a monster. He thought she had hated him the whole time, so viciously that she would destroy everything he loved, and he had to think that if he was to keep his life. Juliet refused to drag him down just because she was weak-willed. I killed him because he needed to die, Juliet said. Her arm whipped up. She twisted Roma's gun away, letting it clatter at their feet. Just as I will kill you. Just as I will not stop until you kill me. He slammed her into the pipes. The effort was so forceful that Juliet tasted blood inside her lip, sliced by her own sharp teeth. She stifled a gasp and then another when Roma's hand tightened around her throat, his eyes murderous. Juliet was not frightened. If anything, she was only resentful, not at Roma, but at herself. At wanting to lean in even while Roma was actively trying to kill her. At this distance between them that she had willingly manufactured, because they had been born into two families at war, and she would rather die at Roma's hand than be the cause of his death. No one else is dying to protect me. Roma had blown up a whole house of people to keep Juliet safe. Tyler and his scarlet men would go on a rampage in the name of defending Juliet, even if they too wanted her dead. It was all one and the same. It was this city, divided by names and colors and turfs, but somehow bleeding the exact same shade of violence. Go on, Juliet said with effort. She didn't mean it. She knew Roma Montagog. He thought he wanted her dead, but the fact of the matter was that he never missed, and yet he had all those bullets, embedded into the walls instead of Juliet's head. The fact of the matter was that he had his hands around her throat and yet she could still breathe, could still inhale past the rot and the hate that his fingers tried to press into her skin. Juliet finally reached for her blade. Just as Roma shifted forward, perhaps intent on his kill, her hand closed around the sheath beneath her dress and she pulled the weapon free, slicing down on whatever she came in contact with first. Roma hissed, releasing his hold. It was only a surface cut, but he cradled his arm to his chest, and Juliet followed close, leveling the blade to his throat. This is scarlet territory. Her words were even, but it took everything in her to keep them that way. You forget yourself. Roma grew still. He stared at her, utterly unreadable as the moment drew long, long enough that Juliet almost thought he would surrender. Only then Roma leaned into the blade instead, until the metal was pressed right into his neck, one hair's breadth away from breaking skin and drawing blood. Then do it, Roma hissed. He sounded angry. He sounded pained. Kill me. Juliet did not move. 
she must have hesitated for a fraction too long, because Roma's expression morphed into a sneer. Why do you pause, he taunted. The taste of blood was still pungent inside her mouth. In a blur, Juliet flipped the blade onto its blunt end and slammed the handle to Roma's temple. He blinked and dropped like a rock, but Juliet threw the weapon away and lunged to break his fall. As soon as her hand slid around him, she let out a small exhale of relief, stopping Roma just before his head could hit the hard floor. Juliet sighed. In her arms, he felt so solid, more real than ever. His safety was an abstract concept when he was at a distance, far from the threats that her scarlets posed to him. But here, with his pulse thudding through his chest and beating an even rhythm onto hers, he was just a boy, just a bloody, beating heart that could be cut out at any moment by any blade sharp enough. Why do you pause? Juliet mimicked bitterly. Softly, she set him down, brushing his must hair out of his face. Because even if you hate me, Roma Montagov, I still love you. 2. Roma felt the prodding sensation on his shoulder first. Then the stiffness in his bones. Then the terrible, terrible pain shooting through his head. Christ, he hissed, jerking awake. As soon as his vision cleared, he sighted the black boot responsible for the prodding, attached to the last person he wanted to encounter while slumped on the floor. What the hell happened? Dmitri Vornin demanded, his arms crossed over his chest. Behind him stood three other white flowers. They were inspecting the storage unit with particular attention, eyeing the bullet holes studded into the walls. Juliet Kai happened, Roma muttered, hobbling to his feet. She knocked me out. It looks like you're lucky she didn't kill you, Dimitri said. He smacked his hand on the wall, rubbing charred grit and dust onto his palm. Roma didn't bother saying that all those bullets were his. It was not as if Dimitri were actually here to help. He had probably gathered his reinforcements as soon as he heard about the Grand Theater rocking with gunshots, frantic to be where the chaos was. Dmitri Voronin had been everywhere these few months, ever since he missed the showdown at the hospital and had to piece together afterward what had gone on between the White Flowers and the Scarlet Gang, like everyone else. Dmitri Voronin would not be left out of the next big showdown. At the sound of any disturbance in the city, no matter how slight, so long as it involved the blood feud, he was now the first on the scene. What are you doing here? Roma asked. He touched his cheek, wincing at the bruising that had spread. My father sent me. Yes, well, that was not a great decision, was it? We saw the merchant outside having a nice chat with Kathleen Lang. Roma bit back his curse. He wanted to spit it to the ground, but Dimitri was watching, so he only turned away, picking up his fallen pistol. No matter. Tomorrow is a new day. It's time to go. You will give up like that? This is Scarlet. A whistle blew outside, echoing up and down the maintenance stairs. This time Roma did curse aloud, tucking his pistol away before the guard municipal barged into the storage unit, their batons out. For whatever reason, the enforcement saw the white flowers and decided to direct their attention to Dimitri, eyes pinned on his weapons. Lash le pistolet, the man at the front demanded. His belt glinted, metal handcuffs catching the low light. Latch moi si a e lev les mains. Dimitri did not do as he was told, did not drop the gun dangling casually in his grip nor put his hands up. His refusal seemed to be insolence, but Roma knew better. Dimitri did not speak French. You don't control us, Dimitri snapped in Russian. So why don't you go on Anne? CAVA main tenant, Roma interrupted. J. Entendu un dispute d'or du theater. Alès el investigator. The guard municipal officers narrowed their eyes, unsure if they should follow Roma's instruction, if there was truly an incident outside to tend to or if Roma was only making up lies. It was indeed a lie, but Roma only had to snap go, again and the guard municipal scattered. That was who he had worked so hard to turn into. That was who he was doing everything in his power to stay as. Someone who was listened to even when the officers were scarlets. Impressive, 
Dimitri said, when it was just the white flowers again. Really, Roma, it is most. Shut up, Roma snapped. The effect was immediate. He wished he could feel some satisfaction at the red that rose up Dimitri's neck, at the amused smirking from the men that Dimitri had brought along, but all he felt was empty. Next time don't come prancing into foreign-controlled territory if you don't know how to deal with the foreigners. Roma marched out, overly aggressive in his stride, as he took the maintenance stairs back down to the ground floor. It was hard to say what exactly had him this worked up, there was so much boiling beneath his skin, the merchant slipping away, the strange assassin in the stalls, Juliet being here. Juliet. He stomped extra hard coming out of the theater, squinting up at the gray clouds. A jolt of pain came from his arm then, and his hand flew to the cut that Juliet had made, thinking he would find a clump of blood, as rancid and dead as his feelings for her. Instead, as he rolled his sleeve up gingerly, his fingers came upon only smooth fabric. With a start, Roma stopped at the side of the pavement. He peered at his arm. It had been finely wrapped, secured with a bow. Is this silk, he muttered, frowning. It looked like silk. It looked like the silk of Juliet's dress, torn from the hem, but why would she do that? A horn blew from the road, drawing his attention. The car idling there flashed its headlights, before the chauffeur at the driver's seat stuck his arm out and waved at Roma Roma remained unmoving, his brow furrowed. Mr. Montagov, the white flower finally hollered after a long minute. Can we go yet? Roma sighed, hurrying to the car. There were twenty-two vases scattered around the Kai mansion, all of them filled with red roses. Juliet reached out to cup one bud in her palm, her finger sliding along the delicate petal's edge. Nightfall had long passed outside. The hour was late enough that most of the servants had gone to sleep, shuffling to their rooms in their nightgowns, bidding Juliet a good rest when they passed her in the hallway. She figured they had spoken only because it would have been strange not to acknowledge the scarlet air lying on the floor, arms splayed and legs propped upright on the walls as she waited outside her father's office. The last servant had bidden her well more than half an hour ago. Since then she had stood up and started pacing, much to Kathleen's annoyance. Her cousin had remained seated primly on an actual chair the whole time, a folder waiting on her lap. What could they possibly be talking about? Juliet grumbled, releasing the rose in her hand. It's been hours. Move it to another day. Lord Kai's office door finally opened, revealing a nationalist taking his leave. Months ago, Juliet would have been curious about the meeting, would have asked for a briefing. Now the sight of nationalists coming and going in this house was so common that she hardly cared. It was always the same, squash the communists, whatever the cost. Riddle them with bullets, break up their labor unions, the nationalists didn't mind how the scarlets did it, so long as they achieved their objectives. The nationalist hovered at the doorway, then turned back, as if he had one more thing he forgot to say. Juliet narrowed her eyes. The sight of nationalists had grown familiar to her, true, but this one. There were stars and badges galore decorating his uniform. A general, perhaps. Testing her limits, Juliet held out her hand for Kathleen to take. Kathleen, albeit confused, accepted and picked up her folder, both of them walking toward the nationalist. No more warlords. The nationalist flicked an imaginary piece of lint off his military uniform. And no more foreigners. We enter a new world, and whether the Scarlet Gang enters with us is a matter of loyalty. Yes, yes, Juliet interrupted, squeezing past him and pulling Kathleen along. Blessed be the Kuomintang, Wan Sui Wan Sui Wan Wan Sui, she started to push at the door. Juliet, Lord Kai snapped. Juliet stopped. A glint had entered her eye. The same sort that came about when the cooks brought out her favorite meal. The same sort when she spotted a diamond necklace she wanted in the window of a department store. Present and reporting, she said. Lord Kai leaned back in his large chair, folding his hands over his stomach. Apologize, please. Juliet bobbed an unbothered curtsy. 
When she looked at the nationalist, he was observing her carefully, but it was not the leer of men on the streets. It was something far more strategic. Please accept my apologies. I trust you can find your way to the door. The nationalist tipped his hat. Though he offered her a smile, as was polite, the expression stopped entirely before reaching his eyes, merely crinkling his crow's feet without any sign of warmth. Of course. Pleased to make your acquaintance, Miss Kai. He had not been introduced to her, so they had not made an acquaintance at all. Juliet did not say this, she merely closed the door, then rolled her eyes in Kathleen's direction. So tiresome. When you're on your way out, then leave. Juliet, Lord Kai said again, with less bite now that the nationalist was no longer present for Juliet to be a pest in front of. That was Xu Gang. General Xu. Do you know who he is? Have you been following the papers and the advancement of the Northern Expedition at all? Juliet winced. Baba, she started. She dropped into a seat opposite her father's desk. Kathleen silently followed suit. The Northern Expedition is so terribly boring. It will determine the fate of our country. Okay, fine, fine, the reports are so boring. General so-and-so took this segment of land. Army Division so-and-so moved this far up. I practically cry in excitement when you send me to strangle someone instead. Juliet clasped her hands together. Please, just let me do the strangling. Her father shook his head, not bothering to entertain her theatrics. His eyes only swiveled toward the door thoughtfully. Pay attention to this, Lord Kai said slowly. The Kuomintang is changing shape. Heaven knows they are no longer pretending to cooperate with the communists. We can afford carelessness no longer. Juliet thinned her lips but did not get smart with her response. Revolution was coming, she couldn't deny that. The Northern Expedition, that was what they called it, nationalist troops marching north through the country, fighting the warlords that ruled regions and fragments, seizing territories in an attempt to piece China back together. Shanghai would be the stronghold, the last piece before the current poor excuse of a national government was utterly ousted, and when the armies came, there were no warlords here to defeat. There were only gangs and foreigners. So the Scarlet Gang needed to get on the right side before they arrived. Of course, Juliet said. Now, she gestured for Kathleen to go on. Almost hesitantly, her cousin leaned toward Lord Kai's desk, gingerly passing the folder in her hands. You were successful? Lord Kai asked, still speaking to Juliet even as he took the folder from Kathleen. You'd better frame that contract, Juliet replied. Kathleen almost got in a fistfight for it. Kathleen nudged a subtle elbow into Juliet's side, a warning in her expression. By normal circumstances, Kathleen couldn't look stern even if she tried, but the room's low light helped. The miniature chandelier dangling from the ceiling was dialed to the dimmest setting, casting long shadows up against the walls. The curtains behind Lord Kai's desk were undrawn, blowing faintly because the window was open the smallest crack. Juliet knew her father's old tricks. In the dead of winter, as it was now, the open window kept the office chilly, kept every visitor on their toes when they took off their coat to be polite and ended up shivering. Juliet and Kathleen kept their coats on. A fist fight? Lord Kai echoed. Lang Selin, that's not like you. There was no fist fight, Gufu, Kathleen said quickly, shooting another sharp glance at Juliet, who only grinned in response. Merely a scuffle between some people outside the Grand Theatre. I managed to extricate the merchant, and he was thankful enough that he was willing to sit down at the hotel next door for a cup of tea. Lord Kai nodded. While he scanned the handwritten terms, he made a few noises of approval here and there, which from a man of silence meant the business deal had lifted his mood. I didn't know the specifics on what we wanted him for, Kathleen hurried to supply when Lord Kai closed the folder. So the language is rather vague. Oh, no bother, Lord Kai replied. The Kuomintang are after his weaponry. I do not know the specifics either. Juliet blinked. 
we're entering a business partnership where we don't even know what we're dealing? By all means, it was not any big matter. The Scarlet Gang was used to trading in human labor and drugs. One more illicit item only added an inch to what was already an infinitely long scroll, but to trust the nationalists so wholeheartedly. And on that matter, Juliet said suddenly, before her father could answer her question, Baba, there was an assassin after the merchant. Lord Kai did not react for a long moment, which meant he had already heard. Of course he had. Juliet may have had to wait hours before she could see her own father, slotted at the bottom of a waiting list filled with nationalists and foreigners and businessmen, but messengers could come and go at a whim, slinking into the office and whispering a quick report into Lord Kai's ear. Yes, he finally said. It was likely a white flower. No. Lord Kai frowned, his gaze darting up. Juliet had jumped in with her disagreement rather quickly and empathetically. There was the white flower present who was also trying to make an acquaintance with the merchant, Juliet explained. Her eyes darted to the window unwittingly, eyeing the golden lamps humming in the gardens below. Their light made the rose bushes glow with warmth, a far cry from the real biting temperature at this time of night. Roma Montagov. Her eyes flicked back, swallowing hard. If her father had been paying attention, the speed at which she sought his reaction would have given away her guilt immediately, but her father was gazing off into space. Juliet let out her exhale slowly. A curious matter on why the white flower heir was after the merchant too, Lord Kai muttered, half to himself. He waved his hand then. Nevertheless, we need not worry about an amateur assassin. Likely a communist, or any faction opposing the nationalist army. We'll have scarlet men protect the merchant from now onward. No one would dare another attempt. He sounded certain. Still, Juliet chewed her lip, not so convinced. A few months ago, perhaps no one would dare upset the scarlets. But today? Has there been another letter? Lord Kai sighed, lacing his fingers together. He said, Selin, you must be tired. It is my bedtime, yes. Kathleen replied easily, taking the cue to leave. She was out in seconds, the office door closing behind her before Juliet could say good night. Her father must know that she would merely fill Kathleen in afterward about what was going on. She supposed it made him feel better to think the rest of the family wasn't getting involved in this, that the fewer people knew, the less likely it was to explode into a troublesome matter. The blackmailer strikes again, Lord Kai said finally retrieving an envelope from his desk drawer and passing it to Juliet. The largest sum yet. Juliet reached forward, first examining not the letter inside but the envelope itself. It was the same each time. Utterly plain and remarkable, save for one detail, they were all postmarked from the French concession. Tien na, she breathed, pulling out the letter and reading its contents. A truly outrageous amount but they had to send it. They had to. She tossed the letter back onto her father's desk, letting out a tight breath. Back in October, she thought she had killed the monster of Shanghai. She had shot Chi Run, watched as the bullet studded into his heart and the old man seemed to crumple in relief, freed from the curse that Paul Dexter had set on him. His throat had split open and the mother insect had flown out, landing on the wharf of the bund with finality. Then Kathleen found Paul Dexter's letter? In the event of my death, release them all. And the screaming followed immediately. Juliet had never run faster. All the worst-case scenarios flashed through her mind, five, ten, fifty monsters, ravaging the streets of Shanghai. Each and every one of them a starting point of infection, their insects flying from civilian to civilian until the whole city was dead in the gutters throats torn to shreds and hands bloody to the wrist. Instead, Juliet found only one dead man, a beggar, by the looks of him, slumped up against the exterior of a police bureau. The screaming had been the shopper who'd spotted him, and by the time Juliet arrived, the small, panicked crowd had already dispersed, wanting to avoid interrogation if the Scarlet Gang became involved. Dead men on the streets of Shanghai were as common as starving men, desperate men, violent men. 
but this one had been murdered, his throat slit right down the middle, and next to him, pinned to the wall with the bloody knife that did it, was the insect that had flown out of Chiron. To any other observer, or to the police detective who would later examine the scene, it was nonsensical. To Juliet, the message was clear. Someone was out there, holding on to the other insects that Paul Dexter created. They knew what the insects did and the damage they could wreak if released. The first blackmail letter, demanding a sum of money in exchange for the city's safety, came a week later. They had been coming ever since. Your thoughts, daughter? Lord Kai said now, his arms relaxed on either side of his chair. He was watching Juliet carefully, cataloging her reaction to the demand. He asked for her thoughts, but it was plain that her father had already made up his mind. This was merely a test to ensure that Juliet's judgment aligned with the correct course of action. To ensure that she was a good heir, fit for leading the Scarlet Gang. Send it, Juliet replied, swallowing the tremor in her voice before it could escape. Until our spies figure out where the hell these letters are coming from and I can put the blackmailer six feet underground, we keep them happy. Lord Kai remained quiet for a second, then another. He reached for the letter, let it dangle between his fingers. Very well, her father said. We send it. Elisa had fallen back into her old habits, eavesdropping in the rafters. She was crammed inside that ceiling space above her father's office again, having crawled down from a broken crevasse between the drywall and the sitting room of the third floor. Ouch, she muttered, moving the weight of her body off her knee. Either she had grown taller in these last few months, or she still wasn't fully recovered from lying in a coma for weeks. She used to be able to squeeze herself small enough that she could squirm along these rafters, then drop into the hallway outside her father's office when she wanted to leave. Now her limbs felt awkward, too stiff. She tried to lean down, but her balance tilted immediately. Shit, Elisa whispered, gripping the rafter hard. She was thirteen now. She was allowed to curse. Below, her father was deep in discussion with Dimitri, him behind his desk, Dimitri seated with his feet up. Their voices, unfortunately, were soft. But Elisa had sharp hearing. Curious, is it not? Lord Montagov asked. He had something in his hands, perhaps a note card, perhaps an invitation. No threat, nor violent action. Merely a demand for a sum of money. My lord, Dimitri said evenly. If I may, I would argue that the message is rather threatening. Lord Montagov scoffed. What? This old line? He flipped the paper over, and Elisa confirmed that it was indeed a note card, thick and cream-colored. Expensive. Pay up, or the monster Shanghai resurrects. It is tomfoolery. Roma destroyed that wretched monster. Elisa swore she saw Dimitri's jaw twitch. I hear that the Scarlets have already received multiple threats, starting from months prior, Dimitri insisted. They have paid the amount demanded each time. Ha! Huh. Lord Montagov turned toward his window, opting to observe the street below. How are we to know it is not the Scarlets pulling this, a scheme to loosen the gold in our pockets? It is not, Dimitri replied surely. A beat passed. Then he added, My source reports that Lord Kai believes the threat to be real. Interesting, Lord Montagov said. Interesting, Elisa echoed up in the rafters, so quietly that she was audible only to the dust motes. How would Dimitri know what Lord Kai believed? Then the Scarlet Gang are merely made up of fools, which we have known all along. Lord Montagov threw the card to the floor. Forget it. We are not paying an anonymous blackmailer. Let them do their worst. I. It is marked from the French concession, Lord Montagov interrupted, before Dimitri could get another word in edgewise. What are the French to do? Will they walk themselves here and intimidate us in their iron suits? Dimitri had no further leeway to argue. He merely leaned back into his seat, lips pursed, thinking for a long moment. Indeed, he said eventually. Whatever you believe to be correct, then. 
the conversation turned to the white flower clientele lists, and Elisa frowned, wriggling along the rafter. Once she was far enough from her father's office not to be overhead, she slowly eased herself down a thin gap in the wall to emerge in the hallway. This house was a Frankenstein-esque experiment in architecture, multiple apartment blocks mashed together with barely finished stitching. There were so many nooks and crannies above and below various rooms that Elisa was surprised only she alone used them to get from place to place. At the very least, she was surprised no white flower had accidentally pressed up too close to a wall and fallen through the floorboards when they trod upon a loose tiling. Elisa started up the main stairs, taking them two at a time in her hurry. The plain necklace dangling at her clavicle jumped up and down with each of her hard steps, cool against her flushed skin. Benedict! Elisa exclaimed, coming to a stop on the fourth floor. Her cousin hardly paused. He pretended not see her, which was ridiculous because he was walking right for the staircase, and Elisa was still standing at the head of it. Benedict Montagov was a wholly different person these days, all gloom and dark frowns. He may not have been the happiest person a few months ago, either, but he lacked a certain light in his eyes now that made him seem like a complete marionette, moving through the world at command. Morning periods in this city were often short affairs. They came in rapid succession, like cinema showings ushered in and out of the theater to make room for the new. Benedict was not only in mourning. He was half dead himself. Benedict, Elisa tried again. She stepped in his path so he couldn't wind past her. There are honey cakes downstairs. You like honey cakes, right? Let me through, Elisa, he said. Elisa stood firm. It is only that I haven't really seen you eat, and I know you no longer live here so maybe it occurs outside of my sight, but the human body needs nourishment or else. Elisa. Benedict snapped. Get out of my way. But. Now. A door flew open. Don't yell at my sister. Roma was calm when he stepped into the hallway, hands behind his back like he had been patiently waiting at his door. Benedict made a noise deep in his throat. He spun to face Roma with such menace that Elisa would have thought the two to be enemies, not cousins of the same blood. Don't tell me what to do, Benedict said. But wait, you seem to only have something to say when it doesn't matter, don't you? Roma's hand jerked up to his hair on instinct before his fingers halted an inch away from his newfound style, unwilling to mess up the gel and the effort. Roma had not broken as Benedict had, had not shattered into a thousand sharp pieces to cut anybody who got too close, only because Roma Montagov had swallowed it all inward instead. Now Elisa looked at her older brother, her only brother, and it was like he was being corrupted from the inside out turning into this boy who wore his hair like a foreigner, who acted like Dmitri Voronin. Each time their father lavished praise on him, clapping his shoulder solidly, Elisa flinched, knowing it was because another dead scarlet had been discovered on the streets with scrawls of vengeance beside the body. That's unfair, Roma said plainly. He had little else to counter. Whatever, Benedict muttered, pushing past Elisa. She stumbled ever so slightly, and Roma rushed forward, calling after their cousin, refusing to let him have the last word. But Benedict did not so much as glance back while he took the stairs down. His footsteps were already thudding along the second floor by the time Roma neared Elisa and took her elbow. Benedict Ivanovich Montagov, Roma yelled down. You! His frustrated insult was drowned out by the slam of the front door. Silence! I just wanted to cheer him up, Elisa said quietly. Roma sighed. I know. It's not your fault. He's having some difficulties. Because Marshall is dead. Elisa's words were heavy, thick, a terrible weight sliding across her tongue. Hard truths tended to be that way, she supposed. Yes, Roma managed. Because Marshall is, her brother could not finish his sentence. He merely looked away and cleared his throat, blinking rapidly. I must go, Elisa. Papa is expecting me. Wait, Elisa said, 
her hand snaking out and snatching the back of Roma's suit jacket before he could start down the stairs. I heard Papa's meeting with Dimitri. He, Elisa looked around, making sure no one else was nearby. She lowered her voice further. Dimitri has a mole in the Scarlet Gang. Maybe even their inner circle. He's been siphoning information from a source direct to Lord Kai. Roma was shaking his head. He had started shaking his head before Elisa had even finished speaking. Little good that will do us now, he said. Be careful, Elisa. Stop eavesdropping on Dimitri. Elisa's jaw slackened. As soon as Roma tried to ease his jacket out of her grip, she only tightened her hold, not letting him leave. You're not curious, she asked. How did Dimitri put a spy into the inner circle of the Scarlet Gang? Maybe he is simply more intelligent than I am, Roma interrupted dryly. He knows how to cite when someone is a liar and can establish his lie first. Elisa stomped her feet. Don't mope, she said. I am not moping. You mope, Elisa insisted. She looked over her shoulder again, hearing a rustling on the third floor and waiting for whoever it was to retreat to their room before speaking again. Another thing I thought you would want to know. Papa received a threat. Someone claims to have the ability to resurrect the monster. Roma lifted a single dark brow. This time, when he eased his jacket out of Elisa's grip, she let go, seeing no point in accosting her brother any longer. The monster is dead, Elisa, he said. I'll see you later, yes? Roma walked away, his saunter casual. He could have fooled anyone, in that tailored suit and cold stare. But Elisa saw his fingers tremble, saw the muscle in his jaw twitch when he bit down too hard to keep his expression steady. He was still her brother. He wasn't gone entirely. 3. One cabaret in White Flower Territory is particularly loud tonight. Business at the Podselnook is usually booming anyway, tables full and raucous for the antics that the showgirls pull on stage overspilling with people and alcohol bottles and every combination of the two. The only place that may compete with its noise and vigor is the fight club next door, the one tucked underneath an otherwise unassuming bar, unknown to the city if not for the constant stream of visitors. When the door to the Podselnook opens at the exact stroke of midnight, a gust of the winter wind blows in, but not a soul in the establishment feels it. Out there, when the day breaks, they are garbage collectors and beggars and gangsters, barely scraping by. In here, crammed shoulder to shoulder at every table, they are invincible so long as the jazz continues playing, so long as the lights don't drop, so long as the night lives on and on and on. The visitor who entered at midnight sits down. He watches white flowers throw coins into the air, frivolous with their unending excess, grabbing showgirls adorned in white like they are brides not runaways from Moscow with smiles as cracked as their hands. Everyone is here for the exact same reason. Some chance it with drunken stupor, pouring gasoline into their veins so that maybe, just maybe, something will ignite in an otherwise empty chest. Some are more roundabout, collecting and collecting and robbing drunk boys dry when they look the other way, a nimble finger dipping into a pocket and hooking out three crisp notes with her sharply filed nails. Maybe one day she can quit this place. Open her own little shop, put her name up on a sign. Everyone in this room, they all want to feel something, make something, be something, be real, real, real and not just another cog driving the money and mania of this city. Everyone except the visitor. He takes a sip of his drink. Huangzhou, nothing too strong. He eyes the showgirl coming toward him. Young Wu 14 maybe fifteen. He smooths his tie down, loosening the knot. Then he knocks his drink over, the smell of alcohol soaking his clothes, and he changes. The showgirl halts in her steps, her hands flying to her mouth. She is already drowsy from the shots she has taken with the patrons, and she almost thinks that she is imagining it, that she is mistaken under the low, flashing lights. But his shirt rips and then his spine grows tall, and it is no longer a man seated at the center of the Podselnook, but a monster, hunched over and ghastly, green-blue muscles flexing at the ready. Run, the girl screams. 
Chirovish. It's too late. The insects come. They burst from the holes studded into the monster's back, thousands of tiny, frantic critters, crawling onto the tables, the floors, over and under one another until they find sweaty skin and screaming mouths, until they burrow into eyes and noses and hair, sinking in deep and finding a nerve. The cabaret becomes enswathed in black, an ever-moving blanket of infection, and in seconds, the first succumbs, hands flying to throats and clutching, 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 trying to squeeze the insects out. Nails break into skin, skin splits for muscle, muscle parts for bone. As soon as blood spurts from one victim, inner flesh exposed and veins pumping red, the next is already tearing before they have a moment to feel the visceral disgust that comes with being soaked in hot, sticky gore. It takes one minute. One minute before the cabaret goes still, a battlefield of bodies on the floor, legs overlapped with awry arms. The dancing has stopped, the musicians are unmoving, but a tinny tune continues playing from a gramophone in the corner, pushing on even when not a body stirs any longer, all empty-eyed, staring blankly at the ceiling. The monster straightens slowly. It breathes in, a ragged, heaving suck of air. Blood soaks the floorboards, dripping through the cracks to line the ground beneath the building. Only this time, the madness does not spread. This time the insects crawl out from their burrowed skin, vacating the corpses, and rather than skittering outward in search for another host, each of them returns to the monster, recedes back whence it came. No longer is the madness a contagious matter. The madness strikes at will now, at the whims and mercy of whoever controls the monster. And as the monster takes in the last of its insects, it rolls its head in a slow circle, shrinking until he is merely a man again, undertied by the scene around him, unsullied by his conscience. Five minutes after midnight, the man walks out of the Podselnook. The news spreads like wildfire. Whether Scarlet Gang or White Flower, this city holds itself upright by the power of information, and its messengers work frantically, whisper passing whisper until it reaches the ears of its rival darlings. The Scarlet Air slams a door closed, her White Flower counterpart flings one wide open. The Kai Mansion falls to a hush, frantically conferring how this could have happened. The White Flower headquarters trembles with confrontation, demands and accusations thrown over and over until finally, so loudly that the whole building shakes, then why didn't you just pay the damn blackmail money? Soon the gangsters will all know. The shopkeepers will know. The workers will know. The Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers have failed. They promised to rein Shanghai into order, promised that their rule, not the communists, was the one to trust. But now havoc is loose once more. A letter has arrived, a messenger gasps, coming to a stop outside Lord Kai's office. Found outside, by the gates, another says elsewhere, entering through the white flower front door. The letters are received at once, unfolded in tandem. They reveal the same message, typed in ink, the sign-off still bleeding with black as fresh as spilled blood. Paul Dexter only had one monster. I have five. Do as I say, or everyone dies. Roma Montagov kicks a chair. God. Damn it, Juliet Kai finishes with a whisper, far across the city. Paul Dexter had thought himself to be a puppeteering god commanding the city. But he knew nothing. He controlled little save for coincidences and terror. He was the hand gripping a barely controlled mass of chaos. This time the chaos will take shape, grow jaws and sharp teeth, prowl the corners for any opportunity to attack. And it will have this city dance on its strings. 4. Word of the attack spread through the city so quickly that by morning it was on the lips of every servant in the house. They murmured to one another while they dusted the living room, not daring to discuss white flower casualties with any sense of pity, but moving the volume control on the radio as high as it would go captivated by the reports coming through. All morning, everyone waited for the inevitable, waited to hear about rising numbers. But it didn't come. The white flowers of the Podselnook had all dropped dead like this was merely the work of an assassin, not a monster-bearing contagion. Juliet ran her blade over the flat of the bowl again. She was sharpening her knives, 
because they were as blunt as a well-fed beast, each metallic strike echoing through the house. No one seemed particularly bothered. Rosalind was sitting in the living room, blowing on the nib of a pen while she leafed through the giant tome of a French to English dictionary on the table. I'm not disturbing you, am I? Juliet called over. Her cousin glanced up briefly. With your loud blade whacking? Why, Juliet, who could possibly be disturbed? Juliet pretended to scowl. One of her great aunts wandered in from the hallway at that moment, hovering between the kitchen and the living room, catching sight of Juliet just as she struck the bowl again. When Juliet switched quickly to a grin, the aunt only eyed Juliet with absolute apprehension before sidling into the living room and hurrying away. Now look what you did, Rosalind remarked, arching a brow. The aunt's footsteps faded up the staircase. Your knives are already too sharp. You take that back. Juliet set her weapons down. There is no such thing as too sharp. Rosalind rolled her eyes but didn't say more, opting to resume her task. Curious now, Juliet turned the bowl right side up and walked over, hearing at what Rosalind was writing. Stock report on commercial and economic conditions in Shanghai following anti-British boycott of 1925. For your father? Juliet asked. Rosalind made an affirmative noise, her finger scanning down the page of the dictionary in front of her. Mr. Lang was a businessman located in the central city, delegated to handle the smaller scarlet merchant trade that wasn't important enough for Lord and Lady Kai, but still important enough to keep within the family. For the last few years, he had quietly done his job, to the point where Juliet would downright forget Rosalind and Kathleen still had a father until he showed up to a family dinner as a reminder. It wasn't as though Rosalind and Kathleen interacted with him often either, given their residence at the Kai house, and as far as Juliet knew, her two cousins didn't want to reside with their grouchy father. But he was still their father. And about a week ago, when he had proposed taking them out of the city to move into the countryside instead, Rosalind and Kathleen had hated the idea immediately. I'm trying to get as much of his affairs in order as possible, Rosalind explained absently, flipping to the next page of the dictionary. He's using the excuse of politics to get out, but I also think he is sick of work. I will not be made to leave simply because my father won't write up a few reports. Juliet squinted at the paper. What on earth is a hog casing, and why are we exporting them to America? J. E. Sayas Pa, Rosalind grumbled. But prices dropped last February, so that's all we care about. In truth, Juliet wasn't quite sure she cared about that either. Her father certainly didn't. That was the very reason why Mr. Lang was off chasing merchants about hog casings, and the inner circle of the Scarlet Gang busied itself with funneling opium and torturing police chiefs who wouldn't fall into line with gangster rule. Juliet came around the other side of the sofa, sinking in next to Rosalind. The cushions bounced up and down, cold leather squeaking against the beads of her dress. Have you seen Kathleen? Not since this morning, Rosalind answered. Her tone had turned colder, but Juliet pretended not to notice. Kathleen and Rosalind kept having little fights. If it wasn't Kathleen getting on Rosalind's nerves, telling her to quit doing their father's work, it was Rosalind getting on Kathleen's nerves, telling her to quit running around with communists when she wasn't on a task. There was something lurking under the surface, something that Juliet suspected neither sister was telling her, but she had no business trying to push. At the end of the day, Kathleen and Rosalind couldn't stay mad at each other for long. Well, if you see her before I do, Juliet said, let her know there's dinner tomorrow night. At Chang. The front door of the house flew open, interrupting Juliet mid-sentence. A commotion stirred through the house, relatives poking their heads into the hall. When it was Tyler who hobbled in, his nose bloody and his arm looped over one of his men, Juliet only rolled her eyes. He wasn't putting any weight on his left leg. A knife wound, perhaps. Kai Tai Lei, what in heavens happened, an aunt asked, bustling into the foyer. Behind her, a crowd of scarlets followed, half of them Tyler's usual men. No matter, Tyler replied, grinning even while blood dripped down his face, 
staining the lines between his sparkling white teeth. Only a small skirmish with a few white flowers. Anong, send for cleanup on Lloyd Road. Anong ran off immediately. The Scarlets were always fast when it came to summoning others ready for dirty work. What were you doing picking fights on Lloyd Road? Tyler's gaze snapped in Juliet's direction. She rose from the sofa, leaving Rosalind to her writing. Suddenly, the relatives gathering near the foyer were much more interested, heads turning back and forth between Juliet and Tyler like they were spectators in a game. Some of us don't fear the foreigners, Juliet. You are not showing bravery against the foreigners, Juliet shot back, coming to a stop in front of him. You are performing for them like a horse at the Shanghai racecourse. Tyler did not rise to her bait. It was infuriating how at ease he looked, like he saw nothing wrong with the situation, with heightening the blood feud at the very center of the international settlement, where men who knew nothing about the city governed it. The blood feud ravaged the whole city, true, but the worst of the fighting was always contained within gangster-controlled territory lines, kept out of the foreign concessions as much as they could help it. The British and the French did not need to see firsthand how wickedly the Scarlets and the White Flowers hated each other, especially now. Give them a reason, any reason, and they would try their luck with fixing the blood feud by rolling in their tanks and colonizing the land they hadn't already taken. Speaking of the foreigners, Tyler said, There's a visitor outside for you. I told him to wait by the gates. Juliet's eyes widened for a fraction of a second before she furrowed her expression in irritation. It was too late, Tyler had already caught it, and he grinned wider, disappearing up the stairs and disappointing all the relatives who had gathered around to fawn. A foreign visitor? Juliet muttered beneath her breath. She pushed to the front door and slipped out, forgoing her coat with the thought that she would quickly dismiss whoever it was. Suppressing a shiver, she hopped over the awry plant that had drooped onto the mansion footpath and trekked down the driveway to the front gates. Juliet stopped dead in her tracks good God, she said aloud. I must be hallucinating. The visitor looked up at the sound of her voice and, from the other side of the gate, scrambled back a few steps. It wasn't for several delayed seconds that Juliet realized the only reason Walter Dexter had reacted in such a way was because she still clutched the knife she had been sharpening. Oh. She slid the knife into her sleeve. My apologies. Not to worry, Walter Dexter replied, rather shakily. His gaze darted left and right to the scarlets who guarded the gate. They were pretending not to notice the conversation taking place, staring straight ahead. I hope you have been well since we last met, Miss Kai. Juliet almost snorted. She had been the opposite of well, in fact, and it all started with her meeting with Walter Dexter. It was almost eerie to look upon the middle-aged man now, his pallor as gray as the thick winter sky above them. She wondered briefly if she ought to invite him in, as would be the polite thing to do, so the both of them could stop shivering in the cold but that reminded her too much of when Paul Dexter came calling on behalf of his father. It reminded her of when she had willingly let a monster into her house before she knew of the literal monster he controlled, before she put a bullet right through his forehead. Juliet didn't regret it. She had made a pact with herself long ago not to despair over the people she killed. Not when they were so often men who had forfeited their lives to greed or hate. Still, she saw Paul Dexter in her nightmares sometimes. It was always his eyes, that pale green stare, looking directly at her. They had been dull when she killed him. Walter Dexter had the same eyes. How can I help you, Mr. Dexter? Juliet asked. She folded her arms. There was no point keeping up small talk when it was unlikely Walter Dexter truly cared. It did not seem like he had fared well either. He had no briefcase, nor was he wearing a suit. His dress shirt was too big, the collar loose around his neck, and his pants pockets were practically fraying into threads. I've come with something of value, Walter Dexter said, reaching into his coat. I'd like to sell you the remains of my son's research. Juliet's pulse jumped, each thud inside her chest suddenly picking up in pace. Archibald Welch, 
the middleman who ran Paul's shipments, had said that Paul burned his notebooks after making the vaccine. I heard that he destroyed it all, Juliet said carefully. Indeed, it is likely he would have thought to discard his primary findings. Walter pulled a bundle of papers from his coat, neatly clipped together. But I found these in his bookshelves. It is possible they were so unimportant that he had not the idle thought to even deal with them. Juliet folded her arms. So why do you think we would want them? Because I heard he passed on his chaos, Walter replied darkly. And before you ask, I have nothing to do with any of it. I am boarding the first ship out of here tomorrow for England. He shook his head then, an exhale rattling his lungs. If the madness starts again, I will not remain to see how this one plays out. But I figure you, Miss Kai, may want to counter it. Make a new vaccine, protect your people against its spread. Juliet eyed the merchant warily. It sounded like Walter Dexter didn't know this madness was a targeted matter, dropped on its victims like a bomb. He claimed to have done it for you, Juliet said quietly. He took you into a period of riches, but now you are here, back where you began, and your son is dead. I didn't ask for him to do it, Miss Kai, Walter rasped. All his age shuddered down on him, weariness sagging every line and wrinkle on his face. I didn't even know what he was doing until he was dead and I was paying back his debts, cursing him for trying to act the savior. Juliet looked away. She didn't want to feel pity for Walter Dexter, but it twinged at her anyway. For whatever reason, her mind flashed to Tyler. At the heart of the matter, he and Paul were not so different, were they? Boys who tried to do the best for the people they cared about, not concerned for the collateral damage they might wreak in the process. The difference was that Paul had been given real power, Paul had been given a whole system that bowed at his feet, and that made him so much more dangerous than Tyler could ever be. Slowly, Walter Dexter extended his arm through two of the bars in the gate. He almost looked like an animal at the zoo, foolishly reaching out in hopes of some food. Or perhaps Juliet was the animal inside the cage, taking poison being fed to her. Take a look and see if it may be useful, Walter Dexter said, clearing his throat. My starting price is written at the top left corner of the first page. Juliet received the papers, then unfolded the dog-eared corner, revealing the price. She lifted her brows. I could buy a house with that amount. Walter shrugged. Buy it or not, he said simply. It is not my city that is soon to suffer. 5. By all technicalities, Benedict Montagoff was grocery shopping. In reality, he was more or less collecting items to destroy, trading money for fresh pears, then taking one bite before squeezing the rest into oblivion, throwing the mushed core onto the pavement. Benedict was a terrible cook. He burned eggs and underprepared meat. In the first month, he attempted it at least, resolute not to waste away like a pathetic ghoul of a person. Then, as if a shudder had come down, he couldn't step into the kitchen at all. Every meal he made was one that Marshall hadn't. Every flicker of the gas, every puddle growing by the sink, the more that Benedict took notice of the space that Marshall had once constantly lounged around, the emptier it grew. It was bizarre that that was what had broken the dam, pushing through every wall Benedict had put up to suppress his mourning. Not the absence of sound in the morning, not the absence of movement by his side. One day he had been operating in numbness, shoving aside the art supplies abandoned on the floor and going through each step of his routine with hardly any trouble. The next moment, he entered the kitchen and could not stop staring at the stovetop. The water started boiling and still he could not look away, until he merely crumpled to the floor, sobbing into his hands as the water evaporated into nothingness. Benedict put a stick of gianja in his mouth, chewing slowly. Now he could hardly eat. He didn't know why, but things wouldn't stay down, and things that did stay down felt wrong. The only loophole around the instinct was to take a bite out of everything he could get his hands on and throw it away before his thoughts could catch up. It kept him fed and kept his head quiet. That was what mattered. Hey! At the sudden shout, he spat out the raw sugarcane clumps. 
there was a commotion erupting by the far side of the market, and Benedict started over immediately, wiping his mouth. Any commotion would have been harder to discern if this were a busier market, but the stalls here barely extended past two streets, and the vendors hardly had the energy to shout their wares. This was one of the poorer parts of the city, where people were near starving and would do whatever it took to survive, which included pledging devout loyalty to the closest available power. It was a bad idea to draw attention to himself, especially here, where territory shifted and changed at a moment's notice. Benedict knew this, yet he turned the corner anyway, dashing into the alleyway where the shout was heard. He found a whole crowd of scarlets, and one white flower messenger. Benedict Montagov, the boy screeched immediately. Of all times to be identified. Benedict had nowhere near the level of recognition that Roma received on the streets, yet here he was, pinned for a Montagov, pinned for the enemy. A tear streaked down the boy's face, running a wet trail that caught the midday light before hitting the concrete. Benedict inhaled fast, assessing the situation. The white flower was Chinese, he shouldn't have been identified at all for his allegiance, if not for that white thread he'd twined around his own wrist. Foolish. The blood feud had gotten horrific these last few months. If he had the ability to blend in, why not do it? How old was he? Ten? Eleven? Montagov, one of the scarlets echoed. Benedict reached for his gun. The smarter move would have been to run when he was vastly outnumbered, but he cared little. He had no reason to care, to live. He didn't even have the chance to pull a weapon. A blow came to the side of his face out of nowhere, then Benedict was reeling, crushed to the ground amid shouting and cursing and someone calling for the death of his whole family. His arms were bent back and his head was pushed hard into the cement, before something ice cold, something that felt like the butt of a gun, jammed up against his temple. No, he thought suddenly, his eyes squeezing shut. Wait, I didn't actually want to die, not yet, not really. A deafening sound shook the alleyway. His ears rang, but other than the bruises forming all over his body, he felt no pain, no white-hot bullet pressed into his skull. Maybe this was death. Maybe death was nothing. Then the sound came again, and again, and again. Gunshots. Not from the alleyway. From above. Benedict's eyes flew open at the exact moment a spray of blood landed across his face, tinting his vision red. He gasped, jerking upright and scurrying up against the wall, unable to comprehend anything past his disbelief as the scarlets around him dropped one by one, studded in bullets. Only as the shooting almost stopped did he think to look up, trying to find where the bullets were coming from. He caught the barest flash of movement. There, at the edge of the rooftop, then gone with the last bullet, the last scarlet dropping dead. Benedict was breathing hard enough to be heaving. Only one other person remained standing in the alleyway, the messenger, fully crying now, his fists clenched so tightly that they were white and bloodless. He didn't look injured. He was only bloody, as splattered as Benedict was. Go, Benedict managed. Run, in case there are more of them. The boy faltered. Perhaps it was a thank you that hovered on his tongue. But then there was a shout from the market, and Benedict snapped, Kwai Jian. Before they come. The boy took off, not needing to be told another time. Quickly, Benedict staggered to his feet, following his own advice, knowing that those shots had been loud, and any scarlets nearby would arrive immediately to investigate the cause. But as he stood there, his whole body trembling, it struck him that with the speed those bullets had come, whoever had saved him had been waiting, poised to enter and rescue. He eyed the buildings, the evenly constructed rooftops separated only by alleyways that were narrow enough to leap from one to the other. Someone had been watching, perhaps for a while, tailing him through the market. Who would bother? Benedict whispered aloud. Six. The second floor of the tea house had been booked out tonight for the Scarlet Inner Circle meeting. All its square tables were pushed to the wall, making way for the large round one installed right in the center of the space. Juliet thought it looked a little like a barricade. 
She took a sip of her tea, hearing over the rim while she eyed the setup, weary that some poor waiter was going to trek up the stairs to check on the scarlets only to ram right into the table that was blocking the end of the stairs. All the windows had been left untouched, though for tea houses like this, window was hardly the right word when they never installed glass. They were merely closed using wooden shutters, drawn when the tea house went dark for the night and pulled open during its operating hours. The frigid cold blew in every so often, but alcohol was flowing at the table, and the oil lamps in the corner were buzzing with warmth. Still, for whatever reason, Juliet's eyes kept being pulled back to the barricade of tables pressed to the walls, and then up, where the walls gave way for the rectangular cutouts that let in the night. In here, there was the illusion of comfort and safety. But all that stood between them and the lurking unknown was a thin tea house wall. All that stood between them and five monsters prowling the city was, well, nothing, really. Juliet. Lord Kai's summons drew Juliet's attention back to the scarlet dinner, to the cigar smoke that wafted in grey plumes above them and the clinking of chopsticks upon porcelain bowls. Her father tipped his chin at her, indicating that he was finished with his agenda and she could speak now, as she had requested earlier today. Juliet set her teacup down and stood. The tablecloth stirred, but before it could get caught on her dress, Rosalind reached over and yanked it down. Thanks, Juliet whispered. Rosalind responded by flicking a single grain of rice off the tablecloth, aiming it at the seats directly across from them. She almost hit Tyler, although he wouldn't have noticed a puny piece of rice landing in his lap when he was eyeing Juliet so intently. Perhaps it was only his bruised nose causing the scrunch in his expression. Perhaps he was already preparing himself for a fight, and the distaste was showing through. Here. From Rosalind's other side, Kathleen passed the stack of papers she had been holding on to. Juliet received the papers, then set them carefully onto the spinning glass, on an empty spot right between the sauce-soaked crabs and smoked fish. I'm sure by now you have all heard about the attack on the white flowers. The table hushed at the mention of the white flowers. And I'm sure you've wondered if we are to be next, again at the mercy of another monster. Juliet spun the glass. The feast swirled under the lights, shimmering green chintzai, deep brown hongshao ro, and the plain black and white ink of what could save them. This is the last vestige of research that Paul Dexter left behind. You might also know him as the former Larkspur, now dead from my bullet. Juliet drew herself taller, though her spine was already as straight as a blade. It may be some time before we can stop whoever has resurrected his work. But in the meantime, I propose we use his work. We allocate our resources toward research, mass-produce a vaccine, and distribute it through the whole city. Now came the part where Juliet actually needed support, past merely making a case with her father. For free. Eyebrows shot up immediately, teacups freezing halfway to mouths as scarlets stalled and blinked, wondering if they had misheard her. It is a preemptive measure before the scarlet gang can be attacked. Juliet hurried to explain. Regardless of who you are, scarlet or white flower, nationalist or communist or non-affiliated, if we all stand immune to the madness, then whichever fool is trying to play at the new Larkspur loses every shred of power. In one fell swoop, we protect the city and keep everything the way it is, at no threat from a destroyer. I have an alternate proposal. Tyler stood. He rested his knuckles on the table before him his body relaxed, an utterly casual picture compared to Juliet's stiff composure. Rosalind leaned forward. Why don't you? Rosalind, don't, Kathleen hissed, closing a hand on her sister's shoulder. Lips thinning, Rosalind sat back again, and Tyler went on as if nothing had happened. If we can truly create a vaccine, it is in our best interest to charge anyone who is not a scarlet. The Larkspur was a fool in many things, but in this, he was not. The people are scared. They will do anything for a solution. Absolutely not, Juliet snapped, before any of the Scarlets could decide that Tyler's interruption meant their opinion should be heard by the whole table too. This is not a show ticket. This is a vaccine that decides between life and death. And what about it? Tyler asked. 
you wish for us to protect the white flowers? Protect the foreigners who do not even see us as people? The last time the madness went around, Juliet, they did not care until it was them who were dying, because a Chinese collapsing on the streets may as well be an animal? I know. Juliet inhaled sharply, regaining her poise. She had to get her points in quick. Her mother's jaw was tight, watching the argument spiral, and if it deteriorated any further, Lady Kai was going to shut this down. Juliet breathed out. Let the brief silence ebb around her, so that she was in control of the conversation and not desperately chasing the end of it. It is not about extending our kindness to those in the city who don't deserve it, she said. It is about mass protection. Tyler pushed off from the table and plopped back onto his seat. He hung an arm along the back of his chair while Juliet remained standing. Why do we need mass protection? Tyler asked, scoffing. Let us make money. Let us rise so impenetrably to the top that we are untouchable, and then, as we have always done, we extend protection to our people. To the Scarlets. Everyone else falling away matters not. Everyone else dying out is to our advantage. You would be risking scarlet lives in the process. You cannot guarantee their safety like that. Despite her unflinching insistence, Juliet could feel her credibility slipping away. She was trying to stake her logic on the sanctity of one life saved as something worthy of all sacrifice, but this was the Scarlet Gang, and the Scarlet Gang did not care for such sentimental notions. One of the Scarlets seated beside Lord Kai cleared his throat. Seeing that it was Mr. Ping, who Juliet usually liked, she looked to him and nodded, prompting him to go on. Where is the funding going to come from? Mr. Ping asked. He winced. Surely not us. Juliet threw her arms up. Why else would she bother to stand here, bleeding the advantages of a free vaccine, if not for the funds of the Scarlet Gang's inner circle? We can afford it. Mr. Ping's eyes darted about the table. He mopped his damp forehead. We are not a charity for the weak and poor. This is a city built on labor, Juliet said coldly. If madness tears through the streets once again, we are only as safe as the weakest and poorest. They fall, and we fall too. Do you forget who runs your factories? Do you forget how your shops open every morning? The table fell silent, but nobody jumped to put in their acknowledgement of her point. They merely shifted their gazes away and remained mum, until the silence extended for long enough that Lady Kai was forced to tap her fingers on the spinning glass and say, Juliet, take a seat, would you? Perhaps this would be a better discussion once we actually make a vaccine. A beat later, Lord Kai nodded his agreement. Yes. We shall decide if this research proves useful. Run it to the lab in Cheng Wangmyo tomorrow and see what we can find. Begrudgingly, Juliet nodded her acceptance of the decision and eased back into her seat. Her mother was quick to change the topic and put the scarlets at ease again. As Juliet reached for the teapot, her eyes met Tyler's across the table, and he grinned. Alez, Suris, he said. His fast switch into French was to prevent the other scarlets from understanding him, save for Rosalind and Kathleen, but even without knowing what he was saying, anyone could tell by his manner his expression, his tone that he was goading Juliet and announcing his victory in a tug-of-war for favor. The simple fact that he had not been shot down on an idea that went starkly against Juliet's, that her parents seemed to consider it on equal basis, indeed, Tyler had one. J.E.T. Avertis, Juliet snapped. What? Tyler shot back, still in French. You're warning me of what, dearest cousin? It took everything in Juliet not to pick up her teacup and throw it right at him. Stop playing God upon my plans. Stop intruding upon matters that have not to do with you. Your plans are always flawed. I am trying to help you out, Tyler interrupted. His smile fell, and Juliet tensed, reading immediately what was coming next. Look at how your last one turned out. In your whole time tricking the white flower air, what information did you gather from him? Under the table, Juliet dug her long nails hard into her palms, 
releasing all her tension through her hands so that her expression would not give her away. He suspected. He had always suspected, long before she told her lie in that hospital, but then Juliet had shot Marshal Seo, and Tyler had had to re-evaluate his instincts, unable to align why she would have killed Marshal if she was truly Roma Montagov's lover. Except Marshal was alive. And all along, Tyler had been right. But if he knew this, then Juliet's role as the heiress was over, and Tyler would not even have to lead a coup. He only had to tell the truth, and the Scarlets would fall in line behind him. You ruined my plan, Tyler, Juliet said evenly. You forced me to give myself away too early. I worked so hard to gain his trust, and I had to throw it away lest you misunderstood me. You're lucky I haven't tattled to my parents about your uselessness. Tyler's eyes narrowed. His gaze flickered to Lord and Lady Kai, realizing that her parents did not have the full picture of the hospital, just like the rest of the city. It would have been impossible to keep the rumors away from them, but as far as they knew, Juliet and Tyler had shown up to that white flower confrontation as a united force. The thought was almost laughable. But it didn't raise questions. Lucky, Tyler echoed. Sure, Juliet. With a brief shake of his head, he turned away, engaging with the aunt beside him in Shanghainese. Juliet, however, couldn't lapse back into the casual socializing at the table. Her ears were a roar of noise, head buzzing with the threat lining every word of that conversation. There were goosebumps all along her neck, and even as she pulled her dress tighter around herself, clutching at the fur around her throat, she could not fool herself into thinking that it was merely the cold blowing in. It was fear. She was deathly afraid of the power Tyler held over her after what he had witnessed at that hospital. Because he was right, he really did have reason to uproot her. Tyler would do all in his power to ensure the survival of the Scarlet Gang, while Juliet no longer had a single desire to be fighting the blood feud, not when it was so damn pointless. Let them both voice their truths to Lord Kai, and who would he choose to be heir? Juliet reached for the liquor bottle passing on the spinning glass and poured a splash into her teacup. Without caring who was watching her, she choked it down. You're hitting too high. Roma jabbed Elisa in the armpit, and she yelped, darting back several steps. Her scowl was half-hearted, shoulders coming up to her ears as she hunched into herself. Roma resisted his sigh, only because he knew Elisa would be annoyed if he seemed irritated by her slow progress. You said you were teaching me self-defense, she grumbled, smoothing down her hair. I am. You're just, Elisa waved around her hands, trying to imitate Roma's fast movements. It's not very helpful. A breeze floated in from Elisa's window, and Roma walked toward it, pulling down the pane to keep the cold out. He didn't say anything as he huffed a breath onto the glass. He only blew until there was considerable mist, and then with his finger, he drew a little face that was smiling. Is that supposed to be motivating? Elisa asked, watching over his shoulder. He reached over to pinch her cheeks. It's supposed to be you. Tiny and annoying. Elisa smacked his hands away. Roma. It wasn't that he didn't like spending time with his sister, but he had a suspicion she was asking for these lessons only to distract him from his other tasks. And it wasn't that he didn't like hanging around with his sister instead of tending to his other tasks, but he was also sure the little scamp had schemed this up only to prevent him from guarding their territory lines, not because she actually wanted to learn how to punch an attacker. This is very important, you know, Elisa said now, as if she could sense where his train of thought was going. I was in a coma for so long. I cannot be weak. I must know how to punch bad men. A thump came through the floor. It was either a sitting room in the house growing too raucous, or someone on the level below throwing knives at the wall. Roma heaved an exhale, then positioned Elisa, making her hold her arms out. Okay. Try again then. Keep your fist tight. Elisa tried again. And again. And again. No matter what she did, her blocks were flimsy and her efforts at striking Roma when he pretended to grab her were soft and wobbly. Why don't we stop here? 
Roma said eventually. No. Elisa exclaimed. She stamped her foot down. You haven't taught me how to hit. Or shoot. Or catch a knife. Catch up, Roma trailed off, flabbergasted. Why do you want to, you know what, never mind. He shook his head. Alisaka, no one learns how to fight in one day. Elisa folded her arms, storming over to her bed and collapsing in a flurry of movement. Her sheets flew up and settled down around her like a white aura. I bet Juliet learned to fight in one day, she grumbled. Roma froze. He felt his blood flash hot, then cold, then somehow both at once, a simultaneous broiling fury paired with a frozen fear just at the mere sound of her name. You shouldn't want to be anything like Juliet, he snapped. He wanted to believe it. If he said it enough times, maybe he would. Maybe he could look past the illusions she glimmered with, look underneath the wide eyes she blinked at him even as she spilled blood at his feet. No matter how brightly she shone, Juliet's heart had turned as charred as coal. I know, Elisa muttered, matching Roma's tone. She was grumpy now because it sounded like Roma was grumpy at her, and Roma swallowed his anger, knowing it was misdirected. It prickled at him that he had become so easily irritable, and yet he couldn't stop himself. The red-hot urge to be terrible was always pulling at his skin, easier to slip into than ignore. Roma rolled up his sleeves, checking the clock on her mantle. Elisa seemed content to have a little brooding moment, so he walked over and poked her belly. I'm needed elsewhere. We can pick up another time. Okay. Another low grumble, her arms folded tightly. Don't die. His brow lifted. He'd expected Elisa to protest, to ask again why he needed to be on the streets and watching their territory lines. But all these months singing the same tune had tired her out. I won't. He prodded her again. Practice your stances. Roma left her room, closing the door behind himself. The fourth floor was quieter than usual, void of the thumping that had been heard earlier. Perhaps they too had tired of trying to learn to throw a knife. I bet Juliet learned to fight in one day. Damn Juliet. It wasn't enough that she had to occupy his thoughts, sunken into his very bones. It wasn't enough that she had to appear in the city everywhere he needed to go, trailing him like a shadow. She had to come into his home as well, graced across white flower lips like the final frontier of her invasion. Where are you off to? Roma's stride didn't stop as he came off the stairs. That would be none of your business. Wait, Dimitri demanded. Roma didn't need to. Nothing was preventing him from treating Dmitri Voronin however he wished, turning the tables until the whole house was dizzy, because Dmitri Voronin had gotten comfortable as the favorite, and now Roma had decided he wanted the whole Scarlet Gang dead after all. So many years spent trying to balance being the heir and being good, and with one snap of his fingers, the goodness gave way for violence, and Lord Montagov had liked the look of it. Being a white flower was about playing the game. And Roma was finally playing. What is it? Roma asked dully, making an exaggerated show of slowing down and turning around. Dimitri, who was sitting on one of the plush green couches, stared forward curiously, his fingers tapping on the back of the couch, one foot resting against his other knee. Your father wants your audience, Dimitri reported. He flashed an easy smile. A lock of black hair fell forward into his face. Whenever you're ready. He has some matters to discuss. Roma's eyes darted up, following another outburst of sound from within the house, the ceiling shifting and trembling from some second-floor commotion. It might even be coming from his father's office. He can be patient, Roma said. With Dimitri's gaze still pinned on him, Roma pulled the front door open and swept outside. Seven. Here, here, and here. Kathleen circled parts of the map, slashing the fountain pen hard. The city map was practically fraying, one of the many coarser copies that Juliet owned, so she only eyed the markings thoughtfully as they bled red, soaking through the thin paper and onto her vanity table beneath. 
she and Kathleen were both jammed on one backless velvet seat, trying to peer at the map together. This was her own fault for never installing a proper desk in this bedroom. She only ever splayed herself on her bed. How often had she needed to use an actual hard surface? Kathleen made a final marking. Just as she set her pen down, one of the map corners started to curl upward, but before the paper could roll into itself and smear the ink, Juliet snatched one of her lipsticks from a box on her vanity and set it on the corner to keep the map down. Really? Kathleen asked immediately. What? Juliet shot back. I needed something heavy. Kathleen simply shook her head. The fate of the city rests upon your lipstick. The irony is not lost on me, Juliet. Now, she shifted back into business mode. I don't know if it's worth shutting down operations in these parts just to prevent a strike, but the next one will hit somewhere here. The labor unions are only going to keep blowing things bigger and bigger. We'll warn the factory foreman, Juliet confirmed. She lifted a thumb to the map, trying to gauge how far away the locations were from one another. As her hand hovered over the southern part of the city, over Nansher, she faltered, citing the road where a certain hospital was. If the protesters that day hadn't stormed the hospital, Juliet wondered if there could have been another way out. Wishful thinking. Even if they had all backed away without a fight, Tyler would have shot her in the head the moment she reached for Roma's hand. Juliet. The bedroom door flew open. Juliet jerked in surprise, ramming her knee hard against the vanity table. Kathleen, too, sucked in a fast inhale, her hand flying up to the jade pendant around her throat as if to check if it was in place. Mama, Juliet breathed when she turned to face the doorway. Are you trying to scare the living daylights out of me? Lady Kai gave a small smile, opting not to respond. Instead, she said, I'm off to stroll Nanjing Road. Would you like anything? New fabric? I'll pass. Her mother pressed on. You could get a new cheapao. Last I checked, you only fit two in your wardrobe. Juliet barely refrained from rolling her eyes. Some things never changed. Lady Kai might voice it rarely now that Juliet was at the ripe age of 19, but she still detested those flashy, loose western dresses her daughter so loved. I'll truly pass, Juliet replied. I love the two in my wardrobe far too dearly to acquire a third. It was her mother's turn to resist an eye roll. Very well. Selen? Are you eyeing any fabric you'd like me to snatch up for you? Kathleen smiled, and though Juliet had been flippant through this whole conversation, her cousin seemed genuinely touched to be asked. That's kind of you, Nyang Nyang, but I have enough garments in my wardrobe as it is. Lady Kai sighed. All right, then. If that is how you ladies choose to live. She turned on her heel and was on her merry way, brisk and quick. Except she had left Juliet's door wide open. I swear my mother does this on purpose, Juliet said, rising to close the door. She's far too smart to actually forget that. A disturbance wafted into the hallway. Juliet stopped, inclining her ear out. What is it? Kathleen asked. Sounds like yelling, Juliet replied. Perhaps from my father's office. Right on cue, Lord Kai's office door flew open. The volume grew infinitely louder, and Juliet frowned, digesting what the argument was actually about. Oh, wonderful. She reached into the back of her dress, feeling around amid the fabric at her shoulder blades. There, where the loose stitching dipped into a little hollow to accommodate a sash of black that trailed to her legs, she dug out her pistol. I've just been dying to thwack a nationalist lately. Juliet, Kathleen warned. I'm kidding. But she didn't put the pistol away. She merely waited by the doorway, watching the nationalist march out with her father closely behind him. This was a different nationalist from the many she had already seen coming and going from the office. A lesser-known officer with fewer medals pinned to his chest. You have free reign because you're supposed to keep the city in check, he shouted. 
until the National Revolutionary Army comes and swallows the Beiyang government for the Kuomintang, there is only you. Until we may install a central force so that power in Shanghai is not a game of bribing police officers and militia forces, then there, he started punctuating each word with a stab of his finger into the wall, is only you. Juliet's grip twitched. Again, Kathleen gestured furiously for her to put the gun down, but Juliet only pretended not to see. How foolish of the nationalist to put the Scarlets in their place by reminding them of what was coming. The Scarlet Gang wouldn't possibly cooperate with a future where they bent to the will of a government. Would they? Juliet looked at her father. He did not appear offended or otherwise irritated. Yes, you have made that point very clearly, Lord Kai said, his voice wry. The front door is that way. The nationalist ignored him. What am I supposed to report to my superiors about the state of this city? When Chiang Kai-shek asks why Shanghai is under attack again, what am I supposed to say? It is no concern, Lord Kai said evenly. This is no longer an epidemic, this is one blackmailer. Once we figure out who is responsible, we can stop this. And how are you to do that? By paying the blackmailer more and more each time? I'll say this, Lord Kai, on behest of the government, you are not to grant this last request. Juliet was ready, her mouth already half open to jump in with outrage, but her father was faster. We will not fulfill this demand. But you must know there will be an attack. So put a stop to it. The nationalist pulled at his jacket, huffing out an angry breath. He took his leave, hurrying down the stairs in rapid motion. With each step, his badges and medals glimmered under the overhead lights, soft golden light reflecting off the edges of decoration that spoke of such valor and bravery in battle, but Juliet had only witnessed today a frightened foot soldier. What did he mean? Juliet called over. Lord Kai turned suddenly, his jaw twitching the smallest fraction. That was the closest Juliet would ever get to startling her father. You didn't want to go shopping with your mother, he remarked, peering over the banister one last time before returning to his office. Juliet made a disgruntled noise, shoving her pistol back into her dress and mouthing to Kathleen that she would not be gone for long. Before her father could close the office door again, Juliet sprinted down the hallway, sliding in just as he was pushing at the handle. You didn't tell me there was another demand, Juliet accused. It had hardly been three days since the last. The previous ones had had weeks in between. And you are eerily fast for someone who never gets any exercise. Lord Kai sat down at his desk. A few walks in the park would be good for your health, Juliet. Otherwise you will be like me and have clogged arteries at old age. Juliet thinned her lips. If her father was diverting the topic this outrageously, it had to be something bad. He had a letter in front of him on his desk, and when she reached for it, Lord Kai moved it out of the way, shooting her a look of warning. It is not from the blackmailer, he said. Then why can't I see it? That's enough, Juliet. Lord Kai folded the letter in half. Something in her gaze must have looked ready to argue, because her father did not bother taking on a stern tone, nor did he try ordering her out of his office by command. He simply relinquished and said, Weapons. They want military weapons this time. Whatever Juliet had been expecting, it wasn't that. She blinked, dropping into the seat opposite her father. These few months, they had been fulfilling the demands, hoping that the blackmailer would go away once they had siphoned enough and could run. But it was clear as day now that they weren't in it for the money. They were here to stay, for whatever endgame. Why military weapons? Why so much money? That's why the nationalist was so stoutly against giving in to the demand this time, Juliet said aloud, connecting the dots. The blackmailer is building something. They're gathering forces. It didn't make sense. Why gather guns when you had monsters? It could be for a militia, Lord Kai said. Perhaps to aid a workers' rebellion. Juliet wasn't so sure. She chewed on the inside of her cheeks, focusing on the harsh sting of her teeth biting down. It just doesn't seem to add up, 
she said. The letters are coming from the French concession, but beyond that, this is Paul Dexter's work. Whoever has control of the monsters now, whoever had the mother insects, which began the infection, he gave them over. Juliet thought back to the letter Kathleen had found. Release them all. That was the hurdle she simply could not cross. If Paul Dexter had had a partner in this all along, how did she not know? She may not have paid him that much attention while he pursued her, but surely for someone as important as a mission partner, he would have dropped a name at some point. Therein lies the rub, her father remarked evenly. Juliet slammed her hand down on the desk. Send me into the French concession, she said. Whoever this is, I can find them. I know it. For a long moment, Lord Kai said nothing. He only stared at her, like he was waiting for her to say she was kidding. Then, when Juliet did not offer an alternative, he reached into a side drawer by his desk and pulled out a series of photographs. The black and white images were grainy and too dark, but when her father set them down, Juliet felt her stomach turn, a rolling sensation tightening her gut. These are from the White Flower Club, Lord Kai said. The what was it? Zyangra Key? Yes, Juliet whispered, her eyes still latched on the photos. Her father hadn't actually forgotten the name of the club, of course. It was only that he refused to speak Russian, even if it was so easy to lapse into the language from Shanghainese with the sounds so similar perhaps even more so than Shanghainese and the actual Chinese common tongue. Podsilnuk. Lord Kai pushed the photographs even closer. Take a good look, Juliet. The victims of the madness in September had gouged their own throats out, clawing and clawing until their hands were gloved in blood. These photos did not only show torn throats. Of the faces that Juliet could catch, they no longer resembled faces at all. They were eyes and mouths torn until they were no longer circular in shape, foreheads with golf ball-sized holes, ears dangling from the thinnest inch of a lobe. If it were possible to photograph in color, the whole scene would have been drenched in red. I am not going to send you into this alone, Lord Kai said quietly. You are my daughter, not my lackey. Whoever is doing this, this is what they are capable of. Juliet breathed out through her nose, the sound loud and grating. We have one lead, she said. One lead, and it says this mess is coming out of foreign territory. Who else is able? Tyler? He'll be killed with a knife to the throat before the insects get him. You've missed the point, Juliet. I haven't. Juliet screeched, though she suspected she had. If this blackmailer came out of the French concession, then I will find them by merging right into their high society. Their rules, their customs. Someone will know. Someone will have information. And I will get it out of them. She lifted her chin. Send me in. Send Kathleen and Rosalind as accompaniment if you must. But no entourage. No protection. Once they trust me, then they will talk. Lord Kai shook his head slowly, but the motion wasn't one that indicated refusal. It was more or less an action to digest Juliet's words, his hands absently reaching for that mysterious letter again, folding it further into quarters, then eighths. How about this, her father said quietly. Let me think about what we shall do next. Then we figure out if you are to enter the French concession like a covert operative. Juliet mocked a salute. Her father shooed her, and she skittered off. As she was closing the door after herself, she peered through one last time and found that he was still staring at the letter in his hands. Careful, Miss Kai. Juliet squealed, narrowly stopping herself from stepping right onto a maid crouching in the hallway. What are you doing there? she exclaimed, her hand pressed to her heart. The maid grimaced. There is just a bit of mud. Don't mind me. It'll soon be clean. Juliet nodded her thanks, turning to go. Then, for whatever reason, she squinted at the clump of mud the maid was working at, and sighted, stuck inside the clump that had been smeared into the threads of the carpeting, a single pink petal. Hold on, Juliet said. She got to her knees, and before the maid could protest too loudly, 
she stuck her finger into the mud and dug the petal out, dirtying her nails. The maid winced more than Juliet did, Juliet only wrinkled her nose, looking at what she had unearthed. Miss Kai, it's just a petal, the maid said. There have been a few clumps here, and there these past months. Someone is not wiping their shoes properly, before coming in. Juliet's eyes shot up immediately. You found these over months? The maid looked confused. I, yes. Mud, mostly. A rumble of noise erupted in the living room below, distant cousins, arriving for a social call over the mahjong tables. Juliet sucked in a breath and held it. The mud was smeared right near the wall, a splotch small enough that truly nobody but an eagle-eyed maid looking for places to clean could have spotted it. It was also near enough to the wall that it could have been left by someone pressed up against her father's office door, listening in. The next time you see something like this, Juliet said slowly, find me, understand? The maid's confusion only grew. May I ask why? Juliet stood, still holding the petal. Its natural color was a pale pink, but in this light, with so much mud, it almost looked entirely black. No particular reason, she answered, flashing a smile. Don't work too hard, hm? Juliet hurried away, almost short of breath. It was a stretch. There were plenty of peony plants across the city and even more patches of mud where those plants grew. Then she remembered her father at that dinner so many months ago, when he had claimed there was a spy, no ordinary spy, but someone who had been invited into the room, someone who lived in this house. And she knew, she just knew, that this particular petal came from the peonies at the Montagov residence, from the back of the house where the petals shed from the high windowsills and settled into the muddy ground. Because five years ago, Juliet was the one tracking these all over the house. Kathleen was in another communist meeting. It wasn't that Juliet kept sending her to them, but rather that the communists kept meeting up, and if Kathleen was going to maintain appearances and get invited back to the next ones through the contacts she had painstakingly cultivated, then she had to keep showing up, as if she were another worker and not the right hand of the scarlet heiress. At last Kathleen finished pinning down her hair, having adjusted her whole style in the last five minutes while the speaker at the front talked about unionizing. She had learned by now that the initial speakers never had much of a point to them. They were there to ramble until the important people arrived and the seats filled well enough to avoid rustling when latecomers shifted into the open gaps. No one paying attention to Kathleen when she tuned out and squinted into a handheld mirror from her pocket, determining that the complicated plates Rosalind had made earlier were a little too bourgeois for this meeting. Excuse me. Kathleen startled, turning at the soft voice behind her. A little girl, missing two front teeth, was holding one of Kathleen's pins. You drop this. Oh, Kathleen whispered back. Thank you. That's okay, the girl lisped. She was swinging her legs, glancing momentarily at the woman seated to her left, her mother, perhaps, to check whether she would be told off for talking to a stranger. But I liked your hair better before. Kathleen swallowed a smile, reaching up to touch the pinned curls. Rosalind had said the same, lavishing praise on herself as she was plating. Her sister was rarely in the mood to sit around and chat these days. She would likely not refuse if Kathleen caught her around the house and asked for a moment of her time, but the trouble was precisely that she was never around. I liked it too, Kathleen replied quietly, and turned back in her seat. She almost wished she hadn't taken it out now, ruining her sister's handiwork. The room suddenly broke into applause, and Kathleen hurried to follow suit. As the speakers changed, she sat up in her seat and tried to shift her attention back to listening, but her thoughts kept wandering, her hands idly reaching up to touch her hair. Their father had visited again last week, more insistent on their move out to the countryside. Rosalind had rolled her eyes and stormed off, which their father hadn't taken very well, and Kathleen had been the one left behind to entertain his theatrics about the state of the city and where its politics were taking it. Maybe that was the way the two of them split their duties. Rosalind talked back and pushed all his buttons, but when their father wasn't watching, she stuck her nose into his work and did his business for him. 
Kathleen smiled and nodded, and when their father needed the assurance, she did everything expected of the thoughtful, demure Kathleen Lang that the city knew. She had always known that adopting this name would mean taking a part of her sister's personality, if not for the sake of appearances, then purely for the sake of ease. Sometimes her father spoke to her as if he had truly forgotten that the real Kathleen was dead. Sometimes she wondered what would happen if she spoke the name Celia before him again. Kathleen shifted in her seat. Nevertheless, she was more worried about Rosalind than she was worried about herself. If she was being honest, she was a little miffed that Rosalind had stopped her from going to Juliet's aid so many months ago, yet found no problem hanging around the cabarets on neutral territory, socializing with Frenchmen in the city's trade network. How can we be on the same side when they will never fall? Rosalind had said. They are invulnerable. We are not. Nothing had changed. Rosalind and Kathleen were still set apart from the rest of the Scarlet Gang carrying the Kai name, but suddenly let it be a task that gave Rosalind a sense of self-decided purpose, and here she was, uncaring about vulnerability. Maybe it was inevitable in a city like this. Each and every one of them, taking on a path of destruction, even if they knew better, even if they would warn someone else off it. Rosalind didn't like Kathleen's involvement with the communists, Kathleen thought it was utterly foolish for Rosalind to play diplomat. Who cared if their father threatened to move them? He had no true power over them, not anymore, not in Shanghai. Filial piety be damned. One word from Juliet, and he would have to tuck tail and turn away, pack his bags and depart the city alone. We are absolutely not leaving, Kathleen muttered to herself as another round of applause swept the room, drowning her out. She sat back, resolute to pay attention as debate began, as one communist argued that it was the foreigners causing the problems in this city, not the gangsters, and another rebutting that the only solution was to kick them all out. The planning started, the very reason why Kathleen was here, leaning forward in her seat as probable strike locations were determined in timelines constructed for the ultimate destruction of foreign imperialism. It was at that moment her gaze wandered, only for the briefest scan of the room. She didn't know what it was that had inspired her to do so, but her attention snagged on a foreign face. When she blinked once more, Kathleen realized by his clothing that it was no foreigner at all but a Russian white flower. Kathleen frowned. She returned her attention to the front, but pulled up the collar of her coat, hiding as much of her face as she could. Dmitri Voronin, she thought, her mind racing. What are you doing here? Eight. Let me guess, Juliet said, pulling the car door after herself. You've discovered that I am a secret revolutionary, and now you are taking me to the outskirts of the city for execution. From the driver's seat, Lord Kai glanced over at her with a furrow of his brow. Then he pushed a button on the dashboard, letting the engine rumble to life. I am begging you to stop watching the Wild West films coming from America, he said. For someone who likely had not driven a car in years, her father spun the steering wheel and pulled out of the driveway with expert maneuvering. They're rotting your brain. Juliet twisted in her seat and peered out the back window, waiting for other cars to follow behind them. When none came, she turned to the front again and put her hands in her lap, pursing her lips. This was mightily strange. She couldn't remember the last time they'd gone anywhere without an entourage or at least one other scarlet for backup. It wasn't that her father needed protection, not when he was the one who had taught her how to use a blade at three years old, but having a group of men clustered around him at all times was about posture, and she didn't think he ever went into public without that protection. So, Juliet tried, where are we going? You managed to get into this car without asking questions, her father replied plainly. Now refrain until we arrive. Juliet pursed her lips further and sank into her seat. By the time they were easing down Avenue Edward VII in the thick of the city, Lord Kai's driving had grown more erratic, starting and stopping when people walked onto the road with none of the smoothness of their chauffeurs. Just when Juliet thought they were close to running over an elderly woman, her father pulled into a wide alleyway and parked, reaching into the back seat for his hat. Come on, Juliet, he chided 
already climbing out. Juliet followed slowly. She took in the alleyway, still trying to gauge the situation as she rubbed her hands together to keep them warm. There was one door here, the back entrance of what Juliet would guess to be a restaurant, if the noise coming from inside was any indication. Lord Kai called for her again. Juliet hurried over just as the door opened, and the serving boy silently gestured for them to enter. If we're here to eat food that Mama hates, you only had to say so, she whispered. Quiet. The serving boy led them through the back corridors of the restaurant, bypassing the rumble of the kitchen. Juliet had been jesting about eating a meal, but she still frowned when they also walked past the doors into the main restaurant without a second glance. Had her father booked a private room? For just the two of them? Maybe Juliet shouldn't have joked about a revolutionary execution, after all. Don't be ridiculous, she told herself. The serving boy turned a corner and stopped in front of a nondescript door. Everything was dim and damp back here, looking like it hadn't been cleaned in years, never mind used to serve customers. If you need anything, I'll be outside. The serving boy opened the door. Lord Kai walked in promptly, Juliet close on his heels. A part of her had already decided that this was going to be a quaint teaching lesson. Perhaps a sparse meal laid out to show how quickly they could lose everything they had. The last thing she had expected to find inside the room, seated at a round table, was Lord Montagov and Roma. Juliet's eyes bugged, her hand fumbling at her sleeve for a weapon more out of shock and automatic instinct than any real preparation for a fight. While she clutched at air, however, Roma bolted to his feet and actually drew his pistol, ready to shoot. Until his father said, Hold on, boy. Roma blinked, his arm receding back an inch. The grey light streaming in from the filmy windows gave him an eerie appearance, or perhaps that was just him now, his mouth an angry slash, his jaw tight enough to resemble stone. What? I sent an invitation to meet, Lord Montagov said. Then he switched from Russian to Chinese. Sit, Roma. Slowly, Roma sat. Baba, Juliet hissed. What is the meaning of this? Sit, Juliet, Lord Kai simply echoed. When Juliet didn't move, he closed a hand over her elbow and gently guided her to the table, leaning close to his daughter and whispering, the perimeter is secure. It is not an ambush. If it were, it is not like they would declare it, Juliet whispered back. She plopped ungraciously into a seat, resting only half her thigh so she could leap up at a moment's notice. Yes, you mustn't worry, Miss Kai, Lord Montagov declared. There are only so many times you can ambush someone before they come to expect it. Juliet felt her chest go cold. Lord Montagov, Meanwhile, was smiling, and the sight itself would have been terrible enough, but it was rendered even more abhorrent because it looked so much like Roma's smile. How dare he? You. Juliet lunged over the table, knife out, but Roma was quicker. His pistol pressed into her forehead, and Juliet froze, her breath escaping in a quick sound through her clenched teeth. When Juliet dared meet Roma's eyes, she found only loathing. It shouldn't have hurt so badly when this was her fault. The image was only right, only fitting. Who else would he hold a gun to but his enemy? Who else should he defend save his own father? It shouldn't have hurt so badly, and yet it did. I did this, Juliet thought numbly. You told me you would choose me above all else, and then I did this to us. She had put him back on the side of his own father, who had caused nurse's death, who had threatened to kill him if Roma couldn't kill her. It almost didn't seem worth it. Almost, almost, but Juliet was making the exact same choice Roma had. At least he would be alive, whatever the consequences she had to swallow. Juliet, Lord Kide warned again, though his command was soft. Knife away, please. With her teeth gritted even harder, Juliet pushed the blade back into her sleeve. Roma, in courteous response, set the pistol down on the table within reaching distance. It is much nicer to be civil, is it not? Lord Montagov said. I have a proposition. And it involves you, Miss Kai. 
Juliet narrowed her eyes. She didn't prompt him to go ahead. She only waited. I would like you to cooperate with my son. Juliet immediately jerked against her seat, her head snapping in Roma's direction. He did not react. He had known already, had agreed. I do beg your pardon, Juliet managed. Why would I do that? Don't you wish to find who is sending the threats? Lord Montagov asked. The two of you have the foreign language skills to socialize into the French concession. Sending a gangster in alone is asking for trouble, but pairing enemies together, oh, the foreigners would not know what to do. What game is he playing at? Juliet remained quiet. Something was afoot here, and she didn't like it. It is a good idea, Juliet, Lord Kai said, finally speaking up. His voice was even, almost bored. If both gangs are receiving threats, then nothing will scare the blackmailer more than us teaming up, however momentarily. Both Scarlet Gang and White Flowers walk out of this with a third enemy defeated. But you don't understand, she wanted to say. Juliet stared at Lord Montagov, stared down the hard glint in his dark eyes. This was not merely a way to combine their forces. Lord Montagov knew exactly what past she and Roma had, this was a scheme to gather scarlet information, to have Roma do what he refused five years ago, win her trust, act the spy. The moment they started working together, Juliet wouldn't be able to shake him. Anything the scarlets discovered, the white flowers would have too. Only Juliet couldn't say any of this, could she? She was trapped, and Lord Montagov knew it. Cooperate, and there would be no questions asked. Refuse and rebel and her father would ask why, and she would have to tell the truth, the first time, her romance with Roma caused an explosion at the Scarlet House, the second time, Tyler almost took all their lives. A fine idea indeed, Juliet said dully. Lord Montagoff clapped his hands together, making one, thunderous sound. What ease! If only the rest of our men were as friendly as we were. He turned to Roma, have the two of you formally met? I imagine not. Roma and Juliet looked at each other. Roma's jaw tightened even further. Juliet's fists grew deathly white under the table. All the while, Lord Kai was unconcerned, the only one in the room whom this whole show was for. We have not, Roma lied, his gaze steady. He stood. Extended his hand across the table. Roman Nikolievich Montagov. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Roman. She almost said it aloud like an echo, almost passed it through her lips simply out of the urge to commit it to memory. There was a part of her that had always known that that was his true name, but the city had long forgotten it just like they had forgotten that hers was Kai Junli. The city only knew him as Roma. It was easier to pronounce in Chinese, it was what everyone who knew him called him. She supposed she didn't know him anymore. Not this boy who stood with his arm outstretched, his fingers steady like they had never before pressed into her skin as gently as a kiss. Lovers turned to strangers, and it cut deep enough to bleed. The pleasure is mine. Juliet stood and reached to shake. Their palms touched, and she did not flinch, she would not flinch. May I invite you on a walk around the perimeter? There are some details I would like to work out. Lord Kai raised his eyebrows. Juliet, perhaps not. The perimeter is secure, isn't it? She interrupted. He could hardly argue against that. So long as there wasn't a chance of ambush, it wasn't as if Juliet couldn't handle the white flower air. Lord Kai gestured for her to go on. I will wait for you in the car. Juliet marched out of the private room, counting on Roma to follow her. She strolled through the corridors so briskly that wisps of her hair had come undone by the time she shoved out the back door and emerged into the alley, her shoes stepping into soggy sheets of newspaper. Deep inhale, deep exhale. Her breath clouded in front of her, fogging her vision with white when Roma emerged too and she turned to face him, meeting his glower. Walk, Roma commanded, starting in the other direction of the alley. Don't tell me what to do, Juliet muttered. Nevertheless, she marched after him and followed along, 
keeping pace beside Roma with a carefully placed distance between them. If the alleys here were any busier, she would not have suggested this, opting to forego a private conversation rather than be seen having one, but the passageways were tight and dark, and they could circle around the restaurant for however long they needed without approaching any main road. So what is this supposed to be? Juliet asked outright. Overhead, a rusty pipe dripped a bead of water onto her neck. My father sprang it on me as well, Roma answered, sounding like he was speaking through shards of glass in his throat. This whole thing was Dimitri's idea. I'm supposed to win back your trust and siphon information. Juliet bit down on the inside of her cheeks. Her guess was right. It was an attempt to finish what they had started five years ago, only Lord Montagoff didn't know that Juliet had already finished it. Does he know about? The hospital? Roma interrupted. No. It hasn't gotten back to them. They know about the, he paused. Swallowed hard. The confrontation, but as far as your role in it goes, your cousin kept the information contained. Which meant the White Flowers knew that Tyler had ambushed Elisa, that Juliet had killed Marshall, but they did not know why. They did not know that Tyler had accused Juliet of being a traitor, because as far as Tyler knew, he was wrong, and he did not want to be made a fool. Win back my trust and siphon information, Juliet repeated softly. Except I beat you to that game. The alley narrowed. Instinctively, Juliet swerved to avoid a rubbish bag, losing her careful distance with Roma as her fingers brushed up against his. The contact was brief, barely an event in the hubbub of the city, entirely infinitesimal when it came to a measurable length of time. All the same, her whole arm flexed like she had been shocked by an electric line. In her periphery, she caught Roma jolt, his expression hardening. Neither of them said anything. They let the sound of distant tram lines and yelling paperboys ebb and flow around them. They let the silence run, because Juliet could hardly think when Roma was so close, and Roma didn't seem too eager to loosen the anger in his eyes. It is clear why my father put me up to this, he managed eventually. They turned into a wider alley. But why did yours agree? Juliet pulled at one of the beads on her dress. It wasn't a real question. She could hear it in his tone. You have a spy, Roma went on when she remained unspeaking. One of ours has infiltrated your inner circle. And whoever it is has talked your father into this. I know, she said, though she hadn't been certain. Better to sound confident than have Roma think he was offering her new information. Call them off if you're so concerned. Roma snorted. The sound was uncharacteristic enough that Juliet glanced over sharply, catching him just as he ran a hand through his hair. It messed up the style, but he did not need to fix it to look perfect. It was something about the tilt of his chin, the blankness in his stare. He had changed more in these few months than he had in those years while she was away. I have nothing to do with it, Roma replied sharply. I suspect Dimitri sent them in. He's planning something, something to hurt you and overthrow me at the same time. There was a pause as he hopped in his step, avoiding a muddy puddle. I think it'll serve both of us to be wary of this situation. Let us not invite more plotting by defying this arrangement. He was right. That was logical. But God, was everything she had done for nothing? She had faked Marshal Sio's death to remove Roma from her side, to quash any chance that she would cave and draw him back, and now they were to work together anyway? How unfeeling was she expected to be? There was only so much strength she could summon. If we are to collaborate, Juliet said, it must be public information. The white flowers must agree that this is not a secret. Roma frowned. He had caught the tightness in her voice. Of course. Why would it be? I am only checking. Not a worry. It was a colossal worry. If they were spotted together once more and suspected of being lovers, Tyler would destroy them, and then climb to the top and rule the Scarlets himself. Juliet could not let that happen she would rather die. Juliet slowed her pace. They were fast approaching the restaurant again, 
having circled the buildings once over. How does a week to collect our sources sound? Then we merge right into the French concession. Sounds fair, Roma said, just as dryly. He came to an abrupt halt. Clearly he had no interest in accompanying her back to the restaurant, nor walking any farther when their conversation was finished. With a shaky exhale, Juliet stopped too, smoothing her expression down until it was blank. She turned to face Roma, a polite goodbye poised on her tongue. But don't be mistaken, Juliet. His eyes swiveled to her slowly. That once familiar stare was now fathomless, and Juliet's breath caught in her throat, stilling like a creature in the headlights. She was ready. She knew what he would say. But it still tore into her, it still stung as mightily as razor wire wrapped around her heart, both ends pulled until it could wrap no tighter. When this is over, I will have my revenge. You will answer to me for what you did. Juliet swallowed. She said nothing. She waited lest he had more to say, but when there was silence, she simply turned on her heel and walked away, her shoes clicking on the hard gravel. Lord Kai was already in the car by the time Juliet returned to the alley behind the restaurant. She slapped her hands onto the hood of the car, huffing so vigorously into the cold that her breath was visible in a shroud around her. It's not too late, she said. We can call an ambush. Lord Montagog remains yet in the vicinity. By now Roma had to have long left. An opportunity was an opportunity. Darling daughter, Lord Kai pinched the bridge of his nose, get in the car please. Father, Juliet shot back, I crave violence. Get in the car. Now. Juliet huffed again, then pushed off the car hood. They are the enemy, she snapped when she slammed the passenger door after herself. A loose bit of hair blew into her eyes, and she yanked it back. If they have suggested a seemingly great idea, it is obviously with an ulterior motive, so why are we playing along? The blood feud is a thoughtless notion, Juliet, Lord Kai cut in, adjusting the rearview mirrors. What have I taught you? Juliet drummed her fingers against her knee. She wished he wouldn't make some lesson out of this now, when the boundaries were evidently black and white. Once, she would have been rather pleased to see a lessened hatred for the white flowers but at present it didn't seem like her father was ignoring the blood feud. It seemed like, like he didn't care. Like something else was more important. We hate those who harm us, Juliet said, an echo of the words her father had given her long ago. We do not hate senselessly. She shook her head. It is a pretty idea, but the white flowers do want to hurt us. Needs and desires change as fast as the breeze. Lord Kai rolled down a window, and the cold flooded in. She was starting to think he had gotten too accustomed to the biting temperatures of his office. So long as we do not lose face, if the leadership of the White Flowers requests a quiet cooperation so that both gangs survive a second monster reckoning, what is the issue? There was more to it. It could not be that simple, because her father was not that easily swayed. What are we getting out of it? she asked directly. Lord Kai's response was to start the engine. Slowly, they reversed from the alleyway, merging back into the pandemonium that rumbled ever constant in the hub of the city. Through the open window, the aroma of deep-fried street food wafted in, a decent companion to the frigid cold. Minutes later, when they stopped at the signal of a police officer running traffic control, Lord Kai said, keep them distracted. Juliet blinked. A rickshaw halted to a stop outside her window, and from the corner of her eye, she watched the runner of the rickshaw let go of the poles, mop his forehead free of sweat, and eat a whole meat bun, all within seconds. The officer signaled for them to move. The car crept forward. Distracted? Juliet repeated. You have a spy. One of ours has infiltrated your inner circle. And whoever it is has talked your father into this. From what? But Lord Kai only drove onward, giving a nod to the officer as they passed. It was another bout of silence, entirely typical for her father, before he said, Some things you do not yet understand. Tinghua. Do as you're told. 
Juliet could hardly argue. 9. When the last of the maids closed their doors to retire for the night, Juliet slipped out from her bedroom, clutching her basket to her chest. She made good time tiptoeing down the hallway, her mind singularly focused on making it out of the house, only then she passed Rosalind's bedroom and noted the glow of light underneath the door. Juliet paused. This was strange. Rosalind? A rustling came from within the room. Juliet? Is that you? You can come in. Juliet set her basket down against the wall and opened Rosalind's door before her cousin could change her mind, letting the gold light of the bedroom flood out into the hallway. When Juliet remained at the threshold for a long moment, taking in the scene, Rosalind looked up from her desk, her thin brow arching smoothly. Her face was still made up despite the late hour. The curtains of her windows were left undrawn, the half-peaking moon shining through the clouds and upon the bed. It's so late, Juliet said. You haven't retired yet? Rosalind set her pen down. I could say the same to you. Your hair is still done up as neatly as mine. Yes, well, Juliet did not quite know how to finish that sentence. She hardly wanted to say it was because she was on her way out. Instead, she zeroed in on Rosalind's desk and changed the subject. What has your attention? What has your curiosity? Rosalind replied just as quickly. Juliet folded her arms. Rosalind smiled, indicating her tone to be a joke. The moonlight dimmed, passing entirely behind a cloud, and the room's lamp bulb seemed to hesitate along with it. Your sister wanted me to speak with you, actually. Juliet inched a few steps into the room, her eyes scanning the desk. She caught sight of flyers from the burlesque club, as well as one or two pieces of notepaper torn from whatever ledger it had come from. She's worried about you. About me? Rosalind echoed. Whatever for? She leaned back, eyes wide. As she did so, there was a glint from her collar, metal catching light. A new necklace, Juliet noted. Kathleen always wore her pendant, but Rosalind had never been one for jewelry. She said it was dangerous to wear valuables on the streets of Shanghai. Too many pickpockets, too many eyes. No concrete reason, call it intuition. Whip quick, Juliet strolled closer, then pinched her fingers around a slip of paper, pulling before Rosalind could stop her. Juliet pivoted on her heel, turning her arms the other way in case Rosalind was to snatch it away, but her cousin only rolled her eyes, letting Juliet look. Pierre Moreau. Alfred Delaney. Edmund Lefevre. Gervais Carroll. Simon Clare. Juliet scrunched her nose, then turned back, asking without words what the list was. Rosalind held her hand out. Patrons at the club on to a cost for funds. Would you like an in-depth explanation about how I drug their drinks? A chronological order of who pulls out their coins first. Oh, hush, Juliet chided lightly, returning the slip to Rosalind's hand. She ran her gaze across the other papers for a brief while before determining that there wasn't much to scrutinize. Kathleen had been concerned about Rosalind's involvement with foreigners, but to live in this city was to be involved with foreigners. Don't tell me you're getting on my case too. Who, me? Juliet asked innocently. Rosalind's bed jangled with noise when Juliet plopped onto the mattress for a makeshift seat, all the pearls and feathers from Rosalind's dance costumes tangling together atop the deep blue sheets. Whatever about? Rosalind rolled her eyes, getting up from her desk. Juliet thought her cousin was coming to join her, but Rosalind pivoted the other way and wandered over to her window instead. Kathleen cannot go two seconds without trying to trail me across the city. I'm on neutral territory, not operating on white flower ground. I think she's more concerned about the foreigners than the blood feud. Rosalind leaned up against the windowsill, propping her chin into her hand. The foreigners see this country as an unborn child to keep in line, she said. No matter how they threaten us with their tanks, they will not harm us. They watch us split internally like embryos in the womb, twins and triplets eating each other until there is no one left, 
and they want nothing more than to stop it so we can come out whole for them to sell. Juliet was grimacing when Rosalind turned back around. Okay, first of all, that's a disgusting metaphor and not how biology works. Rosalind jazzed her hands around. Ooh, look at me. I studied with Americans and I know how biology works. Ooh, look at me, Juliet imitated, her hands doing the same. I'm a triplet, and yet my French tutors forgot to tell me I can't eat another sibling in the womb. Rosalind couldn't hold back her laugh. It spluttered out in a short and loud sound, and Juliet grinned too, her shoulders lightening for the first time that week. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. My point, Rosalind said, sobering, is that the danger in this city is its politics. Forget the foreigners. It's the nationalists and the communists, tearing at each other's throats then working together for revolution in the same breath. No one should be messing with them. Not you. Not Kathleen. If only it were that simple. If only one thing could be to blame. As if they didn't all ripple off each other like the world's most cursed game of falling domino tiles. Whether they wanted it or not, revolution would come. Whether they ignored it or not, it would come. And whether they carried on business as usual or shut down every operation before they could be hurt, it would still come. Your necklace, Juliet blurted suddenly, it's new. Rosalind blinked, taken aback by the switch in topic. This? She pulled at the chain, and out came the silver, dangling with a plain strip of metal at the end. It's nothing special. A feeling prickled the hairs at the back of Juliet's neck, a peculiar anxiety that she couldn't quite place. I just never see you with jewelry. She scanned her cousin's desk again, then the shelf space above, where Rosalind's loose knickknacks sat. Short of a few earrings, she sighted little else. Imperial women used to own mounds upon mounds of jewelry, you know. They were seen as vain, but it wasn't that. It was because it was easier to run with jewelry than it was with money. The clock on the mantel gave a loud chime. Juliet almost jumped, but Rosalind only quirked her left eyebrow. Biame, Rosalind sighed. I'm not a merchant that you need to speak in metaphors with. I'm not going to run. The whole reason I'm picking up after my father is because I have no interest in leaving. She splayed her hands. Where would I even go? There were plenty of places to go. Juliet could list them, by distance or by English alphabet. By safety or by likelihood of being found. If Rosalind had never considered it, then she was the more righteous person here. Because Juliet had, even if she could never actually carry it out. I don't know was all Juliet said, her voice faint. The clock chimed again to mark the first minute of the hour passing, and noting the time, Juliet quickly stood, feigning a yawn. Anyway, good talk. I will retire now. Don't stay up too late, all right? Rosalind waved her off, casual. I can sleep in tomorrow morning. Bon Newt. Juliet slipped out from the room and, after closing her cousin's door, retrieved her basket. Rosalind's words had left her uneasy, but she tried to push the apprehension down, to swallow and repress it as she did with all things in this city that needed to be dealt with, for otherwise one might implode with all that rested on their shoulders. With a quick pitter-patter, Juliet hurried through the rest of the house and out the front door, easing it shut with a quiet click. The things I do, she muttered to herself. The moon glowed overhead, lighting the driveway. And for what? To get a gun held to my head, that's what. She slid into the car, waking the chauffeur, who had been snoozing at the driver's seat. Hold out for a little longer, could you? Juliet said. I would really prefer not to crash. Don't worry, Miss Kai, the chauffeur chirped, immediately sounding more awake. I'll get you to the burlesque club safely. That's where the chauffeur thought she went when she took these midnight trips every week. He would idle in front of the burlesque club, and Juliet would slip and then out through the back, trekking the rest of the distance to the safe house. It usually took her no longer than half an hour before she would return, sliding into the car again. The chauffeur would drop her home, 
and then he was off to his own apartment so he could take his rest before his next early morning shift, and everyone in the Scarlet Gang would be none the wiser to what Juliet was up to. Juliet poked her head into the front seats. Have you eaten? The chauffeur hesitated. There was a short break at six. There was already a bun floating beside him, dangling in its bag. Juliet had extra from the many she'd bought off the street cart earlier, and unless Marshal Seo could eat five in two days, they would go bad. It's a little cold, Juliet said when he took it gingerly. But it'll go colder the longer it takes for us to reach our destination, where you can eat it. The chauffeur hooted a laugh and pressed the car faster. They rumbled through the streets, busy as ever, even at such an hour. Each building they passed was flooded with light, women in Chipao ignoring the winter cold and leaning out their second-floor windows, waving their silk handkerchiefs into the breeze. Juliet's coat, meanwhile, was long enough to completely cover the dress she had on beneath, thick enough to hide the shapelessness of those American designs. At last they arrived a distance away from the burlesque club, where they always parked to avoid the stream of men coming and going from the front doors. The first time, the chauffeur had offered to walk Juliet, but his offer dried up as soon as Juliet removed a gun from her shoe and set it in the passenger seat, telling him to shoot if he was ambushed. It was easy to forget who Juliet was when she was lounging in the back seat, inspecting her nails. It was harder when she clambered out and put on her heiress face to combat the night. Lock the doors, Juliet ordered, holding her basket with one hand and rapping on the window with the other. The chauffeur did so, already biting into the bun. Juliet started forward, keeping as close to the shadows as she could. The fortunate part of the winter season was a lack of observers. People did not like looking up for too long with the wind prickling at their eyes, so they walked staring at their shoes. Juliet never had much trouble making her way to the safe house, but tonight she was on edge, glancing over her shoulder once every few seconds, paranoid that the noise she heard some street over was not the last tram rumbling to its stop but a car trailing her just out of sight. She blamed all that talk about spies. It's me, Juliet said quietly, finally arriving at the safe house and knocking twice. Before her fist had even finished coming down the second time, the door was opening, and instead of welcoming her in, Marshall leaned out. Fresh air, he said, dripping with theatrics. How I thought I would never experience it again. Hajima. Juliet snapped, pushing him back inside. Oh, we're speaking Korean now? Marshall stumbled from Juliet's shove, but he recovered fast, shuffling into the apartment. Just for me? I'm so honored. You are so annoying. Juliet shut the door, pulling the three locks. She set the basket down onto the table and hurried to the window, peering through the thin crack between the boards nailed to the glass. She didn't see anything outside. No one was coming for them. I'm going to kill you a second time just to see how you like it. It might be fun. Make sure to shoot me so it's symmetrical with the other bullet scar. Juliet spun around, putting her hands on her hips. She glared at him for a long moment, but then she couldn't help it. The smile slipped out. Ah! Marshall shrieked. Before Juliet could shush him, he was already lunging at her, picking her lithe frame off the ground and spinning her around until her head was dizzy. She shows emotion. Cease immediately. Juliet screeched. My hair! Marshall set her down with a steady thump. He held on to her even once she was on her own feet again, his arms splayed along her shoulders. Poor, touch-starved Marshall Seo. Maybe Juliet could find him a stray cat. Did you bring me alcohol this time? Juliet rolled her eyes. Finding the room to be too dark, she wordlessly tossed Marshall her lighter so he could light an extra candle while she brought out the food unwrapping fruits and vegetables at rapid speed. In the weeks that Marshall had been hunkered down here, they had worked together to get the water running again without horrendous rumbling in the pipes and the gas connected so that Marshall could cook. In honesty, Juliet didn't think this was a bad living situation. Disregarding the whole legally dead situation, that was. I am never bringing you alcohol, 
Juliet said. I fear I would find this place in flames. Marshall responded by hurrying to the other side of the table and inspecting the bottom of Juliet's basket. He hardly heard her biting remark. After all this time, Juliet and Marshall had grown familiar enough with the other that they could tell what was intended to be sharp and what was not. They were incredibly alike, and that was too eerie a thought for Juliet to mull on it long. Marshall retrieved one of the newspapers lining the bottom of the basket, his eyes scanning the headline. A vigilante, huh? Juliet frowned, peering at the page. You know you can never trust the papers to report on feud business. But you've heard about him too? Indeed a few whispers here and there, but Juliet trailed off, her gaze narrowing upon a bag on the floor, one that she knew hadn't been in this apartment the last time she was here. Then, some few inches away, there was a leaf. Now, how would Marshall Seo have heard about a vigilante in the city? Juliet folded her arms. You've been outside, haven't you? I, Marshall's mouth opened and closed. He tried his best. No. Of course not. Oh. Juliet reached for the paper and turned it her way, reading aloud. The masked figure has intervened on multiple counts to knock both sides out before shots can be fired. Anyone with information should, Marshall. Fine, fine. Marshall sat upon the rickety seat with a heavy sigh, his energy depleting. A long moment passed, which was rare in any room with Marshall Seo. When he did speak again, he was quiet, his voice pushed out with effort. I'm only trying to keep an eye on him. I step in on other feud business if I happen to see something while I'm lurking. Him. Marshall didn't say his name, but he was evidently talking about Benedict. There were no other contenders to be the subject of such carefulness. She should have chided him immediately, but she couldn't find it in herself. She had a heart, after all. She was the one who had put him here, away from everything, everyone, he loved. Has Benedict Montagov seen you? she asked tightly. Marshall shook his head. The one time he actually got himself in trouble, I shot everyone around him and ran. At that, his eyes shifted up, a brief flicker of guilt appearing when he remembered who he was talking to. It was quick. Best not to think too deeply about it, Juliet said, cutting him off. He had killed scarlets, she would kill white flowers. For as long as they lived, so long as the city remained divided, they would kill, and kill, and kill. In the end, would it matter? When the choice was between protecting those you loved and sparing the lives of strangers, who would ever think that to be a hard decision? Juliet shifted to the window again, peering into the night. It was better lit out there than it was in here, the street lamps humming happily in harmony with the wind. This safe house had been strategically chosen, after all, as far out as Juliet's eye could see, there were no particular corners or nooks where anybody could be hiding, watching her as she looked out. Nevertheless, she surveyed the scene warily. Just be careful, Juliet finally said, dropping the curtain. If anyone sees you. No one will, Marshall replied. His voice had grown firm again. I promise, darling. Juliet nodded but there was a tightening sensation gripping her chest even as she tried for a smile. During these few months, she had expected Marshall to start resenting her. She had promised she would figure something out soon, but she still had Tyler breathing down her neck and no concrete way around it. Yet she hadn't heard a word of complaint from Marshall. He had taken it in stride, even though she knew it ate him up inside to be stuck here. She wished he would yell at her, get angry. Tell her that she was useless, because that certainly seemed to be true. But he only welcomed her in every visit like he had missed her dearly. Juliet turned away, blinking rapidly. There are rumors that there will be communist-led riots on the streets tonight, she said when she had her tear ducts under control. Don't go outside. Understood. Stay safe. When am I not? Juliet reached for the now empty basket with a glare, but her malice at Marshall, even when feigned, was always half hearted. Marshall grinned and sent her off with two big, swooping air kisses, 
still making the faintest noises even as Juliet closed the door after her and heard the locks bolt again on the other side. She had to stop growing so fond of white flowers. It would be the death of her. Lord Montagoff pushed the file right to the edge of his desk, giving Roma no choice but to reach out quickly and grab it lest the papers inside flutter to the floor. From the other corner of the desk, leaning upon the outside edge in an ever-so-casual slouch, Dimitri squinted, trying to read upside down as Roma flipped open the folder. Roma doubted that Dimitri could pick out anything. Dimitri needed glasses, and the bulb light on Lord Montagov's desk was not doing him any favors. It flooded the room in a cold, off-white color that treated their electric bills kindly but hurt the eyes to be near for long, casting a death-like tinge on their skin. Comb through carefully, memorize the names of the clients we seek, Lord Montagov instructed. But that is your secondary goal. First and foremost, you are to keep track of the scarlet effort with this blackmailer. Don't let them gain an advantage. Don't let them shove it on us. If the Scarlet Gang manage to rid themselves of the threat, the White Flowers should too. It will come around to how they achieve it, Roma replied evenly. Whether we find the perpetrator or find a new vaccine. Finding the perpetrator would be a done and dusted deal. It didn't matter which side shot the bullet or slashed their blade. A dead blackmailer was no blackmailer. But if the solution to the madness was a new vaccine, then it was a game of who could hold on to the secret and save themselves first. Dimitri leaned forward, about to say something. Before he could, Roma slapped the file closed. Either way, I have it handled. A knock came on Lord Montagov's office then, and the white flower outside announced an incoming phone call. Roma pushed his chair back making way for his father as Lord Montagov stood from behind his desk and exited the room. As soon as the door clicked, Dmitri wandered over to the other side of the desk and dropped into Lord Montagov's chair. First of all, you're welcome, he said. Roma could feel an immediate headache starting up at his temples. All the clientele in that folder, all these scarlet merchants on the edge of defection to the white flowers, that is my doing, Roma. All you have to do is make the killing blow. Should be easy enough. Congratulations, Roma said, resting his arm on the back of his chair. You did your job. Dimitri shook his head. The gesture was drenched with feigned pity, accompanied by an unspoken tut 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 in the air. It is not enough to see the merchants as a job, Dimitri urged. You must accept them. Respect them. Only then will they listen. Roma did not have the time for this. They are colonialists. He took the folder into his hands, crinkling the edges mercilessly. They deserve to be robbed and looted, as they have done to others. We work with them to gain what we can. We do not work with them because we love them. Get it together. Dimitri didn't appear chastised. It was hard to tell how much he actually believed in the words he was saying and how much he was saying them only to rile Roma up. So that's how it is? Dimitri asked. He brought his feet up to the desk. All this hostility to your allies. But taking an enemy as your lover. The room had already been cold. Now it felt chilled like ice. You must be mistaken. Roma stood up, releasing the folder. I work with Juliet Kai until I can take a knife to her throat. Then why haven't you done so? Dimitri countered. He kicked at the desk and tipped Lord Montagov's whole chair back, letting it teeter dangerously on its hind legs. In these prior months, before your father wanted to keep her alive for information, why did you never hunt her down? Roma stood up, fire stirring beneath his skin. Dimitri did not protest when he stormed out of the office. Dimitri was probably trying to drive him into storming off anyway, all the better to make him look bad when his father returned to find him missing. Uncaring about his father's irritation, Roma swerved into the nearest empty room and dropped into a settee in the dark, fighting back the curses he wanted to let loose. The dust around him stirred in disturbance. When the room settled again, Roma felt covered by a grimy veneer. Three paces away, the windows had broken blinds, 
casting irregular silver shapes onto the opposite wall. He couldn't see it, but he could hear a heavy clock in the corner ticking too, counting down his time in this abandoned room before someone inevitably found him. Roma exhaled, then slumped ungraciously onto the armrest. He was exhausted by this, he was exhausted by Dimitri's accusations. Yes, Roma had wet his hands with blood at fifteen years old for Juliet. For what it mattered, he might as well have lit the fuse that tore through a whole household of scarlets. All to save Juliet, all to protect her, though she had never asked for such protection. Once, he would have burned the damn city to the ground just to keep her unharmed. Of course it was hard for him to hurt her now. It went against every fiber of his being. Every cell, every nerve, they had grown into place with one mantra, protect her, protect her. Even after knowing she had become someone else, even after hearing all the terrible things she had done in New York, she was still Juliet. His Juliet. And now she was not. She had made that abundantly clear. He kept waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Much as he loathed Dimitri, one point was true, Roma kept refusing to commit to vengeance because some part of him screamed that he knew Juliet better than this. That something was up her sleeve, that she could never betray him. But Marshall was dead. She'd made her choice. Just as Roma had chosen Juliet's life over her nurse's. Just as Roma had done what he did to send her back to America, send her far, far away. Even if she lied about her coldness, even if she hadn't feigned her weeping, soft eyes that day behind the communist stronghold, it didn't matter. Marshall was unforgivable. Answer me something first. Do you still love me? Why wouldn't you fight? Roma whispered into the empty room. His head was light. He could almost imagine Juliet sitting next to him, the smell of her flowery hair gel dancing beneath his nose. Why would you give up and give in to the blood feud in the most despicable way? Unless he was wrong. Unless this wasn't a hard choice at all, and there was no love anywhere to be found in Juliet Kai. Enough was enough. Roma jerked upright, his fists tightening. They were to work together at present, but that arrangement would end sooner or later. If Juliet wanted to play the root of the blood feud, she would get blood for blood. It would wound him just as deep, but he would plunge in the knife. He had to. The door to the sitting room opened then, and Lord Montagov poked his head in, frowning when he sighted Roma on the settee. Roma had half a mind to wipe at his eyes just in case, but that would have looked more odd than staring ahead blankly, not letting his father see his full expression. Dimitri said you might have wandered in here, his father said. Can you not sit still for a single minute? Are we to resume the meeting? Roma asked, diverting the question. We covered enough. Lord Montagaw frowned in distaste. Stay inside. There's a riot tonight. He closed the door. 10. A revolution is never pretty. Nor is it clean, quiet, peaceful. The city watches the crowds gather that night, clustering for an uprising that might finally be heard. Whispers travel about monsters and madness, and it hits a breaking point, how much misery can the streets hold before there is spillover? The unions flock together in effort. They threaten all who listen with what will happen if the gangsters and imperialists are not removed. The starving will wilt into nothing. The poor will blow away with the wind. And in Shanghai, where the factory workers number up to the hundreds and thousands, they are listening. The people march, throngs coming upon police stations and garrison posts. They enter foreign concessions and swarm through Chinese territory alike. The foreigners bolt their doors with trembling hands, the gangsters step out onto the streets, adding numbers to the troops sent to break the crowds. Is this a good idea? One worker among the crowd asks. His friend casts him a glance askew, shivering. It is freezing cold in Shanghai. Ice crystals remain on the streets, and when a bird caws from somewhere afar, the sound hardly echoes because a gust blows fiercely enough to drown it out. What does it matter, his friend replies. The city can only get worse. We may as well try. They approach the station. From above, 
one might admire the way the crowd fans out, flaming torches raised to the sky, blots of orange running a perfect semicircle in formation, blocking off all paths of escape. It almost looks like warfare, and the wind leans forward. This is your first and only warning, an officer bellows through a megaphone. Those causing civil unrest will be beheaded on sight. It is not an empty threat. Here, at the outskirts of the city, where gangster royalty and foreigners would rarely go, there have already been sightings upon sightings of decapitated heads impaled upon lampposts. They decorate street corners like mere shop signs, used as a warning to other dissidents who dare attempt to overthrow the territory they live in. It has come to this, it is not enough to expect loyalty, not enough to scare by force. The Scarlets have long known that the people are no longer afraid of them. And that is something for the Scarlets to be afraid of. No gangster rule, the crowd demands at once. No foreign rule. The officers ready in formation. Broadswords glimmer under the silver moonlight, an option far messier than bullets, but rifles are short on supply. The nationalist armies have their pick of the weaponry, and they have taken the guns to fight a real war elsewhere. The city sniffs, and the clouds grow dense, blocking the shine of the moon. Shanghai fights a war too. The soldiers in uniform have not arrived yet, but it is a war, nonetheless. Your numbers mean nothing. The megaphone tries once more. Disperse, or... The officer steps back abruptly, seeing something in the crowd. It is a chain effect, and all the workers turn to look too, one after the other, raising the gas lamps in their hands and lighting the dark night. And they see a monster standing in the crowd. At once the masses falls loose in fear. Police officers and gangsters on the other side of the line rush for shelter. By now this city knows how to react. Its people have gone through this play enough times that they have memorized their lines and they remember which exit to take. They pick up children and haul them to their shoulders, they offer the elderly their arms, and they run. But, the monster does not do anything. Even when the workers have dispersed, it stands there, one lone entity in the middle of the road. When it blinks, its eyelids come together from the left and right, and at once a collective shudder shakes the city from all who look upon it. They wish not to see how the monster's blue skin grows murky under the light, but the moon shines on anyway, and the officers in the station must turn away from the window, breathing shallowly with fear. In this part of Shanghai, the uprising pauses. Other places, other fringe districts and dirt roads, burn and become awash in blood, but here there is no movement from within the station, no slash of a broadsword nor heads atop pikes, so long as the monster remains. It tilts its head up, looking at the moon. Almost like the monster is smiling. 11. February 1927. The sun was out today burning above the city as if it were a large diamond studded into the sky. It seemed most suitable, Juliet thought as she stepped out of the car, breathing in the crisp air. There were parts of Shanghai that she could not look at directly because it glimmered too harshly, so overwrought with the strength of its own extravagance that it could not be appreciated for any of it. Particularly here, at the heart of the city. This was technically international settlement territory but the French concession was only some streets over, and the overlap in jurisdiction was messy enough that Juliet never cared much about the border that existed along Avenue Edward VII. Neither did its inhabitants, so this was where they were starting their work in the French concession, outside of it. Juliet ducked into the shadow of a building, slinking around its exterior. Here lay all the fanciest hotels, so close in succession, and Juliet didn't want to get trapped into conversation with any overeager foreign ladies out to experience the local culture. Quick as she could, she stepped into the alley and stopped, stealing herself. He was wearing white again. She had never seen so much goddamn white on him. Allure, hell surprised T. Voir ICI. Roma turned at the sound of her voice, unamused by her false astonishment. Both his hands were in his trouser pockets and it may have been Juliet's imagination, but she swore one hand twitched like it was clutching a weapon. Where else would I have been waiting, Juliet? Juliet merely shrugged, having no energy to continue being a nuisance. 
it didn't make her feel any better, nor did it improve Roma's default scowl. When his hand came out of his pocket, she was almost surprised to find that it was a golden pocket watch he retrieved, flipping its cover to check the time. Juliet was late. They had agreed to meet at noon behind the Grand Theatre because their destination was across the road at the recreation ground, where the foreign race club was. The race club was always at high capacity, but especially at these hours, when socialites and ministers threw bets like it was their full-time job. I was running errands, Juliet said as Roma put the watch away. Roma started off in the direction of the racecourse. I didn't ask. Ouch. Juliet physically flinched, a throbbing hot sensation starting in her heart. But she could handle it. What was a small bout of meanness? At least he wasn't trying to shoot her. You don't want to know what errands I was running? Juliet pressed, following his brisk walk I offer you information on a platter and you do not even take it. I was checking the postmarks on the letters, Roma Montagov. Did you think to do that? Roma glanced over his shoulder momentarily, then turned back around as soon as Juliet had caught up at his side. Why would I need to? They could have been fake if the blackmailer hadn't truly sent them out of the French concession. And were they? Juliet blinked. Roma had stopped suddenly, and it took her a second to realize it wasn't because he was enraptured with their conversation. He was simply waiting to cross the road. Roma waved for them to cross. No, she finally answered when they were on the sidewalk again. From here, she could already hear the thundering of hooves. They indeed came from various post offices across the concession. What Juliet didn't understand was why someone would go through the labor. It was harder to make stamps talk than people. Juliet could accept that. No one would be foolish enough to hire help for delivering the messages, because then Juliet could catch the help and torture a name out of them. But to use the postage system? Could they not have left letters around the city for any old gangster to pick up and bring to Lord Kai? It was as if they wanted Juliet to storm into the French concession, given how obvious the postmarks were. She didn't say any of this aloud. Roma didn't look like he cared. You're giving this blackmailer too much credit, he said. They come from the French concession because, as expected, it is someone around these parts of the city who took on Paul's legacy. A sigh. So here we are. At once, Roma and Juliet lifted their heads, looking upon the race club's central building. The clubhouse stood on the western side of the racetrack, spilling outward with its grandstand and climbing skyward with its ten-story tower. A collective roar sounded from the track to signal some race finishing, and activity inside the clubhouse rumbled with excitement, awaiting the next round of bets. This was a different face of the city. Each time Juliet walked into a settlement establishment, she left behind the parts that juggled crime and party in the same hand, and instead entered a world of pearls and etiquette. Of rules and dazzling games only maneuverable by the fluent. One wrong move, and those who did not belong were immediately ousted. I hate this place, Roma whispered. His sudden admission would have taken Juliet by surprise if she, too, weren't so simultaneously captivated by awe and revulsion, by the marble staircases and oak parquet flooring, by the bedding hall within glimpse of the open doors, loud enough to compete with the grandstand cheering. Roma, despite what his words were saying, could not look away from what he was seeing. Me too, Juliet replied quietly. Maybe one day, a history museum could stand where the clubhouse was instead, boxing within its walls the pain and beauty that somehow always existed at once in this city. But for now, today, it was a clubhouse, and Roma and Juliet needed to get to the third floor, where the members stand was. Ready? Roma's voice returned to normal, like the previous moment had been erased from memory. Rather reluctantly, he offered his arm. Juliet took it before he could have second thoughts, wrapping her fingers around his sleeve. Her hands were gloved, but still her skin jumped upon contact. There were sightings yesterday. In the outskirts of the city where workers were striking. They said a monster was present. Roma cleared his throat. 
he shook his head like he didn't want to discuss it. The monsters stalking their city were precisely why they were here. Unless people are dying, I don't care, he muttered. Civilians make up sightings all the time. Juliet dropped the topic. They had stepped inside the clubhouse, and the double take started almost immediately. It would have been impossible to go entirely under the radar, not when Roma Montagov and Juliet Kai were wholly recognizable, but Juliet had thought at least there would be a delayed reaction. There was no delay at all. Frenchmen in suits and women, twirling their pearls, were positively craning their heads with outright curiosity. None of them are going to be helpful. Roma said under his breath. Keep moving. The onlookers thinned out as they climbed upward, passing a bowling game happening on the mezzanine level. The second floor rang loud with a billiards game clacking across the space, almost in tune with the hoves clamoring just outside. On the third floor, there was a booth installed outside the closed double doors, standing sentry to the long lines of dark timber and glazed panels that made up the domineering entranceway. A fireplace roared close by, keeping the floor warm enough that an immediate sweat broke out under Juliet's coat, prompting her to undo a few buttons until the fur hung open. Hello, Juliet said, waiting for the woman behind the booth to look up. By her hair, she appeared to be American. This is the member's stand, yes? A collective outburst of laughter wafted from the doors, accompanied by the sound of glasses clinking and Juliet immediately knew that it was. In there were all the well-to-dos and must-knows of the French concession. In a city that teemed with people, someone had to be aware of something. All it took was to find the right people. Are you members? The woman asked dryly, sparing the briefest glance up. Her accent came out clearly. American. No. Grandstand for Chinese is outside. Juliet let go of Roma's arm. He reached out as if to pull her back, but thought better of it at the last moment, his hand floating inanely in the air as Juliet walked forward, her heels clicking on the smooth flooring. She approached the booth, then slapped her two hands right onto it. Just as the woman was finally startled into looking up properly, Juliet leaned in. Say that again, she said, but actually look at my face this time. Juliet started to count to three in her head. One. Two. And Miss Kai, the woman stammered. I didn't see you on our expected visitor list. Stop talking. Juliet pointed to the door. Open it, would you? The woman's already wide eyes flickered to the door and then to Roma, before widening even farther, at risk of popping right out. Some dark part of Juliet reveled in it in the rush that surged through her veins each time her name was spoken with fear. Some darker part still was more rapt at the sight that she gave, looming while Roma waited at her side. They would rule this city one day, wouldn't they? One half each, fists over empires. And here they stood, together. The woman hurried to open the door. Juliet offered a smile that was nothing but bared teeth as she passed. You embarrassed her so deeply that she'll be looking over her shoulder for the next three years in fear, Roma remarked inside. He inspected a passing tray of drinks. It means little that I managed to embarrass her, Juliet grumbled. Every other Chinese person in Shanghai doesn't have the same privilege. Roma picked up a drink, giving it a sip. For a moment, it almost seemed like he was going to say something more. But whatever it was, he clearly decided against it, because all that came out was let's get to work. For that next hour, they mingled in and out of the crowds, shaking hands and exchanging pleasantries. Foreigners who moved into this city long term liked to call themselves Shanghai Landers, and though that term gave Juliet such nausea she preferred to permanently block out its existence from her mind, it was the only acceptable one that she could think to use to describe every person in this room. How dare they claim such a title? Juliet clutched her fists tight as she let a couple pass in front of her. How dare they label themselves the people of this city, as if they did not sail in with cannons and forced entry, as if they are not here now only because they come from those who lit the first fires. But it was either the wretched Shanghai lander or imperialist, 
and she doubted her father would be very happy if she went around the room addressing merchants and bankers as such. She simply had to swallow it. She had to laugh with one Shanghai lander after the other in hopes that they had information to give when she casually mentioned the new deaths. So far nothing had turned up. So far they were more interested in why Juliet and Roma were working together. I thought y'all didn't get on, one remarked. I was warned that if I did business in the city, I ought to pick a side or get shanked. Our fathers tasked us together, Roma said. He flashed a quick grin, looking debonair enough that the foreigner visibly swooned, though she was old enough to be his mother. We're on a mission so vital that the White Flowers and Scarlet Gang must collaborate, even if it means placing business aside for the meanwhile. Juliet wondered if Roma had practiced those words and the way he was to deliver them. He spoke like the perfect glimmering prodigy, because no one could hear the bitterness but her. All the foreigners took in was his easy beauty and smooth speech. Juliet listened to the words. To the resentment that they were tasked to this, for otherwise he would be far, far across the city. She hoped the blackmailer would hear about this, or better yet, could see them right this moment. She hoped they would observe the cold cooperation and have terror strike their heart. Once the scarlets and the white flowers joined together, it was only a matter of time before their mutual enemy collapsed. Why, I don't know if I should be offended that I have waited so long still without a greeting. Roma and Juliet both turned at the voice, coming from a short, booming man. He tipped his newsboy cap, and in return, Roma inclined his boater hat, looking the picture of sophistication in comparison to the man's huffing, red face. It was an unfair competition. Juliet eyed the two women who accompanied the man and knew that they saw it too. Forgive us, Juliet said. The man reached for her hand, and she let him take it to press a kiss to her gloved fingers. If we have met before, you will need to remind me. Ever so faintly, the man's grip tightened on her fingers. He let go in the next second, so it could have been played off as a mere slip of his grip, but Juliet knew that he had acknowledged her slight. Ah, we remain strangers, Miss Kai, the man said. Call me Robert Clifford. His eyes flickered back and forth between Juliet and Roma before gesturing at the two women with him. We were having a delightful conversation before our curiosity simply got the best of us. And I thought, well, why not ask? The member applications usually come through me, but I have not seen yours. So, Robert Clifford lifted his arms and gestured all around the room, like he was reminding them where they presently stood. When did they start letting gangsters into the club? Ah, there it was. Juliet smiled in response, biting down hard until her molars made a sound at the back of her mouth. The red-faced man's tone was jovial but there was a certain sneer in the word gangsters that made it clear he did not mean only that. He meant Chinese and Russians. He had much more nerve than the American outside. He thought he could look them head on and walk away with a victory. Juliet leaned in and plucked the handkerchief out of Robert Clifford's pocket. She held it up to the light, inspecting the fabric quality. She gestured for Roma to take a look using the opportunity to turn away from the man in mouth, is he British? The two women with him were French, if the Coco Chanel sportswear was any indication. But Juliet did not have the same eye for men's fashion, and accents were hard to parse when people learned all the European languages as a sign of wealth. Yes, Roma responded. Juliet released an airy laugh, returning the handkerchief with a harsh shove into his pocket. She flicked Robert Clifford's hat, hard enough that it almost came right off his head, then turned to the two women and said in French, Mon Dieu, when did they start letting English newspaper boys into this city? Maman is calling him home for dinner. The women hooted in sudden laughter, and Robert frowned, not understanding what Juliet had said. His hands darted up to his hat, fixing it back in position. A single bead of sweat came down his face. All right, Juliet, Roma cut in. It sounded like he was starting a scolding, but he had switched to French too, so she knew he was playing along. You mustn't expect too much of him. His newspaper runs must have tired him out. 
poor soul might need a towel. That, at least, seemed to ring some comprehension in the man's expression. Serviette. He quickly mopped his face again and caught on. It was too hot in the room. He was wearing a suit too expensive, its thick fabric suited for the cold winter outside. Please, excuse me for a moment, he said tightly. Robert Clifford pivoted on his heel for the washroom. And I thought he would never leave, one of the women remarked, visibly relaxing while she adjusted the belt on her wide-flared trousers. All he does is yep, yap yap finances yap yap horses yap yap monsters. Roma and Juliet exchanged a look, the passing glance lasting an incredibly brief moment with only the blonkiest of expressions, but still, they knew how to read each other. Perhaps they were finally onto something. Juliet extended a hand. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Giselle Fabron, the woman in the trousers supplied, shaking firmly. And my companion is Ernestine de Donadou. Enchante, Ernestine offered primly. Roma and Juliet returned the introductions with poise and grace and flattery. Because these were the roles they had been raised to play. These were the games they knew how to win. Of course we know you, Giselle said. Juliet. Lovely name. My parents almost named me so too. Juliet placed her hands to her chest, feigning amazement. Oh, but a fortune that they did not when Giselle is so beautiful. As she spoke, she nudged her shoe out, stepping her heel down so it would graze Roma's ankle. Roma took the hint. He pretended to search through the members' room. Funny, has Robert Clifford left us permanently? Ernestine wrinkled her nose, smoothing her short hair with nonchalance. He may have wandered out into the members' stands. I suspect he placed some rather large bets while we were downstairs. Is that so? Roma replied. Or perhaps he has roped another poor soul into a riveting discussion about monsters. The two women broke into chuckles again, and Juliet had to resist patting Roma on the shoulder to congratulate him on the fantastic segue. For shame, Juliet said with mock admonishment. Do you not hear that the city stirs awake once more? Roma pretended to pause and consider. Indeed. But I hear it is not a monster this time. I hear it is a puppet master, controlling creatures who do his bidding. Oh, boff. Giselle waved a flippant hand. Is it not the same as before? Swindlers and raving con men, using the opportunity to sell their wares. Juliet tilted her head. By swindlers, Giselle surely meant the Larkspur and his vaccine. She meant Paul Dexter, who had distributed saline solutions for profit even though he possessed the true cure. Only there was no Larkspur anymore hawking his wares on the streets. So who was she speaking about? Yes, Juliet said, trying to hide her confusion. They are quieter this time, I admit. Quieter? Ernestine repeated with some disbelief. My, they have been cramming flyers under my door for the past week. Just this morning, she padded around her pockets, and her eyes lit up when there was the sound of crunching. Ah, I thought I still had it. I see I. From her pocket, she retrieved a terribly thin flyer, half transparent when it was held to the light. Roma took it first, his brow furrowed deeply, and Juliet hovered her chin over his shoulder, reading alongside him. The French was riddled with errors. But the sentiment was clear enough. The madness arrives again. Get vaccinated. At the bottom of the flyer, there was an address, just like last time. Only now the address wasn't even in the city. It was in Kunchen, which was a whole other city in a whole other province. Despite the railways making it a relatively short journey, to go so far from Shanghai was to leave its protective bubble and enter a whole new battleground of warlords and militias. Shanghai was its own unique mess, but out there, rulers and rule shifted at a moment's notice. No matter. It was better than nothing. May we keep this? Juliet asked, flashing a grin. The rest of their time at the clubhouse provided nothing of particular importance, and Roma suggested they leave before the afternoon turned dark. 
Juliet was still mulling over the flyer as they exited the racecourse ground, returning onto Nanjing Road. The city roared back to life around her, rumbling trams and honking cars were placing the rhythmic beating of hooves. Juliet almost felt herself relax. Almost. Why advertise in French, she mused aloud. Why only advertise to the French? I have seen nothing of the sort anywhere else. It is rather selective to only slide such flyers beneath the doors of residential buildings. Think it through, Roma said roughly. Now that they were no longer play-acting for the foreigners, he had returned to his coolness and detachment. The blackmailer seeks resources from us, meaning if we fail, it is only our people who will suffer for it. His gaze slid to her, then slid away in the same second, like a mere glimpse of eye contact was too nauseating. But it is not as if the foreigners know this. It is two birds with one stone. Feed off foreign fear and take their money. Let the gangsters remain vulnerable so they may die when they are selected to die. Juliet thinned her lips. So it was indeed the Larkspur all over again. Only this one was smarter. Hardly any of the Chinese or Russians in the busiest parts of the city had the money for such vaccines anyway, so why waste the effort? Roma muttered something beneath his breath, as if he had heard her thoughts. What? Juliet prompted, startled. I said, Roma stopped in his tracks. The sudden halt forced civilians walking behind him to jolt and go around with a slight glare cast back, only the glare morphed into fear when they recognized Roma and then astonishment when Juliet was sighted too. The two heirs ignored the goggling. They were used to it, even if the attention magnified tenfold now that they were together. We always end up here, don't we? Roma waved the flyer that was still in his hands crumpling the paper so roughly that it started to tear. Chasing lead after lead and inevitably circling back to where we started. We will continue asking around the French concession, and when all roads lead to this vaccine facility, we will go, only to be pushed right back into the concession. I can see it already. How easy it would be if we could just cut right to the end. His eyes met hers, and this time he did not flinch away. In that moment, Juliet knew they were both sifting through the very same memories, through the events that had transpired months past. Roma was right. It felt like the exact same path. Zhang Gutai's office. The address of the Larkspur's facility. The testing of the vaccine. Mantua. Mantua. Juliet blinked hard, trying to shake out of it, but the memories were gelled to her mind like glue. If it were that easy, she said quietly, it would not be us who needed to do it. She had thought that would perhaps earn her an affirmative response, but Roma remained stony. He merely looked away, then checked his pocket watch. We resume tomorrow. And off he walked. Juliet remained on the sidewalk for some time until she snapped out of her stupor. Before she could stop herself, she was chasing after him, pushing through the swaths of window shoppers. Nanjing Road was eternally busy, and the cold did nothing to deter them. As Juliet exhaled in a hurry, her breath clouded all around her, blurring her vision. She almost lost sight of Roma before he turned into a smaller road, and Juliet hurried to follow, squeezing by a strolling couple. Roma, she said. She finally caught up to him, yanking off one of her gloves and grabbing his wrist. Roma. He whirled around eyeing the hand she had clasped around his wrist like it was a live wire. Juliet swallowed hard. For what it's worth, she said. I'm sorry. Why should you be? Roma replied, like the words had already been waiting on his tongue. You returned the hurt I gave you, after all. We are the faces of two sides in a blood feud, so why not revel in the death and the misery? Stop, Juliet spat. She was shaking. Her whole body had started trembling without her noticing, and she didn't know if it was anger toward Roma, or anger toward his accusation. Roma made a noise of disbelief. Why do you react like this, he asked harshly. He scanned her up and down, at her barely contained outrage. It was false to you. I mean nothing to you. Marshall meant nothing to you. 
This was a test. He was goading her. For as long as Roma was Roma, there would be a part of him that could not fully believe Juliet would betray him, and he was right, but he could not know. She could not be a foolish girl, and though she was, though that was exactly what she was and what she wanted to be, she needed to be something bigger. Everything that unfolded between the two of them was bigger than them, bigger than two children trying to fight a war with their bare hands. Juliet smoothed her expression over, choked back the emotion that soured her throat to the point of pain. I understand if you want your revenge, Juliet said. Her voice had leveled, sounding almost fatigued. But do so after our city is safe. I am what this city made me. If we are to cooperate once more, you cannot hate me while we're on a task. Our people will be the sacrifice of such carelessness. Do not do this to me, she wanted to say instead. I cannot stand seeing you like this. It will break me faster than the city ever could if it tried to cut us down together. Roma yanked his wrist away. With everything and nothing hidden in his cold gaze, he only said, I know, and walked away. It was not forgiveness. It was far from it. But at least it wasn't open, unadulterated hatred. Juliet turned and started to move in the other direction, her ears faintly ringing. These past few months, she might have thought herself to be living in a dream if it weren't for the heaviness that constantly dragged in her chest. She put her hand there now and imagined reaching in and tearing out whatever was weighing her down, the feeling of tenderness blossoming as physical flowers in her lungs, her relentless love curling in and out of her rib cage like climbing vines. She could not succumb to it. She could not let it grow so thickly inside her that she knew of nothing else. She was a girl of stone, unfeeling, that was who she had always been. Juliet scrubbed at her eyes. When her sight was clear again, Nanjing Road was half swathed in the falling dark, its neon signs flickering to life and bathing her in red, red, red. These violent delights have violent ends, Juliet whispered to herself. She tilted her head up to the clouds, to the light sea breeze blowing in from the bund and stinging her nose with salt. You have always known this. 12. Benedict was tiring of the city's talk, tiring of the fear that a new madness had erupted. It had. There was a new madness, that was already certain. What good was jabbering on about it, as if discussing the matter would increase one's immunity? If it was supposed to be a coping mechanism, then Benedict supposed he had never been much good at taking advantage of coping mechanisms anyway. He only knew how to swallow, and swallow, and swallow, until a black hole had grown in his stomach to suck everything away. Until it was all pushed somewhere else, and then he could forget that he never knew what to do with himself in the daylight hours anymore. He could forget the argument with Roma this morning, about the rumors that he was working with Juliet Kai, and then his confirmation that they were not mere rumors but truth, that Lord Montagoff had set them to become allies. Benedict wanted to break something. He hadn't touched his art supplies in months, but recently he had been entertaining the urge to destroy it all. Stab his paintbrush right through his canvas and hope that the damage would be enough to make him feel better. For all that they had done, the Scarlet Gang didn't deserve clemency even in the face of a new madness. But then who was Benedict to have any say in this? Benedict Ivanovich. Benedict looked up at the summons his hands stilling around the pocket knife he was testing. He wasn't in the main Montagov headquarters often, dropping by only to swipe a few new weapons and rummage about the cupboards a little. Even so, in all the times he had been here previously, he had caught incensed discussions from Lord Montagov's office, usually about the new threat of madness and what they were to do if an assassin let loose monsters on the city. It always ended the same way. Ever since the Podsel nuke, they paid the demands that came. Today was the first time in a while that the floor above was silent, instead of voices wafting down, a white flower was leaning on the handrail of the staircase, waving for his attention. We need extra hands to install a wardrobe, the white flower said. Benedict didn't know his name, but he recognized the other boy's face, knew that he was one of the many occupants in this labyrinth of a house. Do you have a moment? Benedict shrugged. Why not? 
he stood and slipped the pocket knife away, following the white flower up the stairs. If Benedict continued climbing, he would approach the fourth floor, where his former bedroom used to be, where Roma and Elisa still resided. It was the core wing of the house, but instead of continuing up in that direction, the white flower he was following pivoted left and ventured deeper into the middle rooms and hallways, squeezing by bustling kitchens and ducking under poorly installed ceiling beams. Once one walked farther away from the main wing of the headquarters and into the parts that used to be different apartments, the architecture became a fever dream, more nonsensical than logical. They came upon a small room where three other white flowers were already waiting, holding up various panels of wood. The boy who had summoned Benedict quickly grabbed hold of a hammer, securing one of the panels from a white flower who was visibly sweating. If you, ow. Sorry, if you could get the last few panels over there? The first boy pointed, then put the thumb of his other hand to his mouth. He had accidentally caught it in the path of his hammer. Benedict did as he was told. The white flowers working on this wardrobe seemed a rumbling cauldron of activity, throwing instructions at each other until their voices overlapped, comfortable in their routine. Benedict had not lived in this house for years, and so he recognized none of the faces around him. There weren't many Montagovs left in this household, only white flowers who paid rent. Really, there weren't many Montagovs at all. Benedict, Roma, and Elisa were the last of the line. Hey. Benedict's eyes flickered up. The white flower closest to him, while the others were arguing about which way the nail went in, offered a wan smile. You have my condolences, he said quietly. I heard about your friend. His friend. Benedict bit his tongue. He knew little of those in this household, but he supposed they knew of him. The curse of the Montagov name. What was it that Marshall had said? There's a plague on both your damn houses. A plague that ate away at everything they were. It is the way of the blood feud, Benedict managed. Yes, the white flower said. I suppose it is. Another panel was hammered in. They tightened the hinges, jiggled about the boards. As soon as the wardrobe was standing on its own, Benedict excused himself, letting the others continue with their task. He backed out from the room and wound along the floor, walking until he found himself in a vacant sitting room. Only there did he lean against the fraying wallpaper, his head going light, his vision flooding with absolute white. His breath came out in one long wheeze. I heard about your friend. Your friend. Friend. So why couldn't he mourn his friend like others had? Why couldn't he keep going like Roma had? Why was he still so stuck? Benedict thudded his fist hard against the wall. Sometimes, Benedict was half convinced there was someone else's voice in his head, a miniature invader relentless against his ear. Poets spoke of internal monologues, but they were supposed to be nothing save metaphors, so why was his so loud? Why could he not shut himself up when it was just him? Non. An unfamiliar murmur floated along the hallway then, and Benedict's eyes snapped open his mind silencing at once. It seemed he couldn't shut himself up, but oddities in his surroundings certainly could. Benedict surged out from the sitting room, his brow furrowing. The murmur had sounded feminine and nervous. He knew he was out of touch with the white flowers, but who in the gang fit that description? Elisa, he called hesitantly. His footsteps padded down the hallway, hands trailing across the banisters erected along an awkward staircase that went into a half-story between the second and third. Benedict kept walking, until he came upon a door that had been left slightly ajar. If memory proved correct, there was another sitting room on the other side. He pressed his ear to the wood. He had not misheard. There was a Frenchwoman in there, mumbling incoherently, as if she were in tears. Hello, he called knocking on the door. Immediately, the door slammed closed. Benedict jolted back, his eyes wide. Hey! What gives? Mind your business, Montagov. This does not concern you. That voice was familiar. Benedict pounded his fist on the door for a few seconds more before a name clicked in place. 
Dmitry Petrovich Voronin, he called. Open this door right now. For the last time. I will kick it down. So help me, I swear I will. The door flung open. Benedict barged in, looking around for the source of the mystery. He found only a table of European men playing poker. They all stared at him with annoyance, some putting their cards down. Others folded their arms, sleeves crossed over the white handkerchiefs poking from the chest pocket of their suit jackets. Merchants, or bankers, or ministers, it didn't matter, they were allied with the white flowers. Benedict blinked, puzzled. I heard crying, he said. You misheard, Dimitri replied, in English. Perhaps it was for the benefit of the foreigners at the table. There was a woman, Benedict insisted, his jaw clenching hard, remaining in Russian. A crying French woman. Dimitri, lifting the corner of his mouth, pointed to the radio in the corner. His shock of black hair whipped after him as he spun and adjusted the volume, until the speakers were loudly running a program in the middle of a play. Indeed, there was a French woman reading her lines. You misheard, he said again, walking toward Benedict. He didn't stop until he was right in front of him, placing his hands on his shoulders. Benedict was about as close to Dimitri as Roma was, not very. This manhandling was hardly fitting for a fellow white flower, and yet Dimitri had no qualms about pushing Benedict toward the door. I don't know what you have going on, Benedict warned, staggering to the entranceway, but I am monitoring your funny business. Dimitri dropped his smile. When he finally switched to Russian for his response, it was as if a change had come over him, a look of complete scorn marring his expression. The only funny business, he hissed, is that I am maintaining our connections. So do not but in. Fast as the fury came, it was gone again. Dmitri leaned in suddenly and feigned placing an exaggerated kiss on Benedict's cheek, the way that relatives sent off children. A chmock echoed through the room before Benedict grunted in indignation and shoved Dimitri aside, shoved his hands off of him. Dimitri was hardly phased. He smiled, and returning to English, commanded, Now, run along and play. The door slammed closed. Tyler Kai was picking at a bow, rolling up little bits of the dough into mini pellets, and throwing them at the men who were slacking off. Come on, no snoozing he shouted, aiming another mini-bun pellet. It struck one of the assistants right on his forehead, and the boy chortled, opening his mouth so it trailed down his face and dropped in. Why don't you help out, the boy shot back. Despite his tough talk, he quickly straightened out of his nap and ducked to lift a big bag beneath the table, throwing it across the room. Satisfied, Tyler leaned back in his chair, propping his feet up on the foreman's desk. The foreman was nowhere to be seen. He had run off an hour ago, when Tyler came down into the lab to run inspections, and had yet to return, likely passed out in some brothel. Never mind that it was two in the afternoon. No matter. That was what Tyler was here for after all, he'd do a much better job of overseeing the vaccine creation than a man with half their drug supply dusted in his beard. What does that say, one of the scientists muttered over the work table. I can't read any of this English, the letters are in horrendous shape. He showed it to the man working opposite him, and they both peered at the copied sheet, squinting at the handwriting that some hired scarlet help had copied over twenty times for every scientist in the facility, down to the flicks and dots. Tyler wandered over, extending a silent hand. The scientists hurried to pass the sheet to him. Cadaverine, Tyler read aloud. What does that mean in Chinese? He tossed the sheet back, furrowing his brow. Do I look like a translator to you? Go find it in one of the dictionaries. How are we to recreate a vaccine when we can't even read the damn notes? The second scientist muttered beneath his breath, scribbling something into his notebook. Tyler continued walking, picking up a ruler and smacking it on the tables when it looked like the assistants were fooling around. It was a habit learned from his father that ever-constant sound following him when he was young to keep him on task when the tutors were around. It was never supposed to be a threat, it was a reminder, a little shock to the senses whenever he started to doze, 
staring off into space to wonder what present was coming for his birthday next week. The tutors used to think he was so disciplined, but that was only because his father was always overseeing the lessons. Until he wasn't anymore. Tyler halted in his inspection of the room, catching one of the younger assistants waving for him. He almost ignored it, but then the waving turned more frantic, and Tyler approached with a sigh. Is something wrong? He flicked the ruler absently. How much pressure would it take to snap the wooden instrument? A hard thwack over a wrist? A sudden bend down the middle? Don't look too fast, Shaya, the boy said quietly, but I think we have spies. Tyler stopped. He dropped the ruler. Slowly, he followed the boy's line of sight, up to the small panel windows at the topmost part of the far walls. Those windows provided the only light for a facility located deep enough underground to stay hidden beneath a restaurant, but not so deep that the smells of Cheng Wangmio's food stalls couldn't float in. Where the view was usually only the feet of the shoppers perusing Cheng Wangmio, right then, there were two faces peering in instead, taking inventory of the space. Tyler retrieved his pistol and shot at the window. The glass fractured immediately splitting in every direction as the two faces jerked back. All the scientists in the room cried aloud in surprise, but Tyler merely spat, white flowers and ran out, sprinting up the steps into the restaurant and out the main door. The white flowers were already some distance away, nearing the Juku Bridge. But in their haste, they had cleared a path through the crowds of shoppers, leaving Tyler a direct shot. He aimed. Tyler, no. The command came too late. By then Tyler had pulled the trigger twice in rapid succession, two white flower heads cracking with an explosion of red, crashing to the ground. Cheng Wangmio erupted with a wave of screaming, but most shoppers reacted quickly and hurried out of the way, in no mood to be caught in a gangster dispute. They didn't have to worry. This was no dispute, there were no other white flowers nearby to retaliate. A hard shove landed on Tyler's back. He whirled around, his hand coming up to block the next hit, arms colliding with Rosalind Lang's clenched fist. You have no heart, she spat. They were retreating. They wanted no fight. They were about to take Scarlet information, Tyler shot back, shaking Rosalind off. Don't get righteous. Scarlet information? Rosalind shrieked an echo. She pointed to the windows, hardly visible from the exterior, if not for the bullet hole now studded into the glass. I was watching them, Kai Tyle. I already had my eye on them to make sure they weren't going to be trouble, and they cannot hear anything from out here. What could they have taken with them? Tyler scoffed. All they need is one leak. And then the white flowers are on the market before we are. It was already bad enough that his cousin was messing with the white flower air again, by Lord Kai's command. Tyler had guffawed when a messenger reported that Juliet had been sighted at the racecourse with Roma Montagov, sure that he had finally caught her this time. Only when Tyler had reported it to Lord Kai, Lord Kai had waved him off, apathetic. We must make compromises, Lord Kai had said. It was a fool's task, each and every one of the white flowers were underhanded and quick, taking and taking, and any lesser scarlet than Tyler would scarcely notice. Do not lie to save your honor. Rosalind pointed a sharp fingernail. You kill because you enjoy it. I'm warning you. Your name cannot protect you for long. In a flash, Tyler reached out and grabbed Rosalind by the chin, forcing her to look at him. Rosalind did not flinch, her jaw locked hard, and Tyler did not let go. They were all like this. Rosalind. Juliet. Pretty, loud, terrible girls who threw accusations braced knee-deep in the guise of morality, as if they weren't just as guilty of the city's teachings. I don't need my name to protect me, Tyler hissed. He eyed the smattering of glitter dancing across Rosalind's cheek. I protect my name. Just as I protect this gang. Rosalind managed a choked laugh. Her hand came up around his wrist and squeezed, threatening to claw her nails into his skin. Tyler felt the pain, felt the five sharp points dig in like blades, 
and then the cool wetness of blood dripping once down his sleeve. Do you, she whispered. Tyler finally let go, shoving Rosalind away. She regained her balance easily, never off-kilter for more than a flash of a second. Don't get righteous, Lang Shalin, he said again. It is not righteousness. Rosalind eyed the red spreading on his sleeve. It is goodness. Of which you have none. She pivoted fast, sparing one glance at the bodies near the bridge before marching away, her lips thinned in horror. Tyler remained, crossing his arms with a swallowed wince, trying not to touch the throbbing wounds at his wrist. Goodness. What was goodness at a time like this? Goodness did not keep people fed. Goodness did not win wars. Tyler leaned over and thudded a fist against the outside of the panel windows, waving for scarlets to come out. They had to move the bodies. This part of Cheng Wangmio was white flower territory, and if white flowers caught wind of their own being gunned down and arrived for a fight, it could put the scarlet facility at risk. Goodness. Tyler almost laughed aloud as the scarlet men came outside and started in the direction of the two dead white flowers. What was the scarlet gang without him? It would crumble, and no one seemed to realize that, least of all Juliet and her miserable cousins. Hell, Juliet herself would be dead without him, from that very first time they were ambushed by white flowers and she froze, unwilling to shoot. Back to work, one of the assistants shouted from the restaurant door, summoning the scarlets who weren't needed around the corpses. Tyler watched them trek back, his head humming with sound. They all nodded his way in passing, some throwing a salute. The Scarlet Gang recognized Juliet across Shanghai because they painted her face on advertisements and creams. The Scarlet Gang recognized Tyler because he knew this city, because the people had seen him at work, pushing for their victory at every turn, no matter how brutish his tactics were. Everyone else be damned, his people came first. That was what his father had taught him. That was what his father had died for, raging for the scarlets in the feud, and for as long as Tyler lived, he would make that spilled blood mean something. All the scarlets eventually filtered back into the building. The rest of Cheng Wangmio resumed its bustle, its hawking and its sizzling, its infinite smells. You need me, Tyler said, to no one in particular, or perhaps to everyone. You all need me. 13. In the weeks that passed, the dance that Roma and Juliet settled into grew almost predictable. In the most literal sense too, given how often they were dropping into the various dance halls across the concessions. Show up, target a foreigner, get answers. Juliet didn't mind. Navigating a wadding was far more palatable than navigating places like the Grand Theater and the Racecourse. Here, although it still required the same sharp tongue, although they remained surrounded by pearls and champagne and the knowledge that this was foreign-owned land, there were still Chinese tycoons and gangsters dancing the night away, blowing their cigarette smoke out without caring that it might bother the Frenchmen at the next table. A dance hall was no different from a burlesque club in practice. Same showgirls on stage, same smoky interiors, same lowlifes lurking by the doors. The only reason they seemed so much fancier was because they ran on foreign money. Juliet returned from the bar, offering Roma the second drink in her hand. Meanwhile, the French merchant who had approached them earlier in the evening continued chattering on, following right on her tail. Roma took the drink absently, his gaze remaining elsewhere in inspection. They had spent long enough here at Bailman, or Paramount, to the foreigners, to have spoken with almost every wealthy elite present tonight. By now it was obvious that the flyers were not limited to those in the French concession but the international settlement, too, all the occupants of bubbling well road gasping in confirmation when Juliet asked about them. Funnily enough, though these flyers were the only thing people reported regarding the new monster business, nobody had actually gone to the address. Many had already been vaccinated by the Larkspur and thought it unnecessary, or they didn't believe the flyers to be real. The blackmailer wasn't smarter than Paul Dexter after all. Because they hadn't built any of the reputation that the Larkspur dove into Shanghai with, and now nobody trusted the idea of a new vaccine enough to actually go get it. 
and besides, the merchant behind her was saying once Juliet tuned in again. Your cousin has said that the Scarlets are close to a breakthrough on their own vaccine. What use is another? At this, Roma choked on his drink, managing to suppress his cough before it was too obvious. The man prattling on did not notice because he was Scarlet affiliated and had been pretending that Roma did not exist. Even if the merchant was happy to speak as if the white flower air was not two steps away, he was, and he could hear everything that the man did not even realize was sensitive information. Juliet's eyes slid to Roma as the last of his cough died, checking only that he did not need a great big thump on the back. He seemed to recover. A shame. My cousin is not to be trusted, Juliet said. She traced her finger around the cool edge of her glass. There was no one that the man could be referring to save for Tyler. She highly doubted Rosalind or Kathleen was going around gossiping with Scarlet-affiliated French merchants. They could, they had the linguistic ability, but not the stomach. The merchant leaned one shoulder against the wall. This corner of Bailman was rather empty, hosting one or two tables that had a poor view of the stage. Of course, Roma and Juliet weren't standing here to watch the show they were here to peruse the crowd and see if there were any more people worthy of approaching. Oh, the merchant said. If I'm not overstepping, Miss Kai, the city seems to trust your cousin more than they trust you. Juliet turned around, fixing her eyes on him. The merchant flinched a little, but he did not back down. I'll give you two seconds to take that back. The merchant forced an awkward laugh. He feigned deference, but a certain note of amusement colored his stare. It is merely an observation, he said. One that notes how daughters will always have their attention elsewhere. Who could blame you, Miss Kai? You were not born for this like your cousin was, after all. How dare he? Juliet, let it go. Juliet cast Roma a glare. Stay out of this. Do you even know this merchant's name? Roma looked the Frenchman once over. Apathy oozed from the gesture. On any other day, you'd have walked away. He's irrelevant. Let it go. Her grip tightened on her drink. By all means, it was foolish to make a scene in a dance hall, especially among so many foreigners, among those she needed to respect her if she was going to get any information out of them. Then the merchant grinned and said, You take instructions from white flowers now. Do you? Miss Kai, what would your fallen scarlet say? Juliet threw her drink down, the glass shattering into a thousand pieces. Try me one more time. She lunged, pushing the merchant into the wall, so fiercely that his head made a crack. Against the marble. Juliet reared back, her fist closing for another strike. Only then an iron grip came around her waist, hauling her two steps away. Calm down. Roma hissed, his mouth so close to her ear that she could feel the heat of his lips, before I throw you into the wall. A chill swept down Juliet's neck. In anger or attraction, she wasn't quite sure. It seemed unnecessarily cruel that each time Roma Montagov decided to get so close, it was to make threats, especially when Juliet was hardly in the wrong here. Anger won out. It always did. So do it, she said through her teeth. Roma didn't move. He wouldn't, Juliet had expected that. Threats were easy to make, but they could not be seen fighting with each other, not when their collaboration was supposed to be some big stand against the blackmailer. That's what I thought. By then the merchant had regained his bearings and, without sparing Juliet a second glance, hurried toward the back of the hall, scampering off like a frightened animal. Roma let go, slowly his arm winding away bit by bit, as if he was afraid the merchant was only going to come running back and Juliet would need to be reined in again. Juliet eyed the broken glass on the floor. Go sit down, would you? Roma suggested. There was no sympathy in his voice. All his words were level, betraying no emotion. I'll get you another drink. Without waiting for her response, he turned and left, and Juliet frowned supposing she had no choice except to slink up to a table and drop into a chair, putting her head in her hands. So, Roma returned, 
setting a glass in front of Juliet as he sat down too. Juliet suppressed a sigh. She knew what was coming. You're working on a vaccine? Yes. Juliet rubbed her forehead, then winced, knowing she was smearing product all over her fingers. She should have snapped for him to mind his business, but she was bone-weary of this dance, this routine of dead ends and useless information. It hardly occurred to her that she needed to stop before she was saying, we have some papers that Paul left behind. This was exactly why Lord Montagoff had given Roma his task. To pick up all the information Juliet let slip. And what will you do, Roma asked, seeming not to notice as Juliet reached right into her drink and took out an ice cube, rubbing it along her fingers to clean the makeup off, when you recreate the vaccine. Juliet barked a harsh laugh. Suddenly she was glad for the darkness of the hall, each bulb of the chandeliers above twinkling dimly, not only to hide the mess she had made of her makeup, but the mania she was sure had entered her expression. If it were up to me, she said roughly, I'd send it through the whole city, put a protective casing on everyone so the blackmailer loses power. A knife materialized between her fingers, and she stabbed the blade into the table, crushing the ice cube into fractions. But my father may listen to Tyler instead. We may give it only to the Scarlets, then sell it to everyone else, and it will merely be a pity for those who cannot afford it. It is the smart option, after all. The profit making option. Roma said nothing. You don't have a lot of time left, Juliet went on, only because she knew she had his full attention now. You should begin a campaign to capture our information so that the white flowers distribute the vaccine into the market first. Juliet yanked the knife out of the table, and ice shards flew in all directions, scattering on the small wooden tabletop. It was always going to be hope that ruined her. Hope that she had presented a terrible thing to him on a platter, and he would not do it, hope that he might care enough to keep the information to himself. Why would he? He had no reason to care for her when she had given him so many reasons to hate her. And yet she was foolish enough to test him anyway. It's time, Roma finally said. Juliet looked at him quickly, but he had long moved past the topic at hand. We need to go to the facility in Kunchen. It may be our very blackmailer. Somehow, I doubt it, Juliet muttered. She put her knife away and stood, dropping into a mocking curtsy as if they were nothing more than dance partners taking leave for the night. I'll see you at the railway station tomorrow. Without waiting for further retort, Juliet grabbed her coat and exited the dance hall, plunging back out into the night. From the roof of Bailman, Marshall leaned into the cold breeze, letting his hair flutter with the wind. It was a precarious drop down to the pavement, one slip of his shoes and he'd plummet over the edge, falling along the straight wall of the dance hall with nothing to grab on his way down. Just at the thought, his grip tightened on the pole beside him, and he clung a little closer to the towered peak at the center of the building. Movement flashed below. The glimmering lights of Bailman reflected off the rain puddles that had collected on the streets earlier, spelling Paramount Ballroom backward in red and yellow. Marshall was hardly surprised when he watched Juliet storm out from the dance hall and stomp right into one of the puddles, as if ruining her shoes might improve her mood. I wonder what Roma did, Marshall said aloud. He got his answer, in a roundabout way, when Roma emerged from Bailman a minute later and stopped some distance into the road, ignoring the rickshaw runners calling for his business. Instead, he turned his head skyward and emitted one short yell. Marshall ducked out of view, just in case Roma caught sight of him, but he shouldn't have worried. In seconds, Roma had stormed off too, in the opposite direction of Juliet. Tragic, Marshall muttered into the wind. Montagovs were so dramatic. Yet he missed the dramatics, missed being right in the heart of the city, at the heart of the feud that kept it in halves. If Benedict were here, he would probably tell Marshall to stop being thick-head. There was nothing good about a feud. Nothing other than loss. But if nothing else, it was a singular purpose in a place that seemed to ask for too much. Another gust of wind blew hard into his face, and Marshall shrank back, searching for a better place to sit. He had come out tonight for a breath of fresh air, 
Only then he had sighted Roma and Juliet walking along Avenue Foch and wasted no time following on their tail. They hadn't noticed him trekking a few steps behind, nor when he hurried ahead to get onto the scaffolding at the back of Bailman when Roma and Juliet disappeared within. Marshall was almost surprised. He expected more from two heirs who could probably hit a fly with a needle if they threw hard enough. What have you two descended into? There was no reply to come, not unless the night itself had an answer. Marshall needed to stop speaking out loud, but it was the only thing keeping him less lonely. He missed conversation. He missed people. He missed Benedict. The wail of a siren swept the street some distance away, then the echo of what might have been a gunshot. Marshall pulled his legs up to his chest, resting his chin on his knees. When he first joined the White Flowers, he was just another scrappy kid picked off the streets, thin and hungry and constantly dirty. That was how Benedict found him that day. Curled up in the alley behind the Montagov house, legs pulled close, arms wrapped in a fetal position. He hadn't yet learned how to fight, how to smile so sharply that it would cut as fast as any blade. And when Benedict crouched in front of him, looking like a shining cherub with his pressed white shirt and curly combed hair, he didn't remark on any of that. All he did was extend a hand, asking, Do you have somewhere to go? I do have somewhere to go now, Marshall muttered. But it was better when you were there with me. A sudden rustle came from the other side of the rooftop, and Marshall jolted, startling out of his thoughts. He had gotten so caught up in his memories that he had tuned out the world around him. A mistake, one that he couldn't afford to make. This was scarlet territory. And indeed, a scarlet circled around the rooftop tower, coming into view. He froze as he looked up, cigarette dangling from his lips. Please don't recognize me, Marshall thought, his hands creeping for the pistol in his pocket. Please don't recognize me. Marshall Seo, the scarlet croaked. You're supposed to be dead. Aish. The scarlet threw his cigarette down, but Marshall had readied himself. There was only one way this could end. He drew the pistol from his pocket in one fast motion and fired, fast and first, because that was what mattered. At the end of the day, that was the only thing that mattered. The bullet landed true. With a harsh clatter, the scarlet's weapon fell to the floor. It might have been a gun. It might have been a dagger. It might even have been a throwing star, for all the consequence it held. But in the hazy dark, all Marshall cared about was it being out of reach, and then the scarlet collapsed too, a hand clasped over the hole studded into his breastbone. For a few tense seconds, Marshall heard labored breathing, the metallic smell of blood permeating the rooftop. Then, silence. Utter silence. Marshall kicked the edge of the rooftop skittering little stones down the side of Bailman. All this death on his hands. All this death, and in truth, none of it mattered to him so long as it protected him, protected the secrets of those he was hiding for. God damn it, he whispered, scrubbing his face and turning to the breeze, away from the smell. I hate this city. 14. Juliet peered at the train platform, eyeing the tracks below. When she felt a presence behind her, she didn't have to turn to know who it was. She recognized him by footfall, by that soft pitter-patter paired with a hard stop, like he had never in his life walked in the wrong direction. To the southwest, she said beneath her breath. White man with the tatty clothing and French novel tucked under his arm. He's been watching me for the past ten minutes. Out of her periphery, she watched Roma turning slowly, seeking the man in question. Perhaps he thinks you are pretty. Juliet clicked her tongue. He looks ready to kill me. Same concept, really, Roma stopped, blinking rapidly. He had sighted the man. He's a white flower. Surprised, Juliet shifted her eyes again, straining to get another look. The man had turned his attention to his novel now, so he did not notice. Are you certain? Juliet asked deflating from her confidence. She had hoped that maybe it was the blackmailer, finally showing up in the open now that Juliet and Roma were on their way toward the possible truth. 
it was too much to hope that someone would materialize like this just to stop them, but it certainly would have sped the investigation along. I thought he was French. Yes, he is French, Roma said. But loyal to us. I have seen him in the house before. I am certain of it. The man suddenly looked up again. Juliet swiveled her gaze away, pretending to be inspecting something else, but Roma did not do the same. He stared right back. If he is a white flower, Juliet said without moving her mouth, then why does he look rather murderous toward you, too? Roma pursed his lips and turned back around, facing the tracks just as their train pulled in. Fellow passengers hurried forward, scrambling to the front and pushing right to the edge of the platform so they could secure a good seat. Perhaps he thinks I am prettier, he replied easily. Do you wish to speak to him? With enough effort, the two of us could probably pin him down. Juliet considered it, then shook her head. Why waste their time with white flowers? They boarded, finding seats by the window. With a sigh, Juliet plopped into the hardback chair and undid her coat, dropping it onto the table between her seat and Roma's. By virtue of the train's setup, they were facing each other, and stacking more items onto the table was like she was building a makeshift wall. Sitting face to face felt too intimate, even while twenty odd other passengers occupied the compartment. To Kunchen, the compartment loudspeaker emitted in English. Welcome aboard. Roma dropped into his seat. He didn't shed the gray coat over his suit. What's the next language coming? French, Juliet replied immediately, a second before grainy Shanghainese blared over the loudspeaker. Her eyebrows lifted. Ha! Huh. Interesting. Roma leaned back, the smallest smile playing on his face. Ye of little faith. That barest glimpse of humor came and went in a flash, but it was enough to make Juliet go stock still her stomach clenching. For the smallest moment, Roma had likely forgotten. And when the train started to move, when Roma turned his gaze to the scene outside and the glass reflected back the sudden hardening of his expression, Juliet knew that he remembered again, who she was, who they were, what she had done, what they were now. The train rumbled on. Shanghai to Kunchen was not a long journey, and the window view quickly turned rural passing dilapidated houses on dirt roads. Swaths of grass stretched on beside the train tracks, flat and even an eternal, more natural green than Juliet had ever seen inside city limits, discounting what the foreigners cultivated in their parks. Juliet released a soft breath, leaning her cheek upon the window. Roma was doing the same, but she resolved not to look at him any longer than necessary, lest he catch her staring. Her head turned, finding entertainment in the compartment instead, eyeing the dozing passengers as the train continued chugging, chugging, chugging. When Roma broke the silence, enough time had passed that Juliet startled, doing so well at ignoring him that his voice was a shock. Assuming we do find the blackmailer, no prelude, no overture, merely jumping directly to the point, I gather we need a plan of attack. Juliet drummed her fingers on the table. Shoot to kill? Roma rolled his eyes. She was rather aggravated that he looked so beautiful in the midst of the action, the dark shadows of his eyelashes flickering up like a dusting of coal. And after, he asked. It is no different from when we thought we were chasing the larkspur. If we kill the blackmailer, how do we get to the monsters? It is different this time, Juliet countered. She felt a chill brush through the train car, running goose bumps up her arm. When she shivered, Roma's frown deepened, his gaze tracing along the dip of her neckline. It was hardly appropriate for winter, she knew. She didn't need his judgment. How so? Juliet reached for her coat. There was nothing that linked Paul Dexter to the communists because he met with Chiron once and then chanced the chaos on random transformations. This blackmailer, however, she stood up so she could swing her coat back on, the long fabric brushing the backs of her knees, I doubt is many steps removed from their monsters. Not when the monsters are being sent out like little servants doing the blackmailer's bidding. That requires personal instructions. Constant meetings. That sounds like a guess, Roma remarked. 
this entire mission is a guess, Juliet replied, popping her collar. I, she stopped, her eye catching down the aisle just as she was preparing to sit again. The French white flower was in this compartment too, sitting some rows away. And he looked in pain. Juliet? Roma prompted. He ducked his head out into the aisle, trying to spot what she was looking at. The hell is going on? The white flower grabbed the glass he had in front of him and threw the liquid in his own face. Fire! Juliet screamed suddenly. The man roared with pain as Juliet yanked Roma by the arm, ignoring his utter confusion while he searched for the non-existent fire. Others were not as doubting. They shot for the compartment door immediately and hurried into the next one over. This was the trouble with being at the tail of the train. There was only one direction to go. What the hell, Juliet? Roma asked again as she pushed him hard against the bottlenecking passengers, toward the door. What's? Juliet gasped, hearing a snap. By the windows, the tearing of clothes. In the next moment there was no man hunching over his seat but a monster, so tall that it crushed against the ceiling, chest heaving, nostrils flaring. Its green color seemed even more grotesque by the clear daylight, faintly transparent and revealing motion just beneath its skin, little black dots, rushing toward its spine. They were nearing the door, but half the compartment was still behind her. If she tried to usher everyone through, the insects would dive forward into the rest of the train, infecting every soul on board. But if she stopped it now, the insects tore outward from the monster with one colossal burst. So Juliet pushed Roma across the threshold and slammed the door closed between them. Roma whirled around with his breath caught in his throat, thudding his fists against the door. Was it a monster that had just come to life inside the compartment? Was it the white flower who had just transformed into the monster? Juliet, he roared. Juliet, what the hell? All the passengers in front of him had fled hurrying through the second sliding door that gave way into the next compartment. It was only Roma and Roma alone in this in-between passageway, where the flooring underneath him shifted at every turn and jolt of the train. He pushed at the door this way and that, bruising his knuckles in his effort to shift it, but something was holding it solidly closed, keeping it from budging even an inch. Juliet. His fist came down on the door with a shudder. Open this damn door. That was when the screaming started. Juliet wound the cord around the door handle and pulled it tight, holding the compartment closed. The second she had it secure, the insects started to rain down, skittering black legs upon every surface they could find, body or floor or wall. This wasn't the first time she had experienced such a sensation, yet all the same, it tossed at her stomach, nausea threatening at her throat. Crawling so much crawling. Through her hair, into her dress, along the crooks of her elbows, her knees, her fingers. All she could do was squeeze her eyes shut and count on the vaccine she had taken months ago. She didn't even know if it still worked, but there was nothing to do now, nothing except. With a gasp, Juliet brushed a clump off her neck, desperate to be rid of the feeling as soon as the falling stopped. She whirled around, her eyes flying open. There was no urge to claw at her throat, no urge to incite destruction. The vaccine had held true. As the people around her staggered to a seat or fell to their knees, Juliet remained steadfastly rooted on her feet, her hands braced to her sides. As the people around her hauled their nails up to their skin and started to dig, Juliet could only watch. Oh my God! The monster made a noise, an unearthly, carnal shriek. Immediately, Juliet surged forward, pushing past the victims undergoing the madness. She wanted to flinch and she wanted to hide, but there was no time for what she wanted, only for what she had to do. Don't close your eyes, Juliet commanded herself. Watch the carnage. Watch the destruction. Feel the slick of the blood as it paints the carpeting red, and remember what is at stake in this city, all because some foreign merchant wants to play greedy. Juliet pulled her gun, aiming and shooting the monster in the gut. The sound of gunshots echoed through the locked compartment. Roma took a horrified step back, 
so aghast at the noise that he couldn't find the energy to keep pushing at the door. In that moment, he didn't care anymore. The city faded, the blood feud faded, all his anger and rage and retribution crumbled to dust. All he could think about was Juliet, dying, she was dying, and he wouldn't allow it. Some removed part of him determined that it was his job to kill her, the part of him in the present simply couldn't bear it, not here, not now. Don't, he whispered, a tremor breaking his voice. Don't. The monster dove aside, hardly affected by her bullets. Its flailing limbs were slick with moisture, little beads of water that looked viscous to the touch. Juliet aimed again, but the sounds behind her, the pained, frightened groans of a victim's last gasp before death, distracted her more than she could bear, and when her bullet only hit the monster's shoulder, it took the chance to squeeze between two seats and dive right at a window, fracturing a web through the glass. It was trying to escape. Juliet reached for the knife at her thigh, intent on a throw. What creature could survive a blade through the eye? What creature, no matter how monstrous, could take its whole head carved open? But she wasn't fast enough. By the time she had struggled through the fallen bodies, the monster had dived against the window once more and shattered it entirely, blasting shards of glass across the compartment. Juliet gasped, throwing a hand over her face. Before she could fully recover, the monster had rolled right out, uncaring of the train's fast speed. No. Juliet exclaimed, spitting a curse. She rushed to the open window, watching the monster land upon the hills and phase back into a man, the transformation as casual as a coat being shed. In seconds he was out of view. The train flew by, leaving him in the countryside, all this blood on his hands and no one wiser to the his identity. Juliet stumbled away from the window, her legs close to giving out. She had believed it already, but seeing it with her own two eyes was another matter entirely. No longer was this Chi Ren and his ill-timed transformations, fighting against himself and leaving sketches of his other form in an effort to uncover what was happening to his body. No longer was this a sickness spread near the water, hitting the gangsters working at the bund at odd hours. These monsters were assassins. Assassins under someone's command, growing to beasts at will and fading back into men when purpose suited it. This situation was growing more and more dire by the minute. When the screaming stopped, Roma could hardly move. Every possibility flashed before his eyes, most of them with Juliet's body strewn in pieces on the train floor. If there was a higher power, Roma hoped they were listening. All they would hear was, please, please, please. Please be okay. The silence was cut through suddenly by the sound of glass shattering in the compartment. With a trembling breath, Roma surged forward again and pulled at the door as hard as he could. At last it slammed open. He smelled blood immediately. Then felt the wind, howling through a shattered window. The monster was nowhere in sight. But Juliet, there stood Juliet, like some avenging angel surveying her battlefield, the only figure who remained upright in a car full of fallen corpses, her cheek smeared with blood. She blinked, so slowly it looked as if she were waking up from a dream. When she started toward him and stumbled, Roma lunged out and caught her without thinking, holding her close for one beat, two beats, three. In that drawn-out moment, he pressed his cheek against the hard texture of her hair, against the soft skin of her neck. She exhaled, relaxing against him, and it was that which jolted Roma back to reality. Juliet was okay, so all his panic transformed into fury. Why did you do that? Roma demanded, jerking back. He shook her by the shoulders. Why would you do that? Bodies on the floor, throats clawed to shreds, red trails running from eye to ear. But Juliet. Juliet looked untouched. I took Paul's vaccine, she said shakily. I am immune. That was for the first monster, Roma snapped. These could have been different. The very thought that this had been a white flower hiding under their noses as a monster only heightened the heat in his chest. Had he known to stop the white flower earlier, none of this would have happened. Had he known any of this, 
he could have tortured something out of the man long ago, and the absurd blackmailing on their city would be over. I figured it would work the same. Juliet brushed his hands off her shoulders. And it did. It was a gamble. You gambled with your life. There was a visible twitch in Juliet's jaw, her pointed chin tipping up in aggravation. Roma knew he was being condescending, but he cared little when the air was still permeated with gore, violence soaking into their clothes, sticking to their skin. Noting the same fact, Juliet shoved Roma over the compartment threshold and slammed the sliding door closed again. It worked, she hissed. Now it was only the two of them occupying the in-between train space, one panel of hardwood keeping them separated from a room full of corpses. I saved the whole train from infection. No, Roma said. You decided to play hero and got lucky. Juliet threw her hands into the air, scoffing. A mark of blood yet remained on her cheek. She had another stain across her sleeve, and another down her leg. How is that a problem? It was. It was a problem, and Roma couldn't explain how. He wanted to pace, to move, to release this frantic, pent-up feeling roaring to a crescendo inside of him, but there was no space here, nothing except walls closing in on them and the unstable train rumbling beneath their feet. He couldn't think, couldn't function, could hardly comprehend this reaction that was happening inside of him. Your life, he seethed, is not a game of luck. Since when, Juliet spat, mimicking his emphasis, did you care about my life? Roma marched right toward her. Perhaps he had been intent on intimidation, but they were too similar in height, and where he meant to loom, he and Juliet only ended up standing nose to nose, glaring at one another so fiercely that the world could have gone up in smoke and neither would have noticed. I don't. He was trembling with his fury. I hate you. And when Juliet didn't recoil, Roma kissed her. He pressed her right into the door, both his hands coming up to grip her by the sides of her neck, getting as close as he dared to the fiery, candied scent of her skin. A barely stifled gasp parted Juliet's lips, and then she was kissing him back with the same red-hot vexation, as if it were only to get it out of her system, as if this were nothing. They were nothing. Roma jerked away like he had been burned, heaving for breath and coming to his senses. Juliet appeared equally dazed, but Roma didn't spare her a second glance before he turned on his heel and marched through the next sliding door, slamming it behind him. By God. What had he done? The rest of the train was humming away in complete normalcy. No one paid Roma any heed as he remained standing by the compartment entrance, his heart hammering in his ears and his pulse thrumming beneath the thin skin of his wrists. It wasn't until a man wandered up to him, intending to skirt past and get through the door, that Roma finally shook out of his stupor and held out his arm, warning, don't. Dead bodies everywhere. The man blinked, taken aback. Roma didn't stick around to offer an explanation, he pushed past rudely and forged ahead, entering into the next passageway. Only there, boxed in between two new compartments and removed from watchful eyes, did Roma finally shove a hand through his hair and breathe out a long sigh. What is wrong with me? he muttered. He wanted to scream in rage. He wanted to scream at Juliet until his lungs grew hoarse. Only he knew that if he screamed I hate you, what he really meant was I love you. I still love you so much that I hate you for it. The train rocked under his feet, finding smooth tracks. Its screeching noise became swallowed, and for a suspended moment, all that could be heard in that compartment space was Roma's heavy breathing. Then the tracks grew rough again, and the floors continued their dull screeching. 15. It was late afternoon by the time the train arrived in Kunchen and even later by the time Roma and Juliet finished speaking to the authorities, because what qualified for authorities here was no more than men in flimsy uniforms blanching at the sight of the bodies. What could have taken ten minutes instead took two hours of Juliet making threats and yelling, Do you know who I am? before they had the bodies removed and a completed list of victims. The bodies went to storage, and messengers were sent in cars to Shanghai, en route to notify both the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers what had happened. They sent men out along the tracks, too, 
traipsing through the hills to look for the escaped monster, but Juliet doubted they would find anything. Not with their level of incompetence. By the time she summoned Scarlets to drive out and search with them, she was sure the monster would be long gone. Outrageous, Juliet was still grumbling as she and Roma left the railway station. Utter outrage. It is expected, Roma replied evenly. I imagine they have never before encountered such mass casualties. Irked, Juliet swiveled her narrowed eyes at him but opted to remain quiet. They had not spoken about whatever it was that had happened between them on the train, and if that was the way Roma wanted to play it, then Juliet was happy to oblige. It seemed that they were to pretend it never happened, even if Juliet could hardly look in Roma's direction now without all the little hairs on her arms sticking up. She shouldn't have kissed him back. He hated her, but that didn't override their whole past, nor the instinctive tug that had always drawn them into collision with each other like meteors in orbit. Juliet knew what was going on in his head because it was exactly what she had been circling around some few months ago, so why had she become so thoughtless as to give in? Even if he didn't hate her as deeply as he said he did, it was all the more dangerous. The whole point of lying to him was to keep him away. The whole point was that they couldn't do this again, because the moment he saw through her, then their city of blood would catch up to them, and perhaps they could be together at last if it was together in death. And what was love if all it did was kill? A car? With a start, Juliet realized she hadn't been listening, and only now registered Roma's suggestion, glancing upon the road. After handling the bodies, they had asked an officer for the directions to their destination and the route was a simple, albeit hefty walk Kunchen itself was classified a city, but it was a far cry from Shanghai. Rather than a living, breathing entity that turned inside out upon itself in an effort to find space, Kunchen was a small lasso on a map, a grouping of ten or so quiet towns that sat side by side with little activity past its day-to-day -day humdrum energy. This place was easy to navigate because it was quiet and still, but that also meant it was impossible to hide within, should they pick up a tail. No, we can't take a car, Juliet replied. She peered over her shoulder, eyeing the few officers that remained standing by the railway station, deep in conversation. The blackmailer is on to us. We would be too easy to follow. Roma looked back too, frowning when he saw that Juliet was still watching Kunchen's useless administrative officers. Them? Obviously not. Juliet hurried along. At this rate, the sun would have set by the time they reached the address. The cold was biting enough already, but once night fell, it would be almost unbearable to stand outside, especially when Juliet's thick coat was a tad more fashionable than it was practical. However, I thought about it, she continued. That man was sent after us in the train car, but he took his damn time transforming. Paul Dexter is the one who vaccinated me, so I cannot imagine that his collaborator does not know I am immune. They weren't trying to kill us. They were trying to scare us, collateral damage be damned. A bell rang somewhere in the distance. Its echoes bounced down the flat row of buildings erected stoutly on the other side of the road. As Roma and Juliet walked along the footpath, a thin river flowed gently on their left, lapping into the fading evening. Sometimes Juliet forgot that this was how the rest of the country lived. The farther one receded from the coastal cities, they also receded from coastal control, from power-hungry nationalists and invading foreigners. They receded away from places where every move felt like life and death, and instead. The river trickled into a wider stream. When a small bird came to perch upon a rock jutting from the riverbed, it barely disturbed the flow of the water. Instead, they had the space to breathe. Believe it or not, Roma said now. This monster attack was a good thing. Juliet pulled her attention away from the water, searching for the next street sign. The last thing they needed was to get lost. I do beg your pardon. The bodies on their way to the morgue would argue otherwise. Heaven rest their souls, obviously I do not wish for more death. Roma's words were edged with a bite. When we return to Shanghai, I can root through every white flower within our ranks until I find exactly who that Frenchman was. 
and if our trip here does not prove useful, then finding whoever that monster was may be the fastest way to trace back to the blackmailer. Juliet didn't see a point in arguing. Nothing was stopping Roma from refusing to share the information with her if their next course of action was solely down to him, but if she got heated about it, then he got heated back, and they would start screaming at each other again because it was too easy to lean into anger just for a split second of truth. For a sign that Juliet wasn't entirely lost to him, Roma would pick a fight. In a moment of weakness to glimpse the Roma she loved, Juliet would entertain it. It was a volatile game. She needed to stop. She couldn't keep doing this. If she had to turn cold, then so be it. So all Juliet said aloud was I hope this trip proves useful, then. She gestured for them to move along, glancing once more over her shoulder. I suspect we are here, Roma said. He stopped, looking at the side ahead with an undisguised puzzlement stamped into his expression. Juliet, too, searched along the row of shops, thinking that they were misunderstanding something. They were not. The address for the alleged vaccine center was a wanton shop. They advertised this place across the whole French concession, Juliet exclaimed. She couldn't hold back the accusatory tone in her voice, though she was not quite sure whom she was putting at blame here. It cannot possibly be a scheme just to have more customers for a bowl of hunt and tang. Roma suddenly pulled two revolvers from the inside of his suit jacket, one tucked on each side. Juliet blinked at his fast handiwork and absently wondered how she had not felt them when she was pressed up against him earlier. It cannot be a mere shop, he said. Let's go, Juliet. By the time Juliet retrieved her pistol, Roma had already charged ahead and kicked in the shop door. Juliet hurried after him feeling rather foolish to be storming into a wanton shop of all places, and found Roma by the register, demanding an audience with whoever had the nerve to be distributing a new vaccine. In the far corner, there was one elderly couple in the shop, eyes wide and concerned. Please, please, the man behind the register shrieked, immediately putting his hands up. He was old too, but at the end of middle age, hair long and pulled back with a band. Don't shoot. I am not who you are looking for. Juliet tucked her pistol away, making eye contact with the elderly couple and jabbing a sharp thumb toward the door. Not needing to be prompted twice, they hobbled to their feet and gathered their bags, scuttling out of the shop. The door slammed after them so quickly that the ceiling light flickered. Then who is? Roma asked. Who owns this place? The man's throat bobbed up and down as he swallowed nervously. I, I do. While Roma kept his weapons upon the shop owner, Juliet leaned onto the register and peered around the back of the shop. A cursory sweep revealed a table dusted with flour, a lump of dough hardening by the sink, and there, by the chair. Well, I see that the flyers originated from here, so no use lying your way out, Juliet said cheerily. Lautu. How are you making the vaccine? The man blinked, his clear terror suddenly morphing into confusion. Making the vaccine, he echoed. I, his head pivoted back to Roma, eyes crossing to stare down the barrel of the revolver. No. I am not making anything. I am auctioning off the last vial that remains from the Larkspur of Shanghai. Juliet pushed off the register. She exchanged a fast glance with Roma and then, caring little for social propriety, she climbed right up on the counter in her heels and hopped into the back of the shop, retrieving one of the flyers. It was identical to the one that Ernestine de Donadou had given them, down to the error-riddled French. Only this time, Juliet realized exactly what mistake they had made. The madness arrives again. Get vaccinated. Where did it say that the location upon the advertisement would be giving out vaccinations? They had merely assumed, because that was what the Larkspur's flyers had said. Tamada, Juliet cursed, throwing the flyer down. You have one? The man nodded eagerly, seeing it was this information getting the two gangsters off his back. I was hoping to collect offers from foreigners, then sell to the highest bidder. I am low on cash, you see. It is not easy running a hunt and shop in Kunchen, 
and when my cousin from Shanghai passed along this vial he had held on to. Oh, stop talking, I do beg, Juliet interrupted, holding a hand up. This was not a vaccine center at all. This was an auction. With a sigh, Roma withdrew his revolvers, shoving them back into his jacket. He was visibly annoyed. This had been a waste of time. What could they do with one vial? They had already asked Lawrence at the White Flower Labs to test the vaccine the last time around in an effort to recreate it, but he had not been successful. Juliet's eyes widened suddenly. Lawrence had failed in the past, but the Scarlets had Paul's papers now. I'll take it, Juliet said, her declaration coming so loud and so abrupt that the man jumped. In a smooth motion, Juliet bent and swept up the flyer, then plucked a fountain pen from the side of the register, scribbling down a number. My offer. The man peered at the sum, his jaw dropping immediately. I, I cannot simply agree. I must send telegrams in case there are higher bidders. Double it, Roma cut in. When Juliet's gaze shot to him sharply, he smiled, the expression mocking. We will share, won't we, Miss Kai? What do you think you're doing? Juliet demanded in Russian. She pasted on her own smile, so that the shop owner would not realize they had switched to a different language to argue. They didn't need the shop owner deciding his vaccine was in high demand. You already ran tests, remember? Lawrence couldn't re-engineer it, he could only determine that it was true. Yes, Roma agreed. That time we did not have materials from Paul Dexter. Remember, we can still steal them from you. And if you want this vial that badly, I am sure you think having it will cause a breakthrough alongside the papers. Juliet almost started vibrating with her new irritation. He had read her through and through. He always did. If Shaya and Xiaojia each want their own, the man supplied, hands ringing in front of him. There was a new nervousness in his air. He had figured it out, then. Connected the dots on Juliet's and Roma's identities, for as soon as Roma had called her Miss Kai, it was not hard to see that the heirs of the Shanghai native Scarlet Gang and Russian White Flowers stood before him. There were two in circulation after the Larkspur went under. He reached for another slip of paper, and with the same fountain pen Juliet had been using, quickly began scribbling. The second is in Zhou Zhuang, so this is the seller and address. Forget it, Juliet said. We only need one, so don't think you can siphon double the money from us. Take it or leave it. The shop owner paused. Juliet could imagine the cogs turning in his head, calculating the chances that there could be a higher bidder, and the risks he would invite if he turned down Shanghai's gangsters. Without a word, the man dropped into a crouch and started to enter a combination into a safe under the register, one that Juliet had not even noticed. She frowned, and he seemed to sense it, because as he twirled the combination dial, he said, People get desperate, and I cannot afford guards. The safe hissed open. The man reached in, and out came the vial, glistening the same lapis lazuli blue that Juliet remembered. She shuddered. I don't suppose you have cash on you, do you? We'll sign IOUs, Roma replied without missing a beat. The shop owner knew who they were, after all. He knew they were big and mighty enough to keep their word, the Scarlet Gang and the White Flowers had the money. All they had was money, really. Well, thank you for your business, the shop owner said gleefully, watching Roma and Juliet scrawl their names on the same sheet Juliet had scribbled her offer on. He was right to be gleeful, he had just become very, very rich. The two gangs would feel the effect of this payment, but it was nothing they couldn't recover from. The Scarlets had recovered time and time again after paying the blackmailer. I will be holding on to this, Juliet said, gesturing for the vial and shooting Roma a warning glance. Roma did not complain. He let the shop owner press the vial into Juliet's hands, and while her palm was out, the man tucked in the slip of paper with the address of the second seller. You should take this anyway. Juliet shoved both into her pocket. Roma only watched the motion warily, his eyes glowering black, like he suspected she would perform a magic trick to make the vial disappear. 
she wouldn't be surprised if he tried to make a grab for it at some point on their way back into the city. Don't even think about it, she mouthed. Wouldn't imagine it, he mouthed back. So, the man said into the silence that had fallen. Would you too like a bowl of wontons? 16. The last train back to Shanghai had been cancelled. What do you mean it's been cancelled? Roma and Juliet jolted and glanced at each other, disturbed by the unison in which they had spoken. The worker behind the ticket booth didn't notice. She was more occupied by the book open on her lap. It has been cancelled, she repeated. The train scheduled to arrive at nine o'clock was operating earlier and encountered some trouble. It has been rerouted for maintenance. Juliet pinched the bridge of her nose. That was the very same train that had brought them here then, the one with the last compartment soaked in blood from a monster attack. Maintenance. She hoped they had some heavy-duty bleach. Don't tell me, Juliet managed tightly, her breath fogging the air around her, we just missed the previous one? The worker peered at the timetable board. Juliet could have sworn she was holding back an amused grin. Rural dwellers were without doubt sadistic when it came to the misfortunes of city folk. By ten minutes, Xiao Jia, she confirmed. Next one is tomorrow morning. Juliet made a noise at the back of her throat and paced away from the booth, stomping along the platform. All the local cars have stopped for the night, Roma said, following after her, but we can call one from Shanghai. By car, the two cities are almost four hours apart one way, Juliet replied. She stopped, observing the empty station. It would be morning before we return if we call a chauffeur. We may as well remain here until the train comes. At least it is relatively warm. Roma stopped too, pensive as he turned to face her. His mouth hovered open to speak. Only then his eyes widened at something over her shoulder, his whole expression turning stricken. Get down. Juliet hardly had a moment to register his command before he had grabbed her arms and yanked her to the ground. Her breath snagged in her throat, her knees scraping hard against the platform. With his hands circling her wrists and her gloved fingers curled up against the edge of his sleeves, the thought that it would be so easy to draw him close whispered through her mind, but that was all, a whisper. Easily quieted, easily snuffed out. Before she could do or say anything preposterous, Juliet shook out of Roma's grip and turned around, trying to catch whatever it was that had incited such a reaction. What gives, she demanded. Roma's eyes remained narrowed, searching the dark. A shooter, he said simply. A shooter who decided not to shoot, it appears. Juliet saw nothing, but Roma had no reason to lie. There had been a strange, watchful feeling following her all afternoon, and she had thought it to be discomfort, that prickle up and down her spine only natural in a place so quiet. But maybe it had not been in her head. Maybe as she had suspected earlier, someone had been on their tail since they disembarked the train. Come on, Juliet said, getting to her feet. We cannot stay, then. Not in the open. Where else is there to go? Roma hissed. After a delayed beat, he hurried up too, brushing the dust off his trousers before it could stain. Do you know how early people go to sleep around these parts? Juliet shrugged, forging ahead. We are charming people. We can charm some doors open, I am sure. But as it turned out, Roma was right. They trekked to the nearest residential block of Kunchen and started to knock on doors, making their way down the narrow streets. By the time they had twisted around and along each building, smacking their palms against every front gate, there was still no answer from anyone. And it was miserably cold. And Juliet was getting a prickly feeling again. She palmed a knife, stopping at the end of the road. When Roma finally trudged over after giving up on the final building, she held out her hand, asking for him to stop too. It's freezing, Juliet, he managed, teeth chattering. This was not a good idea. It is still better than the station, she whispered. They were surrounded by darkness, for street lamps in a city like this were few and far between. Perhaps that was why nobody came out so late, 
because they had nothing to guide their way save the sliver of the moon peeking through the thick clouds. It was hard to see what was lurking out there. We're being followed, Juliet stated. Roma pulled out one of his revolvers. It almost looked comical, him, aiming at nothing. Shall I fire? he asked. Don't be ridiculous, she said, pushing his arms down. Her eyes snagged on a blip of light in the distance. Look, someone is awake over there. Juliet started off immediately, the knife still clutched in her hand in case anyone was to jump out from the darkness. She didn't understand how they could possibly have a pursuer, though her certainty was growing stronger and stronger. All around them, there was nowhere to hide, the residential street stretched on with another thin stream flowing on one side and a dense cloister of bamboo forestry on the other. Do you think, Roma said, catching up with her, that perhaps ghosts are real? Juliet shot him an incredulous look. Don't be ridiculous. Why, he demanded. Once, we didn't think monsters were real either. He had her there, but still, Juliet rolled her eyes and slid her knife into her sleeve at last coming in view of the illuminated building. She made a tense inventory of the nearby darkness, and when it seemed there was no movement, she hurried up the steps to knock. Juliet's hand came down once, then froze, hovering an inch away from the folding doors. Its frames were paneled with fabric, the style of buildings from the imperial dynasties. Above the doors, there was an engraving of three characters, usual for places of business to declare their function. Now, with the light beaming out from the doors, Juliet could read it. Juliet, Roma said, coming to the same conclusion. An unbidden snort escaped her. It's a whorehouse. She hadn't said it with derision, it was truly the term most suitable. The door swept open, and a woman peered out, her robes flowing for what seemed like miles behind her. This was not like the brothels of Shanghai not a little back area in someone's fabric shop or the top half of a restaurant. This was a magnificent structure going up at least three floors, varnished wood banisters looping in circles around each level and a fountain pumping at the very center, wafting with the sweetest floral scents. Hello, the woman said, tilting her head. I've never seen you before. Oh, Juliet said. We're, uh, she cast a glance back at Roma. He pulled an anxious expression, beseeching Juliet to handle this. We're not customers. We're stranded overnight and we're hoping for a place to stay. At this, Roma finally cleared his throat. We have cash to pay, of course. The woman observed them for a moment longer. Then she swept her arms up, the sleeves of her hanfu billowing with the wind. Come in, come in. We welcome all wayward travelers, of course. Roma and Juliet didn't have to be encouraged further, they darted out of the cold and entered, sparing the night a warning glance in case it was watching. Roma shut the door firmly, and Juliet nodded, signaling to him that they were safe now, out of the watchful eyes of whoever, whatever, had been on their tail. If you'll follow me, children. The woman was already walking off, her steps light. There was a dance to the way she moved, exchanging entertainment for attention making every second captured upon her worthwhile. Thank you, Juliet called after her. How do you prefer to be called? There was a sudden burst of giggling from the far corner, and Juliet's eyes landed on a kaleidoscope of colors, of flying silk and lace fans, held by delicate figures dressed in various shades of high-end chipao. They almost sounded happy. Call me Miss Tang, the woman said over her shoulder. She pointed at the staircase. Shall I put you up high? Juliet lifted her head and examined the higher floors, eyeing the men leaning over the banisters, girls on every side of them. Their slouches were casual, looking down and watching the rest of the house as if there were no hurry to their night. She knew that appearances were deceiving. She knew that every place had its dark side, that perhaps these girls were merely better at hiding their bitterness. The girls of Shanghai did their jobs like their life had already been sucked out of them. But the glamour here was seductive, and nothing was more surprising than making the find in a city not renowned at all for it, not like Shanghai was. Beauty here was an art, something to perfect, 
and wield, and make a performance out of. In Shanghai, beauty was a transaction for one end or another. Whatever you have free, she sighed in reply. We really don't mind. Ah. Juliet whirled around, hearing Roma's yelp. She hadn't noticed that he wasn't beside her anymore. Nor had she noted when exactly he had fallen out of step. Her pulse ratcheted up, fingers immediately twitching for the blade still hidden by her wrist. Then she caught sight of him and realized there was no need to reveal the weapons under her coat. Roma had merely been snagged off by three of the girls. He was struggling to get freed, by the looks of it, because both his arms were caught and the girls were not going to release their catch so easily, already pleading for an audience. Juliet bit down on her cheeks. No, no, it's okay, Roma insisted. We're only here for lodgings, really. Unable to suppress it any longer, Juliet snickered a laugh. Roma's head whipped up, as if the sound had reminded him that Juliet stood three feet away. Only instead of calling for help, he exclaimed, Laupa. The girl startled, releasing him for a short moment. Juliet wasn't laughing anymore. Her eyebrows shot straight up. Who the hell is he calling his wife? Roma quickly pulled free, hurrying to Juliet's side. I'm so sorry, he called back. His arm came around Juliet's waist, and when Juliet jumped, immediately trying to dart away, he preempted the direction she tried to pivot in and tightened his grip. My marriage vows forbid such mischief. Maybe in another lifetime. Please forgive me, Juliet muttered under her breath. She could feel the press of his fingers through her coat. She could feel the tension in his arms, the way he was trying to stop himself from settling into the usual hold they had perfected five years ago. Don't lean in. Whatever you do, don't lean in. I don't even remember when we exchanged our vows. Play along, Roma said through gritted teeth. I fear they would kill me in my sleep without a better excuse. This is in Shanghai, Chineide. They will kill you with their kindness, not their blades. Speak less, Dorigea. Juliet shot a sharp look at him, then wondered if she could get away with holding a blade in her hand and tripping to slice his beautiful face, just a little, a red nick here and there. She had used a term of endearment sarcastically, but she still bristled to have him do the same. Before she could grab her knife, however, Miss Tang was gesturing ahead to follow her up a winding staircase, onto the second floor. Ah, young love, Miss Tang said when they caught up with her at the top of the staircase. She sighed, splaying her arms against the banister theatrically. I have almost forgotten what it is like. Torture, Juliet replied silently. They started to walk along the second floor. Everything hurts, and I'm certain that I am soon to collapse into agony and dust. Same room or separate? Miss Tang asked, interrupting Juliet's reverie. Separate, Juliet snapped, so fast that Miss Tang jumped, peering over her shoulder with wide eyes. Juliet offered an appeasing smile. My, she turned to Roma, just daring him to refute her, husband snores extremely loudly. Miss Tang clucked under her breath. When she came to a stop near the rooms, it was hard to tell where exactly the doors were, given they opened and closed by a folding mechanism, hinges blending into the wall like merely another part of its elaborate decoration. But Miss Tang, all the while lecturing Juliet on putting up with a husband's flaws, pushed easily, and doors opened in on two rooms, side by side. Juliet hardly heard a word, her eyes were quick at work, searching the interior of the rooms. They looked safe enough. No chance of a waiting attacker inside ready for ambush. You're absolutely correct, Miss Tang, Juliet said, lying so easily she hardly registered her own words. I'll start working on my behavior once we're back in the city. That seemed to appease the madam. She nodded, appraising Juliet up and down. Washroom is over there, on the far side of the building. Rest well. The moment Miss Tang sashayed off, Roma released Juliet like he had been prodded with an electric shock, down to the sudden flex and clench of his fists. Well, Juliet said. Good night. Roma stomped into his room without a word, 
pulling his door shut. There was another low giggle nearby, and though Juliet knew they were too far away to be giggling at her, her hackles still rose, never fond of any chance of mockery. What are you getting mad at me for, she muttered, stepping into her room too. You are the one who married us off. The burlesque club was quieter than usual tonight, so when Kathleen pulled an apron on, she figured it would be a way to kill time rather than any real work. She hadn't shown up to waitress in so long that she didn't even know who was managing the club anymore, given how quickly they were switched out depending on Scarlet inner circle ongoings. Table at the back is free, one of the other girls, Amy, shouted from the bar. Someone go wipe, she blinked, citing Kathleen. Miss Lang, what are you doing here? Kathleen rolled her eyes, adjusting her sleeves. She had changed from a cheap pow into a button shirt. She was attending another party meeting immediately after this and she needed to look the part, and if she picked up a few stains from whitressing away the few hours beforehand, then so much the better. I know everyone forgot, Kathleen answered, but I do work here. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. Amy wrung her rag cloth, then pushed a tray of freshly washed cups down the bar where Eileen was drying. Miss Rosalind said she was off to eat dinner with you. She left almost an hour ago. Kathleen froze. A serving boy brushed by, almost colliding with the elbow she had jutting out. Had she forgotten her plans? Had Rosalind asked to meet? Almost frantically, Kathleen searched through her memory, but all she could conclude was that Rosalind certainly had not made plans to eat with Kathleen, and it was unlikely that the barkeeping girls had misheard for someone else instead, because the only other possible contender was Juliet, and Juliet was out of the city. I think she might have misremembered, Kathleen said. Eileen didn't pick up on Kathleen's confusion. She grinned, making fast work of wiping the glass in her hands. Or maybe she's off to see her foreigner. Her what? Kathleen felt like she had stepped into a film without watching the first half. Amy hushed Eileen immediately, but her mouth had a quirk to it, as if the thought itself was amusing. Chen Ailing, don't spread rumors. About a foreigner? Kathleen asked, finally recovering from her shock. What are you talking about? Eileen and Amy exchanged a glance. One of their expressions said now look what you did. The other said, how does she not already know? Lang Shalin has been sided with a man who might be a lover, Amy reported, entirely matter of fact. Only rumors, of course. No one's gotten a good look at his face. They can't even decide if he is a merchant or the son of a governor. If you listen to the messengers running it, the same ones would say that Miss Kai was seen embracing Roma Montagov. Which was true. Kathleen didn't let her expression show her continued bewilderment. She merely quirked an eyebrow and turned away, making for the table at the back to begin clearing it. She hardly paid attention to the plates as she stacked them onto her arm, laying them one atop the other until she was balancing them all upon her wrist. Of late, this would be fully in line with Rosalind's peculiar behavior. And Kathleen could not fathom it, could not pinpoint when her sister had changed. For the longest time, it had been Kathleen and Rosalind against the world. Their antics together constituted some of Kathleen's earliest memories, as toddlers climbing the mansion gates when Juliet's nurse was not watching, as children trying to hide the bump on Rosalind's head after they failed to slide down the staircase railing, as just the two of them, playing pretend with dried leaves because there was nothing better to use. The Langs had been triplets, but hardly anyone would have known by watching the three of them interact. Even after they were sent to Paris, the dynamic remained the same. Their third sister was an empty seat at the dining table because she was in bed again fighting a cold while Rosalind and Kathleen whispered secrets beneath their napkins, giggling if the tutors asked them to eat properly. Their third sister was the empty middle seat, absent at all the events Rosalind and Kathleen crashed leaning on each other in the back of the car and laughing louder if the chauffeur glanced back in concern. And now and now Kathleen had known nothing of these rumors, though they had once shared their every secret. Of course, it was possible that there was no lover at all, merely another merchant Rosalind was accommodating for their father. 
Yet Kathleen still felt a suspicious chill sweep up her spine as she entered the kitchen, dumping the plates in the sink for the kitchen hands to deal with. Had they grown apart? Had Kathleen become too much of a stranger for her sister? What are you up to, Rosalind, she muttered. What aren't you telling me? The kitchen door slammed. Serving boys moved in and out, bustling around her as they got to work. Kathleen stayed near the tables, wiping her hands on a washcloth. Rosalind had always trusted Celia. Maybe that was the problem here. Maybe Celia was fading, forgotten under the layers of Kathleen that she had taken on. Kathleen shook her head, picking up a clean stack of trays and hurrying back into the club. 17. The room was too cold, and Roma couldn't sleep. With a huff, he turned in his blankets again, eyes opening begrudgingly. The window above him had the slightest crack, and though he had tried his best to patch it up, cold air blew in relentlessly. Once or twice, he almost thought he heard creaking, like the window was being lifted, but each time he jerked his head up and squinted into the dimness, he found only stillness, nothing but the wind trying to get in. Roma turned again and unwittingly thumped his elbow hard on the wall. He winced. A second later, there came a responding thump. Juliet. He was going to lose his damn mind, and it would be entirely Juliet Kai's fault. Their beds were side by side, which he knew because the walls were so thin that any time Juliet moved, so too did his bed frame. Every little sound she made was audible, each low, long sigh that Juliet released because she likely could not sleep either, not in a place so strange and foreign, swathed by the scent of perfume. Roma pulled the blankets up, all the way up, over his head in hopes that it would muffle the sounds. Sleep, he commanded himself. Go to sleep. But all the same, his mind continued running on a loop, relentless between only two thoughts, it is so goddamn cold, and then, why did she kiss me back? Roma smacked the blankets off in frustration. He hadn't been thinking. He was in over his head working in such close proximity to her, forgetting constantly that she was a liar, that she had bided her time pretending to love him again just to betray him. He was a fool. What was her excuse? Roma shifted to face the wall. Perhaps with enough effort, he could peer right through and see Juliet there, lying next to him. Perhaps with enough effort, he could understand the girl he had been working with these past few weeks, who had killed the people he loved without remorse, yet looked at him like they were still kids playing with marbles on the bund. She had pushed him through the compartment door. Roma couldn't rationalize that, no matter how hard he tried. And despite the bravado that Juliet had put on, Roma had seen the horror in her eyes when she stumbled forward into his arms. She hadn't known that she was completely immune. It had been a wager, and if it hadn't worked, she would have spent precious seconds that she could have used saving herself to push him out instead. Whatever was going on with Juliet, it couldn't have all been a lie. Whether it was that she turned cold in New York or she turned cold at some point in their time hunting the Larkspur, someone who had been pretending from the very beginning wouldn't have reacted that way on the train, wouldn't have protected him without a second thought, wouldn't have kissed him with the same longing that still stung his lips. Something had been real in their past, before she chose her side. Something within her still reached for him, even if it wasn't with her whole heart, even if it was an instinct more than a choice. Can you have a girl without the heart? Roma blew a puff of air onto his cold hands, scrunching them up against his neck. She cared for him. He could see that now. So, what then? Would he have her even with hatred running through her veins, even if she would betray him when the Scarlets asked? Just to have her near, might he pretend that she wouldn't keep cutting down the people he loved simply because he loved her most? Roma cursed out loud, horrified by where his thoughts were going. This wasn't him. This was weakness. Even if they were inexplicably bound to each other, he didn't want the girl without the heart. He didn't want Juliet without the love, love that wouldn't cut. Love that wouldn't destroy. But in a city like theirs, that was impossible. His touch feather soft, Roma set his palm on the wall, pretending it was Juliet instead. On the other side, in the other room, 
Juliet felt her bed frame shift. She opened her eyes into the silver moonlight, streaming through the windows, tracing the glow that ran along the wall. For whatever reason, weary with the day, her hand extended out of its own volition, pressing a gentle palm to the wall. She felt something thrum beneath her skin, some feeling of calm, like the whole wide ocean coming to a stop underneath her prayer. In another world, she could reach for Roma instead, but here, and now, there was only a barrier, cutting between them without mercy. Like twin statues reaching for each other, they both fell asleep at last. Juliet dreamed of burning roses and lilies wilting at the stem. She was dreaming of so much at once that she felt like she was drowning in it, drowning in the fragrance of a thousand gardens and unable to surface. Until she did. Juliet stirred awake, although her eyes stayed closed. For a long second, she wasn't sure why she had awoken, and yet she had. For a long second, she did not know why she remained still, and then she did. Juliet bolted upright. There was a dark figure at the foot of her bed, rummaging through her coat. The window was wide open, the white satin curtain blowing like a second phantom. Juliet pulled the knife from under her pillow and threw it. The mysterious intruder immediately grunted. He was masked, clothed in black from head to toe, but her blade had embedded into the side of his arm, a shining thing that reflected the light as the intruder jerked around, trying to pull it out. By then Juliet was already up, launching herself on the intruder and throwing him to the floor. She rammed her elbow into his neck, keeping him down. Who the hell are you? she demanded. The intruder bucked and kicked her off. He wasn't bothering with the knife in his arm anymore. He was trying to get out. Juliet's head slammed hard into the bed frame, colliding with such intensity that she was immediately seeing double. Though she recovered fast, pushing herself onto her stomach with a livid cough, the intruder was already up. There was something in his hands. Something blue. The vaccine. The intruder ran out. No. Juliet yelled. No, goddammit. She staggered to her feet, then shoved on her shoes. She pulled her coat around her shoulders so roughly that her weapons almost fell out, but with one hand digging around for her pistol, she kicked open her door and slapped a hand repeatedly on the one next door. The intruder was already out of sight. Downstairs, though the floor was dark and the fountain was switched off, the front door was wide, wide open. Roma. Juliet hissed. Roma, get outside now. She took off running. The good thing about having no pajamas to change into was that she was dressed already, her coat billowing after her like a cape in the wind. She charged into the night, searching the streets. There. Juliet. Her head whipped back. Roma was coming toward her, his hair disheveled, but otherwise fully dressed too. What's going on? Go the other way, circle around the forest patch, Juliet snapped, pointing down the street, where it led into a dense cluster of trees. He took the vial. Find him. Pulling the safety on her pistol, Juliet sprinted directly into the trees. She twisted in and out of the thin bamboo trunks, shoes coming down on the dead leaves underfoot, and spotted a flash of movement, a blur of the intruder swerving sharply left. She didn't hesitate. She aimed and shot, but he ducked, and the bullet missed. Again and again, Juliet shot into the night, sending her bullets upon the briefest flash of movement, but then the intruder dove into a particularly dense grouping of bamboo, and by the time Juliet was there too, she had lost sight of him. Tamada, she spat kicking a bamboo stalk. She should have known better, outside the safety of her house, without her usual retinue of scarlet guards, she should have slept with one eye open, or at least with all her valuables clutched close to her chest. She had known there was someone after them, someone on their tail. But how was she to know that some masked man would climb in through the damn second-story window? And why take the vaccine? Why not just kill her? Juliet smacked the bamboo again. It didn't make her feel any better. It just made her hand throb. She couldn't tell her father about this. He would use it as another reason why Juliet needed backup, 
needed a group of men watching her surroundings for her, as if they wouldn't have been just as useless in this situation, stationed outside her room. As if they wouldn't have just gotten in her way. Do better. Juliet's fist closed hard. Never mind her father. If she wanted to prove to herself that she didn't need any damn help, she had to stop letting her guard down. She was the heir of the Scarlet Gang. How was she to hold on to an empire when she couldn't hold on to the belongings in her pocket? Footfalls suddenly sounded off to the side, and Juliet whirled to attention, pointing her pistol. The crunching leaves came to a stop. Juliet relaxed and put her pistol away. Did you see him? Not a flicker, Roma replied, approaching cautiously. We lost the vaccine? Yeah, Juliet grumbled. And my knife. That's what you're worried about? Roma folded his arms. His gaze was pinned on her, and Juliet suddenly resisted the urge to wipe at her face. It was bare, her cosmetics removed before she slept. Convenient, isn't it? Roma said. The vaccine we both acquired that you insisted on safekeeping has gone missing to a mysterious bump in the night. Juliet's eyes widened. You think I orchestrated this? she demanded. Does this look, she whirled around to show him the back of her neck, a hand sweeping her loose hair up, like something I would orchestrate? She felt the winter wind sting her bare skin, prickling against the wet blood that slowly trickled down the base of her skull. Roma gave a sharp intake of breath. Before Juliet could stop him, he had reached out and brushed a gentle finger near the wound. Sorry, he whispered. That was unfair. Juliet released her hair, stepping away. She thinned her lips, the wound at her neck pulsating with a relentless sensation now that she had focused on it. The bed frame had been as hard as rock. She was lucky it had only sliced a surface wound and not cracked her skull right open. It's fine, she grumbled, sticking her cold hands into her pockets. It's not as if Juliet stopped, her hand coming upon a crinkle of paper. With a gasp, she yanked it out, drawing Roma's concern again until he registered what she had retrieved. The second vial, he said. Juliet nodded. Since we're already in the vicinity, how do you feel about a small trip tomorrow morning before we return? 18. For the right amount of money, Miss Tang was more than happy to provide Roma and Juliet with a car, putting one of her men in the driver's seat and instructing him to drive smoothly. Zhou Zhuang was, by all technicalities, a town within Kunchen, but it lay much farther south, practically on the same latitudinal line as Shanghai. Still, it was a simple car ride in and out, and then they could catch the next train out of Kunchen's city central. In and out, Juliet muttered to herself, watching their misty gray surroundings blur together through the window. No more getting jumped by mysterious figures in the dark no more getting distracted by white flowers, pretending to be her husband. In and out. Are you talking to me? Juliet jumped, her head, still throbbing from the night before, almost colliding with the low ceiling of the car. Said white flower was staring at her in concern, leaning against the window on his side. No, Juliet replied. You were muttering something. Juliet cleared her throat, but she was saved from answering further when the car started to slow, pulling into a cleared patch of hard dirt. Ahead, a canal was running quietly into the morning, its waters glistening despite the light spattering of clouds. They had already ventured so far from Shanghai that Juliet figured they may as well return with something to show for it. Still, as she weighed the risks in her head and tried to plot a way forward for stopping the blackmailer, she wondered if she was lying to herself, if acquiring a second vaccine was nothing more than a matter she pretended was pressing just so she could sit near Roma for a second longer, her hand resting on the seat inches from his. She could not reach over, but the mere proximity soothed a part of her she didn't want to acknowledge. The car came to a stop. We're here, the driver declared. You need a guide? I know Zhou Zhuang well. No need, Roma said, all business. We'll be out soon. He reached for his door, then glanced at Juliet again, who remained seated. Come on, get a move on, Laupa. 
Juliet thinned her lips, practically blowing her own door off its hinges as she got out. You can let that whole jig go now, she muttered. Roma had already walked far ahead. With a sigh, Juliet reluctantly followed, dragging her feet as she too ducked under the loose willow tree and entered the canal town. She had never visited Zhejiang before, but it felt familiar in the way that desert roads and snow-capped mountains did, sights that she had never glimpsed with her own eyes but plucked from storybooks and word-spun tales. As she and Roma picked carefully through the narrow footpath, edging along the side of the river canals, they kept track of the street names using small markers along the cornerstone buildings. Every so often, elderly voices would call out from within their shops, selling candy or handheld fans or dried fish, but Roma and Juliet avoided looking into the stores they passed, for they were walking so closely to the entrances that a mere second of eye contact would trap them in conversation. Juliet suddenly paused. Where Roma swerved around the woman by the canal, scrubbing at her laundry, Juliet's gaze latched onto the soap suds running along the concrete and into the water. The woman paid no attention, crouched over her task. The soap suds approached the edge. Juliet dove toward the canal, her knees scraping the ground and her hand closing around the small string of pearls just as they fell over the edge, saving the jewelry before it could be washed into the water. The woman gave a cry of surprise, startled by Juliet's quick rescue. I gather that this isn't something you intended to toss into the canal, Juliet said, holding out the soapy pearls. The woman blinked, realizing what had happened. She gasped, dropping her laundry and waving her hands around with fervor. Goodness, you're heaven sent. I must have left it in one of the pockets. Juliet offered a small, amused smile, dropping the string back into the woman's hand. Not heaven sent, I can just spot pearls from two miles away. There came the sound of someone clearing their throat, and Juliet looked up to find Roma waiting, brow quirked to ask why she was lingering and chatting. The woman, however, was still turned to Juliet, the crow's feet of her eyes crinkling deeper in kindness. Who are your parents? I'll bring some luobosai cake over later as a thank you. Juliet scrambled for an answer. Roma, overhearing the offer, cleared his throat again to urge Juliet to hurry up and extricate herself. Oh, Juliet said carefully. I'm. I'm not from around here. She didn't know why she was being so delicate around the subject. She could have easily said that they had come in from Shanghai. But there was something entirely too genuine about the woman's offer, something untainted by the usual give-and-take exchange of the city. Juliet didn't want to ruin it. She didn't want to pop the illusion. Oh, the woman said. But you look familiar. Juliet pulled her coat tighter around herself, then nudged a loose lock of hair behind her ear. She stood up, trying to signal to an impatient Roma that she was trying to wrap this up. I drop in sometimes, Juliet lied. To see my grandmother. Ah, the woman said, nodding. She turned her head out toward the water, closing her eyes for the wind to blow against her face. It is a peaceful place to retire, isn't it? Yes, Juliet thought without hesitation. Peace, that was the all-consuming sensation making the township sound different to her ear and the air smell different to her nose. It was unlike anything she had ever known. Dorigea, Roma prompted suddenly. The only reason was to avoid using her name, Juliet knew. He was playing along with the little act Juliet had put on for the woman, but her gaze jerked up anyway, her heart rabbiting in her chest. She wished he wouldn't throw the word around like that. It used to mean something. It used to be sacred, Moya Dorigea, I love you, I love you whispered against her lips. I must go, Juliet told the woman, taking her leave. She surged a few steps ahead of Roma, not wanting him to see her expression until she had a handle on herself. She would have continued forward aimlessly if Roma hadn't called out again. Slow down. It's this way. Juliet turned around seeing Roma point across a narrow bridge. As he started to climb, Juliet only stood by the canal, watching the water run languidly beneath the short structure. I kept them, you know. 
Roma stopped at the top of the bridge. What? All the pearls and diamonds. All the bracelets he had picked for her later in their relationship and that one necklace when they were fifteen, the first gift he had given before he kissed her on the rooftop of that jazz club. She kept them all, took them in a box with her to New York, even though she said she wouldn't. Did you say something? Roma prompted again. Juliet shook her head. It was for the best that Roma hadn't hurt her. What was the point of telling him any of that? This place was making her sentimental. Juliet, Roma chided when she remained yet unmoving. A word of warning that if you fall into the water from there, I will not be coming to your rescue. Come on. I'm a better swimmer than you are anyway, Juliet shot back darkly, clutching her fists and finally starting her climb. The stone under her feet seemed to sink in and shift around. Once they were on flat ground again, Roma ducked his head to avoid a shop sign and stepped into an alley, his eyes tracing the markings along the wall. Juliet simply trusted that he was navigating correctly, more concerned with where she was stepping in case her shoes caught an uneven brick and she tripped. They ventured deeper into the alleyway. Juliet tilted her head, listening while she walked. She was trying to decipher what was so strange about what she was hearing, until she realized it was because she could hear very little at all, and that was incredibly unusual. The walls on each side of the alley blocked out the hum and buzz of the townspeople around the canals. They boxed Roma and Juliet in, like every thin alley in this township was in its own bubble, like every twist and turn led into its own world. It got so quiet, Juliet remarked. Roma made a noise of agreement. I hope we're not going in the wrong direction, he muttered. This place is a labyrinth. But it was a beautiful labyrinth, one that felt not like a cage, but rather an endless arena. Juliet reached out to brush the bumpy wall of the shop they passed, angling her shoulder to avoid thwacking a protruding alley pipe. Zhou Zhuang has been standing since the Northern Song Dynasty, she said absently. Eight hundred long years. From the corner of her eye, she saw Roma nod. She thought that he would leave it at that, entertain her musings without much interest and think nothing more of it. Only he replied, it must feel safe. Juliet glanced at him properly. Safe? Don't you think? Roma shrugged. There must be a certain comfort here. Cities can fall and countries can go to war, but this, he raised his arms gesturing at the rivers and the stone paths and the delicate ceiling tiles that decorated what were once temples, this is forever. It was a nice thought. It was a thought Juliet wanted to believe in. But. This is a town within a city within a country that is always near war, Juliet said quietly. Nothing is forever. Roma shook his head. He looked visibly shaken though Juliet was not certain if it was because of what she had said or because of what her words had incited within him. Before she had a chance to ask, Roma was already brushing it off. He cleared his throat. They call this place the Venice of the East. Juliet scowled. Just as they call Shanghai the Paris of the East, she said. When are we going to stop letting the colonizers pick the comparisons? Why don't we ever call Paris the Shanghai of the West? A twitch pulled on Roma's lips. It almost looked like a smile, but it was so fast that Juliet might have imagined it. They were emerging from the alley now, nearing an open square with a large bridge on its opposite end. Beyond the bridge, they would find their destination. But here, in the square, there was a group of men loitering with military weapons slung over their shoulders. Militia soldiers. Juliet exchanged a glance with Roma keep walking, she warned. In quiet places like this, it was true warlord rule that continued to thrive. Militias patrolled the streets, utterly loyal to the one general who oversaw the wider district. The generals who had grown into warlords were no mighty figures, they were only men who had managed to seize power when the last imperial dynasty fell. The current government, really, was no more than a warlord installed in Beijing. All they had different from the rest of the warlords was the seal of approval from the international stage, but that did not mean control, it did not mean their power actually stretched any wider than the soldiers they had loyal. Juliet, 
Roma said suddenly. How far along is the Northern Expedition right now? The Northern Expedition? Juliet echoed, taken aback by the question. You mean the Nationalists? She tried to remember the last update she had heard from her father, searching her memory about their campaign to defeat the warlords and unify the country with a true government. A telegram some days ago said that they've completely captured Zhejiang. It would have been a worry. Zhejiang was the province directly below Shanghai, but after all, what had the Scarlet Gang been doing sidling up to the Nationalists this whole time if not to ensure their own survival? The Nationalist fighting armies were edging closer and closer to the city, but it wasn't as if they were truly defeating the warlords. Merely placating them. Reaching agreements, so that there was an understanding about the Kuomintang's place as eventual rulers of this country. They may have come even closer since then, Roma muttered. He inclined his chin toward the militiamen. Look. It was not the men he was gesturing to. It was what the men were looking at, which Juliet saw as soon as one shifted on his feet and moved away, a rising sun, painted crudely on the outside wall of a restaurant. The symbol of the nationalists. Hey, you. The militiamen had spotted them. Juliet immediately stepped forward. Who, me? Juliet, stop it, Roma hissed, making a grab for her wrist. She jerked her arm out of his reach, and he didn't try again. Not you, one of them said with a sneer, approaching. The Russian. Did you do this? Do I look like I have the time? Roma retorted. The man lunged forward. You sure have a lot of time to talk back. Juliet held out her hand. Not a step closer. Unless you want your ashes scattered into the Huangpu. Like magic, the soldier immediately halted, a clarity entering his eyes. Juliet's coat was undone now. It was time for her identity to be used, placed in the open like a playing card in a game of offensive maneuvers. Let's go, Roma muttered to Juliet. When she didn't move, he nudged her shoulder. This time, Juliet allowed herself to be led off, sparing one more glance at the men eyeing her warily. Though she was finished, the one at the front of their group clearly wasn't. Soon it won't matter who you are, Lady of Shanghai, he called after her. The nationalists are coming for all of us who rule by anarchy. They will take us all down. With one last tug, Roma had Juliet over the bridge and out of sight before she could retort. It's supposed to be in and out, Juliet, he muttered. Juliet's neck gave a little crick. With the speed she turned to look at him. You heard me in the car? I'm a liar, what can I say? Almost flippantly, Roma stopped and pointed up ahead. It was an old-style residence, built in a way that was utterly untouched by foreign influences and so spacious, because all who had once lived there and lived there still could afford it. How are we going to do this? They had arrived. The residence of Huai Hao, owner of the second vial. When Juliet approached the circular entranceway, she stepped through without any care. These residences were built precisely to welcome in visitors. They were void of doors around the facility, allowing wanderers to enter and appreciate the scenery, perhaps write a poem or two as they waited for the host to arrive, if this were 800 years ago. But it was the modern world now. I'm flattered you would let me make the decision, Juliet said, running her finger along a bird feeder. Though she teased, she knew exactly why he was buying time to ask such mundane questions. They had thrown enough money around. The white flowers had the means to pay such outrageous sums, but to keep doing it over and over without approval first was towing the line. Juliet knew him too well, he couldn't fool her and she knew him well enough to know that admitting this outright would be a sign of weakness. In another world, where she was smarter, she would let him suffer, so discord within the white flowers. But this was her world, and she only had her present self. I wasn't letting you make the decision, Roma replied. I was asking your opinion. Since when did you value my opinion? Don't make me regret asking. I've a feeling you already do. Roma rolled his eyes and marched ahead, but then there was the sound of a door sliding, 
and Juliet grabbed the back of Roma's coat, yanking him back. They ducked behind the bird feeder, hearing two sets of footsteps approach their direction. Mr. Huai, a voice called. Please, slow down. Shall I call for the car, then? Yes, yes, do one thing right, could you? A gruff voice snapped. The second pair of footsteps hurried back in the other direction, but another kept walking. Soon, he was in view, and Juliet poked her head out to find a middle-aged man strolling for the exit. He already had so much here. Opulence and luxury on par with the city. It was a far cry from the man in the wonton shop. There was no desperation to survive. There was only greed. And Juliet, too, could play greedy. You asked how we are to do this, she whispered to Roma how about like this. She reached into her coat, and as Mr. Huai walked by, not noticing his intruders despite how exposed they were, Juliet stepped out in front of him and leveled her gun to his forehead. Hello, she said. You have something we would like. 19. News of a monster attack arrived in Shanghai far before their rival darlings did. Already, Regardless that the casualties had occurred out in the countryside, the people of Shanghai were boarding up their windows and locking their doors, finding quarantine to be a better solution than risking madness on the streets. Perhaps they feared the monster, who was said to have crashed out the moving train windows and rolled upon the hillsides. Perhaps they feared that it would soon stumble into city limits, spreading infection. Benedict threw half of his sandwich into the trash, strolling under the flapping shop banners. Again and again, no matter how many times the white flowers said it, no one cared to listen. These monsters were not random hits. So long as the white flowers behaved, so long as they continued fulfilling demands. It had been a while since the last demand came. Benedict stopped. He turned over his shoulder. It felt like he was being watched, from both above and below eyes on the rooftops and eyes in the alleys. It wasn't his imagination. Quickly he spotted a boy on his tail, lingering at the mouth of an alley. When Benedict locked gazes with him, the boy hurried out, stopping two paces away. He was a whole head shorter than Benedict, but they looked the same age. There was a white rag tied to his ankle, half covered by his tattered trousers. A white flower, then, but not an important one. A messenger, most likely, if he was chasing after Benedict. I'm looking for Roman Nikolievich, the messenger huffed in Russian. He is nowhere to be seen. You decided to tail me for Roma? Benedict replied, his eyes narrowing. The boy folded his arms. Well, do you know where he is? Benedict's eyes only narrowed further. He's not here. All the lower-tiered white flowers should have known that. It was not difficult to keep attuned with the important members of the gang. It was the messenger's job to keep track of where one was most likely to be in order to find them. And who still called Roma Roman? Suddenly, Benedict's hand snagged out and grabbed the messenger's wrist. Who really sent you? The messenger's jaw dropped. He tried to tug away. What do you mean? In one smooth motion, Benedict twisted the boy's arm behind his back then pulled forth a pocket knife and pressed the blade to his neck. It was nowhere near any major artery to act a threat, but the messenger froze, eyeing the blade. You're a scarlet, Benedict guessed. So who sent you? The messenger remained quiet. Benedict pressed his knife in, cutting the first layer of skin. Lord Kai, the messenger spat quickly. Lord Kai sent me because we know. We know that the white flowers are behind the blackmail demands. Benedict blinked rapidly. We are not, he said, confused. Where did you hear such information from? It is too late now. The messenger tried to writhe about. Lord Kai wanted confirmation and confession, but Tyler will have you answer for your insolence. You dare threaten the Scarlet Gang, you pay with blood and fire. Just as Benedict was about to let go of his hold on the scarlet messenger's arm, the scarlet twisted his head and bit down hard on Benedict's hand. Benedict hissed, dropping his knife, and the boy bolted, disappearing down the street in record speed. 
hardly any of the onlookers by the food stalls even blinked. Something was wrong. Benedict rushed for headquarters, his heart pounding in his ears. By the time he was nearing the residential block, he could already hear the yelling. When he tried to push through the front door, he was almost pushed right out. Hey, hey, cut it out, he snapped, fighting through the crowd. At the center of the living room, the same white flower who had asked Benedict to help assemble the wardrobe was clutching a slip of paper in his hands, his face practically red as he explained its contents. Benedict caught bits and pieces as he struggled closer. Bank statement. Our latest payment. Exact number. Scarlet account. It's them. Order. Benedict roared. The room became still. Benedict was almost surprised. He had never commanded attention like this before. It was always Marshall jumping on the tables or Roma snapping one directive that swept the room like ice. But now neither Marshall nor Roma was here. Benedict was the only one left. Give me that, he snapped, holding his hand out for the paper. What are we crowing over? It was sent to us, Mr. Montagov, a voice within the crowd answered. Proof that we have no blackmailer, and it has been the Scarlets all along. So why did the Scarlet messenger say the exact opposite? Don't move a muscle, Benedict said without looking up, stopping the group near the door in their tracks. They had been on their way out, guns at the ready to find Scarlets to fight. With Benedict's instruction, they were forced to look as he turned the paper around, tapping the top corner. The account is registered to Lord Kai, one insisted, even as he squinted where Benedict was pointing. The deposit amount matches the last demand we paid? It's not real, Benedict interrupted. I want the Scarlets dead too, but don't be foolish. No bank crest in this city looks like this, it is not even a good inking. He tossed the paper to the table, flicking his hands for the men to disperse. It is the blackmailer once again. The Scarlets got the same falsified document blaming us. Now get back to your jobs. Benedict. The summons came from above. Benedict's head snapped up, as did everybody else's in the living room, to find his uncle atop the staircase. Lord Montagov's hands were crowded with silver when he set them on the handrails, rings that glinted by the light of the sunset streaming through the windows. Did you say, Lord Montagov said slowly, coming down the steps, taking one at a time like he had to weigh himself on each landing first, that the Scarlet Gang received the same information? Benedict could feel sweat starting at the back of his neck. I was accosted by one of their messengers on the streets, he said carefully. He accused us of sending the threats. And still, Lord Montagov came down the last few steps, the nearest men parting to make way for him, a path clearing toward Benedict like some miniature Red Sea, knowing their malicious intent, you stop our own from rushing out? An abrupt, scraping sound came from the wall outside, like someone had slipped off and fallen to the ground. Before Benedict could entertain the possibility of an eavesdropper outside, a white flower messenger, a true one, this time, scrambled through the door, heaving for breath. Come quickly, he gasped. Tyler Kai is launching an attack. I will find the Frenchman, Roma said when the train pulled into Shanghai, the station coming into view. And as soon as I find him, perhaps he will be afraid enough to tell us directly who turned him into a monster. Juliet nodded absently. Her eyes watched the window, pinned on the approaching platform. The sky was horribly dark, but the hour was also growing late. They had spent longer in Zhoujuang than Juliet had liked and the car ride back to Kunchen had been slowed by the potholes on the gravelly roads. It will not be that easy, Juliet grumbled. Not if the blackmailer sent him right after us. He did not even bother hiding his face. She turned away from the window and looked at Roma but still, it is better than nothing. We work from there. Roma rose and reached up to gather his coat from the overhead storage. Before Juliet could stop him, he had hers too, tossing it upon her. Careful, she chided. She stuck her hand into the pocket, checking on the vial they had stolen from Mr. Huai. It was fine, 
the blue liquid sloshing at its half-filled point. She had a sneaking suspicion that Roma had intended for her to worry that he was going to damage it. He was not foolish enough to forget it was in her pocket. Especially not when he had the other half of the vaccine in his pocket, separated into its own vial. We have arrived at the destination, the compartment speaker announced as Juliet got to her feet. The train came to a screeching stop, but even after, as the noise faded, there was still a dull roar coming from the misty grayness outside, and Juliet peered through the window again, searching for the source. Do you hear that? she asked. She didn't give Roma any time to respond. Juliet was already hurrying off the train, watching her step over the platform gap and surging into the crowds jostling at the station. This wasn't right. There were too many people here. Why were there so many people? Juliet. Roma called. His voice was almost immediately drowned out, and when Juliet glanced back momentarily, she had already lost sight of him. A sharp police whistle sounded to her right. Juliet whipped her attention to the officer, who had one foot balanced on the base of a column while the rest of him clung to it, putting him a few feet above the masses. He was waving at people to move off the platform and into the station, but only because droves of people were hurrying in from outside. Juliet grabbed the nearest person. An elderly woman stared up at her with wide eyes, lips tightening in recognition. What's going on? Juliet demanded. Where are all of these people coming from? The woman's gaze darted to the side. In her hands, she was holding today's newspapers, crumpled under her tight grip. Smoke outside, she managed. A gangster safe house is on fire. Coldness swept down Juliet's spine like a lightning strike. Marshall. She let go of the woman so fast that they both stumbled, but then Juliet was moving, her pulse pounding in her chest as she shoved her way through the station. Maybe it was only a small fire. Maybe it was already well controlled. With a gasp, Juliet emerged outside, right onto Boundary Road aptly named given that the Shanghai North Railway Station sat at the very border of the international settlement. Juliet needed only to look up, observing the state of the skies above the international settlement. The sun was to set within the hour, so there was yet enough light to show great big plumes of smoke, driving those on the streets toward whatever shelter they could find. No, 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 Juliet mumbled under her breath, throwing her arm over her nose and breaking into a run. She locked her watering eyes on the plumes, diving forward even as civilians fled in the other direction. Once or twice, she heard sirens in the distance, but the sounds were far enough that Juliet knew she would get to the scene first. Then a terrifying scream echoed into the air, a sharp and unusual piercing that sounded neither human nor animal. She stopped right in her tracks, waving the smoke out of her eyes. The safe house where she had put Marshall was much farther ahead, but the screaming was coming from the next street over, which meant. Oh, thank God, Juliet cried. It wasn't hers. It wasn't her safe house. But then, what was burning? Juliet ran the rest of the distance, cutting through a dark alley. She found herself coming onto a wide road, joining the crowd that was gathered before the spectacle. The people here had not run as those farther away had. They were enraptured by the horrific scene, just as someone experiencing the end of the world would stop and stare. I have never before seen such a sight, an old man beside her croaked. It is the work of the blood feud, his companion replied. Perhaps they are getting their last hits in before the nationalists arrive. Juliet pressed her knuckles to her lips. The smoke plumes flowed from a building entirely swathed in flames, and standing around it, like soldiers guarding an enemy castle, were Tyler and a flock of scarlet men. Tyler was laughing. She was too far away to hear what he was saying, but she could see him, holding a plank of wood swirling with flames. Behind him, the building's roaring inferno drowned out the screams, drowned out the whole occupancy burning to death. Juliet heard nothing save that they were pleading, women in nightgowns and elderly banging on the closed windows, muffled Russian crying to stop. Please stop. In the third floor window, there was a little hand reaching through a hole in the glass. Seconds later, 
a small face appeared, hollow and ghastly in tear tract. And before anyone could do a thing about it, the hand and the child dropped out of view, succumbing to the smoke. The screams had sounded so strange from the railway station, almost animal, because they had come from children. Juliet fell to her knees, a sob building against her throat. There was a shout from behind her, clear Russian, rather than muffled, white flower forces, arriving for a fight. She couldn't find it within herself to run. She would be killed if she lingered here, pathetic and brittle on the side of the road, but what did it matter when this whole city was so broken? They deserved to die. They all deserved to die. Juliet choked on her sudden gasp, caught by surprise when a pair of hands closed around her arms. She almost started to struggle before realizing it was only Marshal Seo yanking her into the nearest alleyway, a cloth covering the lower half of his face. As soon as they were in the alley, Marshal ripped off the cloth and raised a finger to shush her, the two of them keeping quiet as a group of white flowers moved past the mouth of the alley. Roma was among the group, his face aghast. Seconds later, Benedict ran up to him from the other direction, giving Roma's chest a hard shove as he began to yell. Roma. Oh God. What was he going to think? Juliet had run off without explanation. Would he suspect that she had a hand in this? Would he think that their trip to Kunchen had been a ploy, an attempt to get him out of the city so the Scarlets could launch their attack? In his shoes, Juliet would jump to the exact same conclusions. She should have been pleased, wasn't this exactly what she desired? For him to hate her so violently that he wanted nothing to do with her? Instead, she only burst into tears. What has Tyler done? Juliet rasped. Who approved this? My father? When has the blood feud ever involved innocent children? This isn't just the blood feud, Marshall said softly. He grimaced, then wiped at Juliet's tears. She was letting them run. More and more gangsters on both sides were arriving, and by the sudden gunshot sounds, Juliet guessed a fight to be breaking out. The blackmailer tricked both gangs. Your scarlets think the white flowers are the ones making the demands. They hurried to get the upper hand, desperate to show that they were too strong to be messed with. Tyler led the attack. Juliet dug her nails into her palms. Her skin throbbed with pain, but it didn't make her feel any better. I'm sorry, she managed. I'm sorry his heart is so wicked. Marshall frowned. He was trying to hold back his look of distress, but Juliet still saw it in the speed with which he tried to clear her tears. Once, she might have protested, might have feared the weakness she was showing. Now she did not want to pretend that she felt nothing, she would welcome the world's pity if it meant she could just stop hurting. The wickedest part isn't his heart, Marshall said. He glanced to the end of the alley, jumping ever so slightly when a spray of gunfire came near. It is that he is truly acting on scarlet interests, dear Juliet. The wickedest part is that this city is so deeply divided as to allow such atrocity. Juliet breathed in deeply, steadying herself. Indeed, it always came back to the blood feud. It always came back to the hatred that ran through the very veins of this city, not their hearts. What are you doing here? Juliet asked now, scrubbing the last of the wetness from her face. I told you to stay inside. If I hadn't come out, you would be over there getting shot by Roma, Marshall replied. Nor would I have heard, he broke off, misery flashing through his expression. I was too late. I ran faster than the other white flowers did, but I couldn't stop it. It's good that you didn't try. Juliet straightened up, forcing Marshall to look at her. It is not worth it, do you hear me? I cannot take Tyler down if you just give him more ammunition by revealing yourself to be alive. But Marshall just stared at the mouth of the alley. For someone who usually could not stop talking, he was eerily silent, his eyes tracking the flashes of violence that came near. Mars, Juliet said again. Yeah, he replied. Yeah, I know. Juliet bit down on the insides of her cheeks, flinching when the yelling got closer. I must run back to Scarlet territory and get back up, Juliet said with regret. 
no matter how wicked Tyler and his men are, I will not stand by and watch them be outnumbered. She paused, then heaved an exhale. Go help him, Marshal. Marshal's eyes swiveled back. I beg your pardon? Benedict, Juliet clarified. Go help Benedict. You look like you're ready to claw off your own skin, in helplessness. Marshall was already tying the cloth back around his face. When he pulled the hood of his outer jacket up, he was unrecognizable, only another part of the rapidly falling night. Be careful, he said. Another spray of gunfire. I should be telling you that, Juliet said. Hurry. Marshall ran off, joining the fray, joining yet another fight of the blood feud that was tearing the city into pieces. And Juliet turned on her heel, retreating to bring more forces to their death. Benedict could hardly see past the sheen of red in his vision. He didn't know if the red was from fury or actual blood, splattered along his temple and dripping into his eyes. Get over here, Roma hissed from some paces away. His cousin was crouching behind a car, gun in hand. Benedict, meanwhile, was only standing behind a street lamp, hardly covered given the thinness of the pole. Up ahead, Scarlets were in a shootout with the rest of the white flowers, and the odds were not looking good for their side. The scarlet numbers were only growing, though this was white flower territory. Someone within scarlet ranks had to have gathered reinforcements the moment this started. The white flowers were not so lucky. What's the use in hiding? Benedict asked. From where he stood, he fired off a shot. It hit a scarlet in the leg. I'm not asking you to hide. Roma, making a frustrated sound, stood suddenly, fired a shot, then ducked back down. I'm asking you to get over here so we can leave. This is turning into a slaughter. Benedict's vision flashed. The red cleared for blinding white. Night had fallen around them, and their surroundings would have been dark if not for the fire still raging in the safe house, consuming the walls and lives within. We cannot just leave the fight, Benedict snapped. You're a damn Montagov, Roma hissed, his words just as sharp. Know when to concede. That's how we survive. A Montagov. Benedict's stomach roiled as if he had just ingested something rotten. Being a Montagov was exactly what had gotten him here in the first place, right in the middle of a blood feud, bitter as bone, with only his cousin by his side and no one else. No, Benedict said. I do not walk away. He charged headfirst into the fight. Benedict. Roma roared after him. Roma ran to his side, giving him cover as they both fired, working as fast as they could. But the road had turned to a battleground, soldiers stationed at every strategic place. Though their bullets were running out, gangsters were not afraid to grapple, and before Benedict could call out a warning, there was a scarlet diving for Roma, knife in hand. Roma cursed, narrowly dodging a heavy blow. When the scarlet tried again, his cousin's fight became a blur in the dark, and Benedict needed to pay attention to what was coming at him, first a bullet that narrowly missed his ear, then a flying blade, slashing him in the arm only when he dove to the concrete. The ground trembled, the fire had finally eaten up a gas pipe. There was a colossal shrieking sound, and then the upper half of the house burst with an explosion and collapsed in on itself. Benedict staggered to his feet. His mother had died to the feud. Nobody had given him the details because he had been five years old, but he had sought them out anyway. He knew that after she was killed, an accidental casualty of a shootout, they had burned her body right in an alleyway until only charred smithereens remained. Maybe this was the way he would join her. The Scarlets would kill him, then throw him right into the raging fire, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Benedict gasped. This time, when the bullet flew at him, he felt it graze his shoulder, sending sparks of pain up and down his arm. Before he could think to raise his weapon again, something hard came down on the back of his head. And everything went dark. Marshall winced, catching Benedict before he fell. Quickly, he nudged his friend over his shoulder, hoping that no Scarlet was watching them, and if they were, that the Scarlet would think Marshall was merely one of their own, 
dealing with a white flower. Roma was somewhere in the chaos too, but he could handle himself. If he couldn't, their men would surely jump in front of him. It was only Benedict who seemed to need forcible removal. Marshall felt bad for having to hit him so hard. You got less heavy, Marshall remarked, even though Benedict was unconscious. It felt less, kidnappy when he talked as he ran, as if Benedict were keeping pace beside him rather than being tossed around. Have you been eating? You're keeping some strange habits, Ben. A sudden shout nearby shut Marshall up. He pressed his lips thin, ducking under the cover of a closed restaurant. When the group of Scarlets passed, Marshall continued moving, muttering a quiet prayer up into the heavens that they were already on white flower territory. Within minutes, he was in front of a very familiar building complex, nudging the door open with his elbow and entering, arms straining. Please tell me you haven't started locking up, Marshall whispered. I'm going to be so mad at you if you only started locking up after I died and never when I told you to before. Their front door opened easily under his palm. With a breath of relief, Marshall stumbled in, taking a moment to sniff at the apartment. It seemed different. Losing an occupant would do that to it, he supposed. The air was dusty, as was the kitchen counter, like it had not been wiped in weeks. The blinds were crooked, pulled up once some time ago and then abandoned, allowing half-light to enter in the day and only blocking out the half-dark of the night. Marshall finally entered Benedict's room and carefully set him onto his bed. Now that they were safe, the exertion of his kidnapping task caught up at once, and Marshall rested his hands on his knees, breathing hard. He did not move until his heart stopped thudding, tense in fear that the sound was so loud it would stir Benedict awake, but the other boy remained still, his chest rising and falling in the barest of motions. Marshall dropped to a crouch. He watched him, resolute just to watch him, like he had done these past few months, a pair of eyes following Benedict's every move in fear that Benedict would do something foolish. It was strange to be so close again when he had gotten used to being a shadow. Strange to be near enough that Marshall could reach out with his fingers, and suddenly his hand was hovering forward, brushing a blonde curl out of Benedict's face. He shouldn't. Benedict could wake upon disturbance, and the last thing Marshall needed was to break his most important promise to Juliet. How mighty you are, he whispered quietly. I am grateful that our roles are not switched, for I would have dove headfirst into the Huangpu should I be left in this world without you. Before the white flowers, Marshall's childhood had been dreary hallways and snatches of fresh air when he managed to wander out. If his mother grew too occupied with her dressmaking, Marshall was trekking into the fields behind the house, skipping stones on the shallow creeks and scraping moss from the rocks. There was no one else for miles, no neighbors, no kids his age to play with. Only his mother hunched over her sewing machine day after day, her gaze caught out the window, waiting for his father to return. She was dead now. Marshall had found her body, cold and still one morning, tucked in bed as if she were merely frozen in sleep. A soft sigh. Marshall's hand stilled, but Benedict continued breathing evenly, his eyes closed. Abruptly, Marshall stood, tightening his fists in reminder to himself. He was not supposed to be here. A promise was a promise, and Marshall was a man of his word. I miss you, he whispered, but I haven't left you. Don't give up on me, Ben. His eyes were burning. Staying here a second longer would undo him. Like a curtain being drawn across the stage, Marshall stood up and trailed out from his former apartment, fading back into the darkness of the night. 20. Benedict awoke in the morning with his head pounding something awful. It was the glare of light in his eyes that had roused him out of sleep, and it was the glare of light now worsening the ache at the base of his skull. The feeling reverberating outward and down his spine like some skeletal menace was pinching at his nerves. Christ, he muttered, lifting a hand to block out the sun. Why hadn't he pulled his bedroom blinds before going to sleep? Benedict bolted upright. When had he even gone to sleep? The moment he started to move, his shoulder pulled with a sharp discomfort, and he glanced down to find a small pool of blood on his sheets, entirely dried by now, 
having seeped from the shallow wound. Benedict rolled his arms around gingerly, testing the extent of his injuries. He was stiff but otherwise fully functioning, at his usual level, anyway. The wound had closed on its own, and he had no clue how long he had even been lying here, letting his body knit itself back together. Flabbergasted, Benedict pulled his legs to his chest, resting an arm on his knees and pressing the flat of his hand into his forehead, trying to push the headache back. He tried to visualize the last thing he could remember, and all he saw were bullets in the night, the raging inferno of the safe house in the background. He had been charging toward a scarlet, pistol in his hand, and then… nothing. He had no idea what happened next. He didn't even know where his gun had gotten to. How is that possible, he asked aloud. The house did not answer him. The house only stirred with his voice, shifting and exhaling in the way that all small spaces did every once in a while. Suddenly, so viciously that Benedict was almost bowled over, he caught the faintest whiff of a scent, of gunpowder and pepper and deep, musky smoke. Benedict shot to his feet. Marshal. The pain came to him all over again, like the first morning he had awoken and remembered, remembered that this apartment was empty, that Marshal's room was empty, that his body had been left to cool on the floor of an abandoned hospital. Benedict was losing it. He could smell him. As if he had been here. As if he were not gone. With a ragged inhale, Benedict yanked a new jacket out of his wardrobe and tugged it on, hardly bothering to go easy on his throbbing shoulder. What was the point? What was one more point of pain against the whole smorgasbord? He was a damn walking collection point for grievances and grief. He closed all the doors in his apartment, three times, then walked the short distance to the main Montagov residence, letting himself in. Before any of the white flowers in the living room could take notice of him, Benedict was slinking up the stairs, climbing to the fourth floor. Unprompted, he walked into Roma's bedroom, shutting the door after himself. Roma jumped, immediately whirling around on his desk chair. He had a cotton pad in his hand and a mirror in the other. There was a wound on his lip, running scarlet red. I was looking for you all night, Roma snapped, throwing the mirror down. Where the hell did you go? I thought you were dead in a ditch. Benedict slumped onto Roma's bed. I don't remember. You don't, Roma stood, then rested his hands on his knees his voice pitching up ten octaves, remember? I guess I hit my head and got myself home. You were there one second and nowhere the next. The fight hadn't even dispersed before you were gone. I almost got flayed because I kept looking around and searching. Benedict got to his feet too, cutting his cousin off. I didn't come here to argue with you. Roma threw his hands into the air. He was exerting so much energy in that one motion that his cheeks flushed with color. I am hardly arguing with you. Silence. Roma's expression shifted from annoyed to thoughtful to grim within the span of seconds as the two Montagovs stared at each other, having a silent conversation with nothing but facial expressions. They had grown up together. No matter how far they were pulled apart, the language of childhood was not one easily forgotten. You can't keep working with Juliet, Benedict finally said, tearing right into the wound of the matter. Not after this. Not after what they did to us. Roma turned away, placing his hands behind his back now. He was buying time. He only paced when he couldn't puzzle through his answers. This whole thing was orchestrated, Roma said in lieu of an answer. The blackmailer struck again, had us think the Scarlets were responsible had the Scarlets think we were. I know it was orchestrated. I'm the one who figured it out, Benedict cut in, seconds away from giving his cousin a hefty shake. What part of this was hard to understand? What part of this was hard to see? But her people chose to set those fires. Her people burned children to death. Roma swiveled around. Juliet is not her people. And Benedict snapped. Juliet let your mother die. Juliet killed Marshall. His voice crashed across the room with the same intensity of a cannon, landing with complete devastation. 
Roma rocked like he had been physically hit, and Benedict, too, clutched his stomach, bearing the kickback of his words. That, that was the central point which they could not forgive. Even mothers could be forgiven, in a city soaked in blood. But Marshal Seo could not be. I know, Roma spat. The volume came unwillingly, like he hadn't wanted to shout, but that was the only way this conversation could be tolerated. I know, Benedict. God, don't you think I know? Benedict laughed. It was the most humorless sound, somehow blunt and bladed at once. You tell me. Because you sure act like everything can be forgotten, gallivanting off with her like this. He was my friend too. I know you two were a hell of a lot closer, but don't act like I didn't care. You don't get it. Benedict couldn't think past the roar in his head. Could hardly breathe past the twist in his throat. You just don't get it. What, Benedict? What could I possibly not get? I loved him. Across the room, Roma exhaled out once, letting the rest of his anger go in that short breath. Quick as his surprise came, it was gone in the next beat, like he was kicking himself for being surprised at all. Benedict, meanwhile, put his hand to his throat, like he could swallow his words, could return them inside his lungs where they once lived undisturbed. He shouldn't have said that. He shouldn't have said anything at all, but he had said it. And he didn't want to take it back. He meant it. I loved him, Benedict said again, softly this time, only to feel what those words tasted like on his tongue a second time. He had known all along, hadn't he? It was only that he could not say it. When Roma looked over, his eyes were glistening. This city would have destroyed you for that. It has destroyed me anyway, Benedict replied. It had always taken, and taken, and taken. And this time, it took too much. Roma strode toward him. For half a second, Benedict considered that Roma was coming to attack him, but instead, his cousin drew him into a fierce hug, arms as steady as steel. Slowly, Benedict returned the embrace. Doing so felt like seizing a gasp of his childhood, plainer days when his biggest worry was the sparring mat and whether he was going to get the wind kicked out of him. It never mattered even if he did. Roma always helped him back up again. I'll kill her, Roma whispered into the quiet of the room. On my life, I swear it. 21. March 1927. Juliet slammed down the telephone receiver, letting out the faintest scream. She sounded so much like a whistling tea kettle that one of the maids at the end of the hallway peered over her shoulder, checking if the sound had come from the kitchen. With a sigh, Juliet retreated from the telephone, her fingers red from the excessive cord twirling. At this point the switchboard operators probably recognized her by voice alone, given she was calling so many times a day. She had no choice. What else was she to do? Suffice it to say, after Tyler's arson, their cooperation with the White Flowers had ended, and when Juliet asked her father if it would not be beneficial to meet at least once more, her father had thinned his lips and waved her off. She couldn't comprehend why Lord Kai would be eager to work with the White Flowers one moment, and when Juliet was finally onto something, when she needed their resources to find the identity of the Frenchman who had transformed into a monster, suddenly it was no good working with the enemy. Who was the one whispering into her father's ear? There were too many people coming and going from his office to ever begin making a list. Had they been infiltrated by white flowers? Was it the nationalists? Hey! Juliet jumped, her elbow banging against the jam of her bedroom door. Jesus! It's Kathleen, actually, but I appreciate the holiness, Kathleen said from upon Juliet's bed. She flipped her magazine. You look stressed. Yes, I am stressed, Biagie. How perceptive of you. Juliet pulled her pearl earrings out, setting them onto her vanity and massaging her lobes. It turned out that wearing earrings and pressing a receiver to her ear for hours at a time did not go well together. Had I known you were home, I would have roped you into helping me. At this, Kathleen closed her magazine, sitting up quickly. Do you need my help? 
Juliet shook her head. I jest. I have it handled. For the past week, since the white flower safe house burned to the ground and Roma hadn't responded to any of her delivered messages, Juliet had been calling every French hotel in their directory, asking a series of the same questions. Was any guest acting peculiar? Was anyone making a mess in their rooms? Leaving behind what might look like animal tracks? Making too many noises at random hours of the night? Anything, anything, that might signal someone keeping control of monsters or turning into a monster themselves, but Juliet had gotten nothing but false leads and drunks. She heaved a long exhale. At present, gravel was crunching from somewhere outside, beyond Juliet's balcony doors. When Kathleen walked over, peering through the glass, she reported, that looks like your father coming home. Seconds later, Juliet identified the sound of tires rolling down the driveway. You know what strikes me as strange, she asked suddenly. The front door opened and closed. A burst of voices downstairs signaled the arrival of visitors accompanying her father's return, interrupting an otherwise leisurely late morning. There has only been one attack thus far, two if we count the train. And it is awful of me, but I cannot help but feel as though there should be more. But there have been sightings, Kathleen said. She leaned up against the balcony glass. Numerous sightings. Largely at the workers' strikes, Juliet countered. The first time, she had brushed it off. Roma thought it to be a rumor, she had thought the same. Only now the rumors were coming from police officers and gangsters, more and more of them arguing that they were unable to defend their post, defend against the striking workers as they tore down their factories and stormed the streets, because they had spotted a monster in the crowd. I don't know, she went on. I imagine releasing insects would spread fear much faster than mere sightings. Kathleen shrugged. We have labeled this person a blackmailer for a reason, she said. It is not Paul Dexter. The purpose isn't chaos. The purpose is money and resources. But still, Juliet bit down on the inside of her cheeks. Something did not sit right with her. It was like she was looking directly at a picture and seeing something else because someone had already told her what to look for. Just as she had charged into a wonton shop without thinking about how it didn't make any sense for it to be a vaccine center. She had merely assumed from the beginning, from the moment she laid eyes on that flyer, because that had been the case once before. So what wasn't she seeing now? Miss Kai? Juliet tucked a curl behind her ear, turning her attention to the messenger when he stuck his head into her room. Yes. Lord Kai summons you. His office. The ruckus of voices drifting down the hallway was growing louder. It sounded like her father had a whole assembly in his office. Tired as she was, Juliet moved immediately exchanging a meaningful glance with Kathleen and then hurrying out into the hall. Though she didn't know exactly what she had been summoned for, she could take a guess as soon as she slipped into her father's office and found it filled to the brim with nationalists. Oh boy, Juliet muttered beneath her breath. She had entered late, it appeared, because they were mid-debate, one Kuomintang man already speaking with his arms clasped behind his back. She recognized him, or rather, recognized the fact that his lapels were decorated to every square inch. General Xu. She had looked into him since her father's warning. Among the Kuomintang, he was powerful enough to be second to Chiang Kai-shek, their commander-in-chief. He wasn't in Shanghai often, he had an army to lead, after all, but if the expedition finally reached the city, it would be his men who marched in first. Juliet's dress started to itch at her skin, too long and bright among so many dark suits. Her mother was nowhere in sight. Only her father, behind his desk. It is best to protect those who matter first. What good is there aiding those we want gone? Suddenly, Juliet caught sight of another very familiar figure in the corner of the room. Tyler was seated with the slightest of smiles, legs propped wide and something that looked like a chunk of blue dough hanging from his fingers. She squinted closer. It was a familiar blue. Lapis lazuli blue. Juliet understood now. 
her dear cousin had been spending all his time at the Scarlet facility in Cheng Wangmyo, overseeing their efforts for this reason precisely. The vaccine was ready. And Tyler had brought in the news ahead of anyone else, giving him first access to a room full of nationalists first, letting him set the stage before Juliet even had a chance to say a word. We do as Kai Tai Lei proposed, General Xu said. No, Juliet snapped. Heads turned fast in her direction, but she was ready, discomfort fading from her skin. What kind of government are you going to be if you let your own people die? Even once we are in power, General Xu said, offering her the sort of placating smile that one would give a child, there are certain people who will never be our own. It doesn't work like that. The nationalists in the room bristled, as did Tyler. Juliet, Lord Kai said plainly. There was no reproach in his tone. That was more of Lady Kai's trademark, and she wasn't here to be offended at Juliet's social decorum. Her father was merely reminding her to think carefully about every word coming out of her mouth. General Xu turned to face Juliet, his eyes narrowing. As a powerful war general, he could surely read a room, Juliet was getting away with saying such things to his face, so Juliet was not a mere girl he could flick away. Juliet was, perhaps, a threat. The communists are growing out of control, General Xu boomed. He was looking at Juliet, but he spoke to the whole room, capturing their attention like the esteemed guest of a rally. They are overpowering the Kuomintang party. They are overpowering the city. The moment they rise, he pointed a finger at Juliet, you and I are both out of power, little girl. The moment the communists take over, the Kuomintang and the gangsters die alongside one another. He might be right. He might be predicting their exact future. And still. You'll regret it, Juliet said evenly. Shanghai is its people. And if you let its people die, it'll come back to bite you. At last the nationalist seemed to be reaching the end of his patience. He thinned his lips. Perhaps you have not heard, he said. The communists have allied with the white flowers. The communists have, what? Before Juliet could say anything else, General Xu turned his address elsewhere, hands pressed cleanly to his sides. His mind was made. Perhaps everyone else's in the room was too. It is the only option, Lord Kai, another nationalist said. Our enemies grow in power, and if we protect them, we lose this opportunity. Revolution is coming any day. Before it does, let their numbers be culled. Let their chances of success die a pitiful death. Juliet took an involuntary step back, hitting the door with her shoulder blades. I suppose it is truly the only option, her father said. Very well. We keep the vaccine within our own circles. In the corner of the room, Tyler lifted the corner of his mouth in a smirk. Juliet spat a curse and swung the door open, then pulled it shut after herself with a loud slam. Let the men jump. Let them be afraid of how she moved, like a hurricane intent on destruction. Her father might chide her for leaving so suddenly, but she doubted he had the time for discipline. Why the hell would the white flowers ally with the communists? There is no benefit at all. Juliet stormed back into her bedroom, almost short of breath. The communists and the white flowers are working together, she said to Kathleen, who startled, not expecting to see her back so soon. Kathleen's magazine slid right out of her hands. I beg your pardon, she said. Since when? Juliet twisted her arms around her middle and sat primly on her bed. Their two enemies had just merged like the head of a reverse hydra. I don't know. I, she stopped, blinking at her cousin who was now sliding off the blankets and getting her shoes on. Where are you going? Making a phone call, Kathleen answered, already walking out the door. Give me a minute. Juliet dove backward, splaying her arms and legs like a five-point star atop her sheets. Roma was supposed to have found the Frenchman by now. They were supposed to have threatened or tortured a name out of him and eradicated the threat of a blackmailer. But in all honesty, it didn't even seem to matter. 
who cared about a few dead bodies if revolution was sweeping into Shanghai? What was one blood-soaked nightclub up against a blood-soaked city? This blackmailer was not Paul Dexter. They didn't want the city flooded with monsters and madness. They only wanted, well, Juliet didn't know. See, this is why we always check our sources. Juliet bolted upright, her hair crackling with her movements. The pomade in her curls would start to loosen if she kept disturbing it like this. Is it false? Not false exactly, Kathleen replied. She closed Juliet's bedroom door, leaning up against it like her body was an additional barrier against eavesdroppers. But it is not Lord Montagog who has allied with them. It is a sect within the White Flowers that the Communists are bragging about having secured. Honestly, with the way Danau was talking, Kathleen trailed off, her thin, arched brows furrowing together in thought. I wonder if the Montagovs even know about it. The intrigue only seemed to thicken. Juliet shuffled back on her bed, drawing her leg up and pressing her chin to her knee. For three long seconds, she stared into space, trying to make sense of what Kathleen was saying. If he is a white flower, Juliet had asked on that train platform, then why does he look rather murderous toward you, too? What do you mean by a sect? Kathleen shrugged. I mean exactly what I think Danau meant. A group within the White Flowers seems to have enough power and influence to be making agreements with the communists on their own. They may have been working together for quite some time now, it is only that the information has recently slipped to the nationalists. And just like that, the connection snapped in place. Ha! Huh. Kathleen blinked. Ha! Huh, she echoed, mimicking Juliet's casual tone. What's that supposed to mean? Juliet drew her other leg onto the bed too. If any of her relatives saw her right at this moment, they would surely chastise her for sitting in such an appalling manner. The blackmailer was asking for money and money and more money, and then suddenly weapons? Why weapons? She inspected her fingers, the varnish on her nails and the barely visible chip on her pinky. What if it's the communists? They need weapons for revolution. They need money and weapons to break from the nationalists and take the city. The communists working with a sect of the White Flowers who did not heal to Lord Montagov's nor Roma's word. It made perfect sense. It was why, for months, the monetary demands had only come to the Scarlet Gang before ever approaching the White Flowers. Because they were already siphoning resources out of the White Flowers. Slow down, Kathleen said, though Juliet was speaking plenty slow. Remember what happened the last time you accused a communist of the madness. She remembered. She had accused Zhang Gutai and killed the wrong man. She had been led astray by Paul Dexter. But this time. It makes sense, does it not? Juliet asked. Even if the communists have their revolution, even if they get rid of us gangsters, they cannot overthrow their nationalist allies. The only way they can win this revolution without the nationalists swooping in afterward and claiming that Shanghai has been taken for the entire Kuomintang to enjoy, Juliet splayed her hands out, is by preparing to fight a war. Silence swept into the room. All that could be heard were the sprinklers outside watering the gardens. Then Kathleen sighed. You better pray it is not. You may be able to kill a monster, Juliet. You may purge all the insects that a foreign man has brought in. But you cannot put yourself in the middle of a war. Juliet was already scrambling up, opening her wardrobe. If the communists are using these monsters to start the war, then I sure can. I fear you will kill yourself trying. Kathleen, please. Juliet poked her head into her hangers, searching the floor of the wardrobe. She caught sight of a few revolvers, discarded necklaces, and a shoebox, which contained a grenade, if she was remembering correctly. At the back of the mess, her lightest coat had fallen into a bundle. She retrieved it and shook it out, then held the garment in the crook of her elbow. I'm not that easy to kill. Kathleen was trying her best to pull an angry face. It wasn't as effective when she was smoothing a hand along her softly curled hair, twisting a strand along her finger. 
a secret white flower working with the communists still doesn't add up, she argued. This all began with Paul Dexter's note. In the event of my death, release them all. He wrote to someone he knew. He wrote into the French concession. A French white flower, Juliet replied in answer. It still tracks. But. I have someone who might know something. I've got to go now so I can get back before our trip with Mama this afternoon. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Juliet halted, the door half open under her hand. Quickly, Kathleen hurried over and pressed the door closed again, waiting a second after the soft click to ensure no one was outside. It's about Rosalind. Oh. Juliet wasn't expecting that. She's coming later, isn't she? To the temple? Lady Kai had insisted upon it. She needed an entourage, and her usual crowd couldn't offer accompaniment when the temple only allowed women. Juliet and her cousins had been gifted the honor of playing bodyguards. It was unlikely that there was any need for protection at a women-only temple, but such was life as a figurehead of a criminal empire. At the thought, Juliet walked back to her vanity and slotted an extra knife into her sleeve. Yes, I expect so, but that's not what I'm talking about, Kathleen said, waving the question away. Were you aware she has some secret lover in the city? Juliet whirled around, her mouth parting. A hint of glee slipped out as she exclaimed, You're joking. Kathleen propped her hands on her hips. Can you sound a little less excited about this? I'm not. Your eyes are glowing. Juliet tried her best to school her expression, feigning earnestness. She pushed her coat farther up her arm before it slipped from her elbow. I didn't know about this, but it's not so bad. You were worried about Rosalind falling into trouble with merchants. Isn't a lover better in comparison? Now, I really have to go. Kathleen held her arm out, physically preventing Juliet from leaving. With the way that her cousin was eyeing the coat on her arm, she wouldn't be surprised if Kathleen stole it next, just so Juliet couldn't walk out. Allegedly, the lover is a merchant, Kathleen said. You're not the least bit concerned why Rosalind hasn't told us? Biagia, gently, Juliet eased Kathleen's arm away from the door. We can ask her about it when we see her. I have to go. I'll meet you later? With a grumble, Kathleen stepped aside. Juliet thought she had finally gotten through, but as she stepped into the hallway, unfolding her coat, her cousin said, Don't you get tired of all this? Juliet paused in her step, pulling her coat on. Tired of what? Kathleen's lips curved up. She squinted into the doorknob, its golden gleam bouncing her reflection back at her in miniature. Chasing answers, her cousin replied, dabbing a finger at the corner of her mouth. The line of her lipstick was already a perfect bow. Eternally running around trying to save a city that does not want to be saved, that is hardly good enough to be saved. Juliet hadn't expected such a question, nor had she expected to reel from trying to answer it. Down the hallway, the voices were still communing in their meeting, leaving her out of whatever plan would soon beset the city. The men who governed this place did not want her help. But she was not doing it for them she was doing it for everyone else. I'm not saving the city because it is good, she said carefully. Nor am I saving the city because I am good. I want it safe because I wish to be safe. I want it safe because safety is always what is deserved, goodness or wickedness alike. And if Juliet didn't do it, then who would? She sat up here on a throne encrusted in silver and dusted with opium powder. If she didn't use her birthright to offer protection where she could, what was the point? Kathleen's frown only deepened, but there was too much to unpack, especially while Juliet was hovering on her toes, rushing to leave. All that her cousin managed was a soft sigh, and then, I beg you to be careful. Juliet smiled. Aren't I always? You look a mess. Juliet rolled her eyes, pushing past Marshall to get inside. She could smell the city on her skin, that mix between the wind-blown salt coming in from the sea and the unidentifiable jumble of fried foodstuffs permeating the streets. 
there was no avoiding it whenever she rode through on a rickshaw. I have a question, Juliet said immediately, pulling the locks on the safe house door. Marshall wandered deeper into the room, not that there was anywhere to go in such a small space, and collapsed on his mattress. Is that why you have arrived without gifts to bear? Juliet palmed a knife into her hand and pretended to throw. Ah. Marshall yelped immediately, throwing his arms over his face. I jest. You'd better be. You certainly pick up enough things to eat and drink whenever you go outside. Juliet put her knife away. With a stride that could be described more as stomping than walking, she made her way over to the mattress too and dropped down beside him, her dress clinking with noise. You're my only white flower source right now, she said. What do you know about your communication with the communists? The communists? Marshall echoed. He had been lying back, elbows propped on the sheets, but now he sat up straight, brows knitting together. Most of the Russians in this city are Bolshevik Revolution refugees. When have the white flowers ever liked the communists? That's what I want to know, Juliet grumbled. She blew a piece of hair out of her eyes, and when that did nothing to get the lock away from her face, she huffed extra loudly and pushed it back, smushing it with the rest of the tangle. Given, it is not as if I am very up to date with the latest white flower goings on. Marshall reached for something tucked near the wall, his whole arm straining to make contact without moving from position. When he finally retrieved it, he returned to Juliet with a flourish. May I? It's hurting my eyes to look at you. Juliet squinted at what he was holding, trying to pick out the label in the dim light of the safe house. She snorted when it registered. Hair pomade. She inclined her head toward him. Please. Make me pretty again. In silence, Marshall scooped a clump of pomade and started to brush through her hair with his fingers. He made fast work of reforming her curls, though his tongue was sticking out in concentration, as if he had never tried shaping longer hair, but he would be damned before Juliet told him he was doing it wrong. You should ask Roma, Marshall said, finishing a curl near her ear. It's his job, is it not? That's a little difficult right now, Juliet replied. The blood feud pushed away her answers about the blackmailer. Politics pushed away her chances at protecting the city so they wouldn't need answers about the blackmailer. Why did everybody in this city insist on making life so difficult for themselves? None of this would even be happening if General Xu would just let us distribute the vaccine. Marshall froze. He tried to hide it, tried to resume with the curl as if nothing happened, but Juliet sensed the delay, and her head swiveled to him, interrupting his work. What? No, nothing, let me. Marshall. Can I just? Marshall. The edge in Juliet's voice got through. With the slightest shake of his head, Marshall continued to feign casual, but he said, I had some ties to the Kuomintang before joining the White Flowers, that's all. General Shu is bad news. Once he latches onto something, he won't let go. If he doesn't want a scarlet vaccine distributed across the city, it's never going to go out. Juliet supposed she wasn't surprised at that, given what she already knew about the man. But. Weren't you a child when you joined the White Flowers? Marshall shook his head again, more firmly this time. It was a youth group. Now, he shifted one last curl in place. You no longer look like a rickshaw driver dragged you through the mud. Happy? Overjoyed, Juliet replied, getting to her feet. Something still sounded a little off, but she hardly had the time to prod at it. I'll take my leave now, but... Stay inside, I know. Marshall waved her off. Don't you worry about me? Juliet shot him a warning glare as she walked to the door, but Marshall only grinned. Goodbye, you menace. 22. As it turned out, when Lady Kai said that she needed accompaniment to the city temple in the afternoon, she meant the very minute noon passed, and now Juliet was late. When the car came to a stop, Juliet leaned into the rearview mirror and retouched her hair once more before tumbling out, searching for her mother and her cousins. 
she tried not to bristle when indeed she found Rosalind and Kathleen alongside her mother, as well as Tyler with a group of his men. Since his stunt with the safe house, the Scarlets had praised him with vigor. She was having quite some trouble doing the same. We almost thought you wouldn't come, Rosalind said as Juliet joined her, eyes still fixed on Tyler. He was cleaning his pistol, twisting a cloth roughly along the barrel. If he wasn't careful around the trigger, it was going to go off and then one of his men would have a hole blown through the stomach. I didn't think everyone left so early. Her mother had sighted her now and was coming this way. What is Tyler doing here? He came with your mother, Kathleen supplied, standing to Rosalind's other side with her arms crossed. Extra protection for the walk. Juliet tried not to grit her teeth so hard. She was going to put a crack in her jaw at this rate. Ready? Lady Kai asked, smoothing her chi pao down and waving them along. Tyler stayed put where he was, his men spreading out along the entrance into the temple walls, but Juliet gave him one last look before turning and following after her mother. So, I heard an interesting rumor. In synchrony, Juliet and Rosalind lifted a foot over the protruding threshold into the temple. Any time Juliet needed to do this to enter a building, she could gauge its age, gauge that it had been built before the roads were entirely smooth and the people had needed to protect against the possibility of floods. The temple itself was a quaint building, but a vast courtyard circled its perimeter, protected by tall, sun-faded walls with two golden gateways to the north and south, each facing the sides of the dusty red temple. Rosalind's eyes slid over. Qua. Unrumor, Juliet repeated, perhaps with an unnecessary bout of flourish as she switched to French too. Floating around the city. You know better than to, Rosalind stopped suddenly, looking beside her. When Juliet turned too, she realized it was because Kathleen had stalled behind, pausing just after the entranceway, looking around the courtyard. It appeared like she was waiting for something. Mimi, Rosalind called. You okay? A small smile played at Kathleen's lips. I'm fine. Juliet and Rosalind waited for her to catch up, walking again only when Kathleen had fallen back in step. They passed a silver Shanglu, one that was so enormous it looked like a giant bowl fitted with an awning. Three women stood around it to light their incense, delicately holding their sleeves so as not to get caught in the flames in the basin. We were just talking about Rosalind's lover, Juliet said to Kathleen. S-H-H. Rosalind immediately hissed, her gaze snapping up to make sure Lady Kai hadn't heard. Then it is true, Kathleen exclaimed. Do the both of you want to yell any louder? No one here understands us, say Pa Grave. Juliet bounced in her step. Why haven't you told us? Where did you meet? Rosalind's expression tightened. You really should not trust what the whispers say. Rosalind. Kathleen sounded stern now, as if she just wanted an answer. Why are you being so secretive about this? Because of Rosalind, swept another look around. By then they had almost reached the temple building, trailing far behind Lady Kai, who was climbing the steps up. There was no one around them no one to overhear their conversation even if they happened to speak French. Because? Kathleen prompted. And all in one breath, Rosalind said, because he's associated with the white flowers, okay? Juliet felt a sudden lump in her throat. The smell of incense permeated the entire courtyard, getting stronger with the closer they approached the temple. It clotted in her nostrils, almost choking her airways if she didn't just exhale. That, I didn't expect, Kathleen remarked evenly. Here I was thinking it was politics, and you gave me blood feud instead. Meaningfully, Kathleen caught Juliet's eye. Rosalind didn't know about Juliet's past with Roma, but Kathleen had some idea, even if it was not the full picture. It's not ideal, Rosalind, Juliet finally choked out. Speaking from personal experience. From very, very personal experience if my parents find out. Which is exactly why they won't. Rosalind lifted the edge of her chi pao, starting up the steps. Kathleen made to follow, 
but Juliet's skirt swished around freely at the knees. We were first introduced in a bar on neutral territory, and I only ever see him in places that switch between scarlet and white flower just about every second day. Give it some more time and I'll have convinced him away from the white flowers. No one has to know. Juliet tried to shake off her terror. She nudged her cousin, hoping that a faked brightness would inject real energy into her outlook. No one has to know, she echoed. We'll help you, right, Kathleen? Kathleen, on the other hand, was not afraid of grimacing. She didn't even try to look happy. Ugh, I suppose. It's a dangerous game, Rosalind. But we're on your side. It was a dangerous game, but nowhere near as dangerous as the one Juliet was playing. She had to remind herself that it wasn't the same. That Rosalind could be happy, that they didn't all have to end in bloodshed. The three of you walk so slowly, Lady Kai said when they finally caught up. Inside the temple, the daylight seemed muted, stopping outside the open doors like it didn't have an invitation. Instead, the red of the shrines took on its own glow, casting the temple in a warm sheen. Merely taking in the parameters, Mama, Juliet replied. Lady Kai blew out a short breath like she didn't believe her. I see the client. Don't go far, Juliet. Maybe, her mother waved her hand at the far wall, where a smattering of women knelt in front of symbolic deities. They would ket out three times, foreheads briefly touching the floor mats, then plant their incense into the shrines. Chu Xiaoxiang B.A.? Juliet scoffed. I think the ancestors might strike me down if I initiate any contact with them. I'll just wait here. Kathleen and Rosalind can go if they want. Kathleen and Rosalind exchanged a glance. They both shrugged. As Lady Kai left to approach the client, Juliet's two cousins found their own incense sticks and went back outside to light them, leaving Juliet to wander about the temple. Don't be offended, ancestors, Juliet murmured under her breath. I'll bring you a few extra oranges next time. She cast a glance at her mother. The meeting seemed mundane, two women speaking to each other about matters designated as more delicate than their husbands could handle. The woman handed over a stack of papers. Lady Kai scanned through them. Juliet turned back to the shrines, chewing on her thoughts. A Frenchman, a monster, a blackmailer. Communists, nationalists, civil war. A vaccine, ready to circulate. She simply wasn't working with enough information. All she had was conjecture. No names, no sources. And while she was supposed to be thinking about fixing the state of the city, she was thinking about Rosalind's plight too, and how unfair it was that even after the blackmailer was gone, the city would always, always be divided. Juliet scanned their surroundings again, patient as her mother's conversation went on. It was this time that she sighted the long pew in the corner of the temple and became fixated there, finding something of note. As Juliet stepped closer, she saw one girl seated alone, reading a small book. Something about her blonde hair was familiar. Juliet stiffened. She spared another glance over at her mother to ensure Lady Kai was not looking her way, then, as quickly as she dared, hurried over to the pew. Elisa Montagova, Juliet hissed. This is Scarlet Territory. What are you doing here? Elisa's head jerked up, her eyes widening. She slapped her book closed, as if the illicit activity at present was her reading. I, the girl winced. I wasn't going to stay long. I just didn't think anyone would care about the blood feud in a women's temple. Okay, but, Juliet looked around again, why? Why are you here? Elisa blinked, seeming to realize that Juliet's panic was not over her presence alone. She had tried to seem tough, but now her expression was tightening in confusion. We had a funeral in the cemetery, a few streets over. I got tired of standing, so I snuck away. The cemetery, a few streets over. Juliet tried to envision the layout of the city in this region, knowing immediately which cemetery Elisa was referring to. In her head, she traced their route out, 
assuming attendees were to move from that section of white flower territory and into the east of the city, where most of them lived. No matter what, they needed to pass the front of the temple, where Tyler was currently waiting with all his men. Juliet spat a curse. Who was present, Elisa? Your father? Inner circle? By now Elisa had gotten to her feet. Juliet's concern was scaring her. No, not Papa. But Roma and Dimitri. A bullet went off in the distance, outside the temple walls. To anyone else, it could have sounded like a rickshaw crash or a food cart coming up hard against the sidewalk. But Juliet knew better. She shot off, tearing through the courtyard, already reaching for the weapons on her body. By the time she was approaching the gate of the temple walls, the scene was already unfolding before her, twenty, thirty gangsters, and civilians, so many civilians nearby, looking stunned. Too many civilians for gunfire. Too many likely victims of stray bullets. The gangsters in the brawl had realized too, else there wouldn't be so many going at hand-to-hand -hand combat now, else there wouldn't be a white flower half-strangling Tyler, almost pressing her cousin to the floor. Without slowing in her run, Juliet jumped over the threshold of the temple entrance and pulled the knife sheathed at her thigh. When she threw, the blade pierced into the white flower's neck smoothly, striking its target with nary a sound before the white flower pitched sideways and fell. You're welcome, Juliet snapped, coming to a stop in front of Tyler and holding out a hand. Tyler grinned. He gripped her fingers and stood. Thank you, dearest cousin. Duck. Juliet doved to the side without questioning it. A white flower lunged forward, and Tyler engaged, but as Juliet spun around, still locked in her crouch, her gaze shot through the chaos and locked right with another figure who had paused in the fray. Tamada, she muttered. Roma. A sudden prickle of an idea occurred to her. As Roma marched forward, locked on her for a target and probably intent on running a dagger through her heart, Juliet formed her plan. He wouldn't respond to her messages, wouldn't work with her any longer, but she needed him. Who better to know whether there was a white flower sect collaborating with the communists than Roma Montagov, heir of the white flowers? If he would speak to her only to fight the blood feud, then Juliet would use the blood feud. Juliet shot to her feet, trying to make a break for it. She could cut an easy path through the brawl. She could stay low and dart through that empty pocket of space. Someone grabbed her by the back of the neck. Juliet sensed a blade, or something, about to come down on her, and her hands launched up. She pulled, yanking the arm over her shoulder until she heard a socket pop. Her attacker shouted. Just as he tried to bring the knife in his other hand down, Juliet darted out of the way and spun around, pressing her forearm against her attacker's neck, both of her feet braced against the concrete road. It wasn't Roma who had grabbed her, it was Dmitri Voronin. A quick snap of her eyes confirmed Roma was still trying to fight through the thick of the brawl, but he was on the move toward her. Juliet Kai, Dmitri greeted, acting like they were exchanging pleasantries. I heard you grew up a socialite. Where did you learn to grapple like a street urchin? I gather you don't know much about socialites. Using his height against him, she hooked a foot behind his knee, grabbed a fistful of his hair, and slammed Dimitri's head into the ground. She kept moving, emerging from the fight and scanning the temple walls quickly. Elisa had followed her out, peeking from the archway of the temple entrance. Juliet shot a look over her shoulder. Roma was still watching her. Good. Come with me. Elisa blinked, taken aback by Juliet's sudden appearance before her. What? Without waiting for an answer, Juliet hauled Elisa by the arm and took off. 23. Juliet pulled Elisa back into the courtyard. Briefly, she thought she caught Rosalind and Kathleen out of the corner of her eye, but her cousins needed to stay by her mother's side and so they did not come after her, nor ask what she was doing. I promise I'm not going to hurt you. Juliet glanced over her shoulder again. Roma had made it out of the crowd, a splatter of blood on his collar. His eyes were ablaze, vivid in their violence. 
I just need to bait your brother somewhere quiet. Run. They ran until Juliet found a thin alleyway. She shoved Elisa in fast, sparing no time before she kicked several trash bags, stacking them tall so they acted like a barricade. Then she pushed Elisa to hide, slotted behind the bags and out of view. It wasn't that she was trying to scare Roma. She simply had a feeling that Elisa didn't need to see whatever was going to happen next. Roma came into view, his chest rising up and down from exertion. With one glance at the tight grip he had on the pistol in his hand, Juliet knew she was right. Why are you doing this? Roma spat. His expression was hateful, but his words were tortured. Like he wished she would just disappear instead, so that he didn't have to deal with her, so that he didn't have to be vengeful. What the hell are you doing? Juliet held out her hands. As if showing that she was unarmed would make any difference. Listen to me for a second, she pleaded. I have information. About the blackmailer. It might be coming from within the white flowers. I'm here to help. Juliet flinched, narrowly sidestepping his first shot. I was going to make it quick, Roma intoned. As a mercy. For what we once were. Will you listen to me? Juliet snapped. She sprang forward and the gun went off again, missing her, but so barely that she felt the heat skim her shoulder. His pistol was still smoking when she closed her hand around the middle of the barrel. Roma tried to shoot again, but by then Juliet had turned the pistol skyward, letting him empty out three bullets before she thumped a hand hard on the inside of Roma's elbow. His arm slackened, and she threw the gun out of his grip. This wasn't hard for you to understand a month ago, Juliet hissed. The city is in danger. I can help you. And you know what I have realized since then? His hand darted into his pocket for another gun, and Juliet tackled him fast, throwing him to the ground of the alley and using her two hands to pin his arm to the floor. The move was familiar, like that first time Roma ambushed her near Cheng Huangmio, but if the memory meant anything to him, Roma didn't show it. I have realized, he continued, keeping his arm still for that moment, I do not care about this city, or the danger it brings onto itself. I cared for people, and now the people are gone. He kicked out, and Juliet rolled away to avoid the hit, swallowing her wince of pain when she landed hard on her elbows and her forehead nearly smacked into the rough wall of the alley. Roma was up in the blink of an eye, looming over her with the gun, and she didn't think, she just lunged. This was a true fight now vicious and unflinching. Each time Roma tried to shoot, Juliet tried to disarm, but he had not known her so long for nothing, and he predicted her moves well enough that Juliet's head was soon spinning from colliding against the concrete ground multiple times. Throwing herself out of harm's way too fast and too hard was painful, but it would sure as hell be more painful if she didn't avoid his quick hits and strikes. Roma. Juliet spat. Her elbow slammed hard against a stack of bricks, having finally writhed out of their grapple with his blade in her hand. Victory. She threw the blade, hearing it clatter and spin out of the alley. Listen to me. He stilled. She almost thought she had gotten through to him, but then his eyes narrowed, and he hissed, the time for listening has long passed. He dove for the blade. From the very moment he raised his arm, Juliet knew he had aimed too high. Roma had always been a bad thrower, which never made any sense because he was so damn good with his bullets. But he loosed his grip from the end of the alley, and time slowed down, Juliet tracked the blade, predicting it to sail so far above her head that it was comical. Then Elisa Montagova stood up from her hiding place, scrambling to her feet and calling out a plea to end the fight. Please, don't hurt each other. Before Juliet could think, could even take a moment to gasp, she shot up, diving in front of Elisa. She didn't realize what she had done, not really, until she came to a stop in front of the other girl and there was the hard thunk. By her ear. Elisa's eyes grew wide, her words cutting off and her hand flying to her mouth. The pain did not come at first. It never did, a blade entering always felt cold and then foreign. Only seconds later, as if her nerve endings had finally registered what happened, 
did intense, sharp agony reverberate outward from the wound. Mudak, Juliet managed, turning to look at the blade half embedded in her shoulder, then at Roma. His jaw was slack, face drained of color. The wound, meanwhile, immediately started to bleed, a steady stream of red running its way down her dress. You just had to throw the one with a jagged edge? That seemed to startle Roma into action. He walked forward, slowly at first, and then at a run, nearing Juliet and grabbing hold of her arm. She watched him examine the wound. Even if Juliet were uninjured, she didn't find a reason to be frightened. His anger, however momentarily, had dissipated. Elisa, run to the nearest safe house and get the emergency first aid box. Elisa's eyes grew to enormous proportions. Are you planning to stitch her up yourself? She needs the hospital. Oh, that would go down well, Roma said tightly. Shall we take her to a scarlet or white flower facility? Who will shoot a little slower? Elisa balled up her fists. Juliet was still alert enough to pick up the clamor of the fight coming from a distance, but she couldn't quite feel her fingers anymore, nor squeeze her own fists. It's only down the road, Elisa. Roma pointed forward. Hurry. With a huff, Elisa spun on her heel and hurried off. Juliet breathed out. She almost expected to see her breath, as she would on a cold winter's day. Instead, there was nothing, the coldness was coming from inside her. A numbness was flooding her limbs, little prickles like every cell in her body was trying to go to sleep. Put pressure on the wound, would you, she asked casually. I know, Roma snapped. Sit. Juliet sat. Her head was spinning, doubles and triples appearing in her field of vision. She watched Roma tear his jacket off, balling it up and adjusting the fabric around the blade, pressing as hard as he dared to stop the blood from running. Juliet did not protest. She only bit down on her lip, bearing the pain. What is wrong with you? Roma muttered after a while, breaking the silence. Why would you do that? Stop you from knifing your own sister? Juliet closed her eyes. Her ears were humming with white noise. You're welcome. Roma's frustration was tangible. She knew exactly what he was thinking, why take a hit for Elisa when she had been the one threatening to shoot his sister at the hospital? None of this made any sense. Of course it did not make sense. Because Juliet couldn't make up her damn mind. Thank you, Roma said, sounding like he could hardly believe he was saying those words. Now open your eyes, Juliet. I'm not going to sleep. Open. Them. Juliet snapped her eyes open, if only to glare at the alley space in front of her. It was then that Elisa returned clutching a box to her chest, her cheeks red and her breath coming in gasps. Ran as fast as I could, she huffed. I'll watch the alley while you, Elisa trailed off, not knowing precisely what Roma was going to do. She dropped the box by her brother, then ran for the other end of the alley. When Juliet strained her ears again, she realized that there was no shouting in the distance anymore. Elisa had likely noted the same thing, the fight was over. The gangsters would be fanning out soon, looking for them. If Juliet was going to talk to Roma, she needed to do it now, before it was too late. He had already stopped trying to stanch the wound, flipping the box open and unscrewing a bottle of something pungent. He set it aside. I'm cutting your coat off, Roma said. Another blade appeared in his hand, slicing through the fabric at her neck before Juliet could protest. When he peeled the coat away from her thin dress, all Juliet could smell was the metallic tang of blood. If her shoulder hadn't been in overpowering pain, she would have thought some stray alley cat was giving birth nearby. Muttering a curse, Roma put his fingers to the zipper at the back of Juliet's dress. You know, Juliet said, barely stopping her teeth from chattering, you used to ask before you undressed me. Shut up. Roma tugged the zipper down. Just before he peeled aside the dress, he yanked the blade out. For crying out. I do suggest keeping it down, Roma said tightly. Would you like a handkerchief to bite? Juliet's head was too light to respond immediately. 
She was going to faint. She was definitely going to faint. I'll bite nothing unless it's your hand, Juliet muttered. Raw. And detached. In response, Roma merely passed her the blade he had stabbed her with. Hold this. Juliet reached for it with the arm that did not have a weeping gouge in its attached shoulder, then clutched the blade to her chest, holding her dress up. She blinked hard to keep herself alert, then watched Roma as he shifted to a crouch beside her, making quick work of finding a clean rag in the box and dousing it with the foul-smelling bottle. It took everything in her willpower to hold back her scream when Roma clamped the rag to her wound. The antiseptic stung like a thousand new cuts, and Juliet had half a mind to ask whether Roma was actually poisoning her instead. His eyes were not on his task, he was scrutinizing Juliet instead, searching for a reason, for the slightest fracture in her face that would give way to an explanation. Juliet blew out a slow breath. Despite the agonizing pain, she could feel the bleeding crawl to a stop. She could feel her head clear up, the fuzz lessening. She had a job here to do. You've been infiltrated by communists. Juliet turned her head ever so slightly, not enough to disturb her shoulder but enough to lock eyes with Roma there's a sect in the white flowers working with them, giving over your resources and weaponry. I suspect the monsters are emerging from this very collaboration. Roma did not react. He only removed the rag and retrieved what looked to be a needle and a thread. I'm going to suture the wound. Juliet's first instinct was to snap that he couldn't. She had no doubt that he would do a fine job, running about in this city meant knowing how to snap an enemy's leg with two fingers and also how to piece an ally's body back together. But was she an ally? Would he piece her together with a steady hand? Roma made an impatient noise, waving the needle. Though she imagined she could probably get up and get to the hospital with a gaping hole in her shoulder, Juliet winced and relented. Wait. She dropped the blade she was holding and reached for the lighter in her pocket. Wordlessly, she flipped its lid and struck her thumb on the spark wheel. When the flame sprang to life, Roma brought the needle near to sterilize it without being asked, like he had already read Juliet's intention. It was easy sometimes to forget how well they had known each other before everything went awry. To forget that they were once as familiar as halves of the same soul, predicting each other's next words. Here, with Roma absently tapping the back of his hand against Juliet's, asking her to put the flame away when the needle glowed red, Juliet could not forget. Don't stitch too deep. I don't want a scar, she grumbled, snapping her lighter closed. Roma frowned. You're hardly in the position to negotiate the size of your scars. You threw the knife at me. And now I'm stitching you up. Do you have any more complaints to air? Juliet resisted the urge to strangle him. Did you hear any of what I said before? She asked instead. About the communists? Yes, Roma replied evenly. He pulled the thread into the needle. And it doesn't make sense at all. We don't want the communists taking the city. Why would we help their revolution? Roma leaned in, and the first prick of the needle entered her skin. Juliet gritted her teeth hard but otherwise withstood the pain. She had suffered worse, she tried to remind herself. She had suffered worse simply by smashing wine bottles too hard in New York, which had ended with her needing stitches all along her arm. At least those had been done in a hospital. I don't know why, Juliet said tightly. But it's happening, and right under your nose. Her shoulder twitched, and Roma's hand came around her arm immediately, holding her still. His fingers were hot, burning into her skin. And what, Roma asked, pulling the thread through again, do you want me to do about it? What you were supposed to, she replied. Find the Frenchman. The monster on the train. The needle went in too deep. Juliet gasped and Roma cursed, his grip tightening to stop her from leaping up. Stay still, he commanded. You're clearly trying to kill me. I'm obviously not very good at it because you remain alive, so stay still. Juliet exhaled sharply through her nose, letting Roma resume the last of the stitching. Though she tried not to move, she continued eyeing him until he shifted uncomfortably, 
his eyes flicking to her and narrowing. The monster, Juliet said again. Everything will be clearer from him onward. But Roma shook his head and held his hand out. Juliet passed him the blade beside her, the very same one he had stabbed her with, and he cut the thread at the end of his stitching. I can't, he said shortly. My hands are full. As you can see, his jaw tightened, and he inclined his head toward the other end of the alley where Elisa was keeping guard, the blood feud is whittling us down alongside our mass casualties from the madness. I fear sending resources into finding the blackmailer will only incite more attacks, and while I hear you have your vaccine already, we. I'll give it to you. Samples. Papers. Take it to your labs to recreate. Roma's look of vexation faded for complete surprise. It didn't take him long, however, to shake himself from his stupor and get back on task with a frown, retrieving a bandage from the box and laying it over Juliet's shoulder. You have permission? Of course not, Juliet scoffed silently. In what world would the Scarlet Gang be willing to pass their vaccine on to the White Flowers? No one in that gang did anything out of the goodness of their hearts unless a good heart could bring in a fortune on the black market. Aloud, Juliet only said, no. Roma narrowed his eyes again and pressed down too hard on the bandage, not entirely by accident. I somehow doubt that you are willing to betray your people, Juliet. It is not betraying my people, Juliet said, taking the stinging sensation. It is going against my father. My own people will not suffer if the white flowers suffer less too. Your loss is not my gain. Roma taped down the bandage. Seeing that he was done, Juliet used her uninjured arm to reach for the fabric of her dress and yank it over the wound, congratulating herself for not letting out a pained shriek. Isn't it? Roma asked. He shifted behind her again and reached for her zipper, but he did not immediately pull it up. His fingers hovered there, a hair's breadth away from her skin, yet she could still feel the proximity like a physical touch against her bare back. Not when it comes to the madness. Juliet's throat was dry. She could not see his face. She did not know how to read this. I can help you orchestrate a break-in, Roma suddenly pulled the zip up, but in return, give me the monster in the white flowers. I will get to the root of this. She felt his warm breath curl around her neck, as heavy as everything unsaid between them. A sudden pressure came on her other arm then, and she realized Roma was helping her stand. Almost as one, they rose upright, following the path of the breeze as it blew into the alley and swept skyward. Juliet turned around. The wind settled. By all means, it was cold in that alley, but she couldn't feel it. Her coat was in two pieces on the ground, and her dress was torn at the back. Roma's jacket was kicked aside, soaked with blood, and his sleeves were pushed up his arms, kept away from his stained hands. When they stood like this, close enough that their heartbeats were in conversation, Juliet did not know what coldness was. Agreed, she asked, her voice almost a whisper. Roma stepped back. Like that, the chill crept in, swirling the front of Juliet's dress, raising goosebumps all along her arms. For the vaccine, Roma said. Agreed. One more day of survival. One more day of Roma letting her off the hook without putting a gun to her head. How long could she keep this up? How long before she either caved or just let him shoot his goddamn bullet? Juliet bobbed her head in a mock curtsy, turning to go. Only then Roma held his arm out stopping her before she could take a single step. Why did you do it? he asked. Why did you jump in front of Elisa? Juliet's lips parted. Because I cannot bear to see you hurt, even when I am the one hurting you the most. She wanted to say it aloud. It was on her tongue. It burned the whole length of her throat, begging to be let out. What was the harm in another secret between them? What could they not withstand if they had already fought a monster and the stars themselves? Then Elisa, from the other end of the alley, called, We've got people incoming. Juliet, perhaps you should go. Juliet heard the voices too. They were still some distance away, but keenly audible, 
overlapping one another in Russian. Laughing, they spoke of dead scarlets, of her people falling to the ground with their lifeless eyes staring up at the sky. It was that which had Juliet remembering herself. It was that which jolted the truth back to the forefront of her mind, like a slap to her face. This wasn't about fighting for love. This was about staying alive. You ask why? Juliet said quietly. She swallowed hard, leaving nothing but lies studded in her mouth like extra teeth. It stopped you from trying to kill me, did it not? I keep telling you, Roma, I need your cooperation. In an instant, the tentative readiness for peace fled from Roma's expression. He was a fool if he thought the truth would make it easier. It would only tear them apart to think that this could end any other way, both of them consumed by the blood feud. Thursday, Juliet said. The white flower voices were getting closer. Cheng Wangmio at the ninth hour. Don't be late. Juliet walked away before the other white flowers could happen upon the alley, before Roma saw the tears rise to her eyes, utterly, utterly frustrated that this was what they had been reduced to. Roma breathed out, kicking his bloody jacket. It was unsalvageable, but he hardly cared. Roma, one of the white flowers exclaimed, seeing him in the alley. They looked between him and Elisa, noting the blood on Roma's hands and his haggard appearance. There was definitely a bruise or two on his face after his fight with Juliet. What are you doing here? Leave us, he snapped. The white flowers hurried away without another word. Slowly Elisa walked back to him, cocking her head to the side. Instead of hurrying to ask what had just happened, she started packing up the first aid box. Damn it. Roma hissed aloud. He had had her. Right here. He could kill however many bodies he wanted on the streets, land perfect shots upon the scarlets that ran at him with knives. But none of that mattered if he couldn't strike a killing blow on the heart of the Scarlet Gang. On Juliet. Revenge on disposable parts was not revenge at all, but cowardice. And maybe he was a coward. He was a coward who couldn't stop loving a wicked thing. What was that all about? Elisa asked plainly. Roma scrubbed at his hair. A dark lock fell into his eyes, covering his whole world in black. I should be asking you if you're all right first. He sighed. Are you hurt? Elisa shook her head. Why would I be? She sat down, leaning up against the wall. Juliet jumped in front of that knife. She had. And Roma could not comprehend a single reason why, or at least one that made sense no matter what Juliet had said. So, Elisa prompted, Why were you trying to kill Juliet?